Good morning, everyone. Chen? Here. Palatuna? Here. LeBron? Lee? Here. Manning? Here. Here. Steinbrecher? Here. And Mr. Stoller is present here. All right, thank you, Dad, for uh, handshaking there. All right, I would like to open it up for public comments. Is there anyone uh, in the audience who wishes to address this committee? It's like the breakfast club with the audit committees every day. All right, I'm going to reserve my uh, uh, report for a little later on. So, Welcome him. I think he's met uh, several of you, but we'll meet all of you over the course of the next two days. So, welcome, John. Thank you. All right. Uh, is there any objection, or is there uh, any uh, request to pull anything off of the consent agenda? All right. Going once, going twice. Okay, the consent agenda will be approved. <laughs> I'm supposed to be waking up right now. <laughs> All right, on to our business at hand. So, Mr. Kevin Harper. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, so the first item on the agenda is the, is the risk assessment. And uh, the audit committee's new charter in 2017 uh, charged the, the audit committee with overseeing the state bar's risk management and compliance efforts. So we decided that, we, that the, the committee couldn't really oversee it until we documented it better. And so uh, the, the, the senior leadership team um, got together and brainstormed the biggest risks that the State Bar faces and identified the controls that are already in place to manage those big risks. And by big risks, I mean those that could keep the State Bar from meeting its mission. Uh, and then we concluded on whether each of those risks were adequately managed or not. And then if they were not adequately managed, what other steps need to be taken in order for us to, to manage those risks adequately. So you can see in this agenda item that we identified nine risks that could keep us from meeting our mission. And that we concluded that about half of them were currently adequately being managed and about half of them we had additional steps that we um, needed to take or were already working on. And so, for example, the things that need, uh, that we decided still needed some attention related to those risks were uh, for OCTC to update their case, major case designation policy and provide uh, training, more training to managers and supervisors, uh, for general services to conduct a threat assessment um, uh, and, uh, and provide additional training to managers and supervisors on recognizing and reporting threats. Um, these are physical threats um, to the building and to the entrance. Uh, for the general services should develop a continuity of operations plan um, and that the state bar should improve its communications with all stakeholders uh, and that the uh, and that there needs to be a compliance review done of all the laws and regulations that the state bar is uh, required to be following. And that particular item is on your agenda for actually next on the agenda is that update on that compliance review. So so that's what that's what we have here is just an information item of what we've what we've done and it's uh, and now the audit committee can uh, weigh in on. Uh, your um, your thoughts on whether you believe, as we believe, what the, the, the status of the management of these key risks are. All right, yes, Renee. Uh, I'm going to start with the first. Yeah, I think I, I believe that that's appropriate. As we, we we did, by the way, we did circulate this list once the leadership team did it. We circulated it to the exact the the all of the directors at the state bar, and also asked for feedback from that level as well to make sure that we weren't overlooking um, 
things that staff should be knowing about. So, yeah. so yeah. I, and I apologize for not getting you my feedback sooner, but this is just, um, you, you, you're close to me, but just when uh, you have loss of critical IT functionality, and you talk about a hack, and then you have financial fraud, but you might be hacked and having large financial loss as a result of a hack. I mean, you kind of talk about it more in terms of losing your system. Yeah. Um, and then the financial fraud is kind of more, you know, internal, but someone, you know, could break in and take take money or, or something like that. So I, that would just be a small modification. And the other um, the other kind of ne related to negative outcome in a high profile case, and I think just in general, most boards talk about um, not just negative outcome in a whole high profile case, but the risk of a really major negative, um, some negative press event, like some, you know, some really horrible news comes out, and how do you manage it? What's your response? You know, who contacts whom? You know, there's just, I mean, it could be like, you know, some some event that happens here in the building, and you know, how do you how do you communicate that, right? So, um, I think it, 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 just a slight modification to that relative to things I usually see on this list. Yeah. Okay, and just just a clarification that that of course what we've shown you is a is a summary of the of the report that we did prepare on the topic, and there is a lot of overlap on yeah. some of these items, like uh, like you're talking about, Renee, the the um, loss of critical functionality and financial fraud, because for the most part, financial frauds are not going to be um, so, so so significant that they would cause us to not meet our mission unless it was related to electronics. Yeah. If it were if it were just stealing of checks or things like that, it's it probably wouldn't be big enough. So so there is definitely some overlap on some of these and it's a little clearer in the final yeah. report than in the summer. Right. Great uh, suggestions. All right, any other okay. Just one more comment on the IT risk. Um, I you know, maybe this is already included and it's just not listed in the summary, but any disclosure requirements associated with if data were hacked. I mean, the State Bar does maintain a lot of personal information of a lot of people, not just of lawyers, but also of students. And so there's different regulations that apply to what disclosures have to be made in case that information gets hacked. Right, and, and, the, and we do have a continuity of operations plan as, an, as another step that will address those things about what happens to, to recover from uh, one of these bad things that might happen. All right, any other questions, comments? Yes, Debbie. Under the workplace violence and um, where you have that the security officers are going to work with you, who writes your policy? Do you have a written policy on workplace violence? And, um, uh, a lot of places do. You have, they have a, yeah. a specific policy, so if people violate it, um, do you have a policy for that? But not that people answer that question. I was just going to come to Steve Mazur. <laughs> <laughs> this one also. Hi, uh, Steve Mazur, Chief Administrative Officer. Um, we do have state bar policies and procedures around that. They are in various administrative advisories, so in terms of individual employees violating that policy, um, that is covered. What we are uh, lacking and we think we need a more comprehensive um, policy and procedures around issues of more formal threat assessment and recognizing those threats and more external resources to potentially have people um, on the in the event of an actual incident be able to know what to do more specifically for shelter in place, for um, other types of things like that. So our, our internal policy is there. It's the um, training and response that we feel we need to be. So I'm also thinking of like two different things. So workplace violence could just be between two employees and it may not be involved at that, mm -hmm. at that level, but uh, but some, something where they have violated the policy, so a written policy where you know, um, action can be taken. The external stuff, I don't know if you work with you know the CHP or some who can give your, your employees training on what to do on how to shelter in place and all that kind of thing and for the higher results perhaps to even look over 
what your policies are in terms of, in the case of an emergency and disaster, which types of areas of overlap, as to what they need to do and where they need to go. Um, yeah, we do have a relationship with the CHP. They have a, a special unit that is responsible. Uh, yeah, for the credit system unit, yeah, I work with them, I know them. But they don't do, they don't do the part on, they, they'll do the part on workplace, um, set on um, workplace uh, assessment in terms of violence, they'll do that part. But in terms of evacuations and what you should do and that kind of stuff, they don't really do that part. That's usually another uh, division with the high patrol. So you may want to reach out to them to have them sort of look over. If nothing else, whatever you have, have them look that over to say, that, yeah, this is what we want to Because in the event of a, a situation, they're probably ultimately going to be called in to um, um, help with the cleanup or whatever needs to be done. So uh, you might want to have them in on Friday, I guess. That's the point's very well taken, and perhaps when we get down to talking about the uh, work plan, maybe that's something that we can add in there. All right. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, Brandon, Josh, Petula. Uh, I just want to point out, um, I hate to do it here, but I think I'm going to have to do it every chance we can. On this eight legislative changes, there's a, um, I think there's uh, just something generally we talk about in other segments of uh, this group, um, where there's a tone here that I just want to point out and make sure that we're paying attention to. I don't believe that the legislature would find anything that they uh, pass to be burdens on us. And I think that when we look at it a little differently, and it's just very clear to me in the language that we use, that this is a risk as opposed to a partnership, uh, and that they're burdens as opposed to um, uh, uh, you know, reporting requirements that are supposed to lead to a certain goal. So I'm not really sure number eight. Um, fits with uh, the other nine as far as uh, mission critical risks. I would say that uh, if there were changes, they may be mission changes, but um, I just see it a little bit differently. I want to make sure everybody understood that. I don't know if this was, in, I guess, contemplated you know, in the year that we did not get the fee bill. So I think that's certainly something as far reaching as, as the fee bill would be a significant uh, factor for management to take into account. So I don't know if the nomenclature, I, I understand your point, and maybe it's just the nomenclature of, of audit and balance of risk versus <coughs> no cost. So, but your point is very well taken. I just want to um, second what, what Josh is talking about, that to have that listed like, like it is, does seem like the, that the bar is saying that the legislature may do something to put them at risk, and I think that the legislature would not take too kindly to that. Although I do think we cannot ever lose track of the fact that we need a fee bill every year. Um, in, in my judgment, that's probably not the best way to ensure a stable service delivery mechanism. Um, but the legislature does have um, the need to provide oversight. So maybe we just need to be more specific and say, there's a risk that a fee bill won't pass. It's happened twice in recent memory, and it could happen again. And we should have this on our radar screen at all times, both so that we prevent that outcome um, by managing our resources effectively and can respond to that outcome if it happens. In the past, we've had a modest reserve that was intended to cover our operating costs during a transition period from a fee bill veto to a rule. I don't know that we've maintained that reserve, but it is one of the risks that we should be reserving for. So I would keep this risk, but I would state it more or maybe more narrowly. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's in there. It's just there's this burden part, right? And and I think to um, just reflect our our thinking, perhaps the word burden is an artful, um, that there is a reality that we do run a risk of the legislature imposing requirements on us that do uh, threaten our ability to continue to uh, operate the way that. Um, that we have been operating, and I think that's what it was intended to reflect. Uh, but we can modify it, eliminate that, and just have it limited to the fee bill, and whether or not we get the fee bill. All right, glad that everybody uh, showed up ready to work this one. I was thinking that it's going to be pretty perfunctory. All right, um, anything else on item A? All right, maybe it's because it's the end of the year and everybody's. Okay, uh, update on compliance activities. Okay, Dak. Welcome, Dak. Good morning. 
Tech Cloud Chief Mission Advancement and Accountability, and presenting this item on behalf of Ms. Silva. She is our attorney who's working on compliance-related activities and was unable to attend today. Um, this item comes out of the Audit Committee's charter, um, specifically the uh, aspect of the charter that discusses monitoring, reviewing, and evaluating the effectiveness and adequacy of the state bar internal control structure on an ongoing basis. Uh, one of the first tasks that Kim was assigned uh, when he started at the bar about two months ago was to review the entire state bar act and to review all California rules of court that contain some obligation on the bar uh, and to document those. So the first step of the process was to inventory all of the requirements that are in statute in California rule of court. And then using that list, which is included as an attachment to this report, we then began to categorize um, those uh, those obligations um, and the three categories we came up with were reporting requirements when the bar is re required to affirmatively report something to the legislature, to the Supreme Court, to the public. Um, then another category of policy requirements where the state bar and usually the board of trustees or the executive management are required to enact a policy of some kind. And then the third um, layer of um, requirements that we identified were operational requirements where the state bar in uh, in the uh, in fulfilling its, its ordinary duties is required to do something in the state bar court is required to do something in the handing of discipline where the admissions office is required to do something in the process of um, administering the bar exam or admitting uh, new attorneys to practice of law in California. So those are the three categories that we put all of our different um, compliance, requ compliance requirements into. That we there are about 200 of them in total. Our initial assessment is that on the reporting side is where we are the strongest and that we have certainly um, locked into place um, good systems for tracking all of what we're required to report and that we're on top of those. Um, what we have yet to do is, and this is our next step, is we have yet to identify um, all of the um, all of the entities within the state bar that are responsible for each of the different items. So in some cases it seems relatively clear, in others we're not entirely sure, but we're going to be going through this document piece by piece, identifying which part of the state bar is responsible for which of the compliance requirements in the document, and then working with them to document their practices for staying in compliance. And where I think that this will be useful, in addition to just confirming that we're in compliance with all of these different requirements, is by also identifying areas as we review the documentation of how different parts of the state bar are complying with these requirements. Um, identifying potential weaknesses and areas where we might then conduct internal performance audits and engage in some sort of business process re-engineering. So this is an informational item. Um, that's the work that we've done today on this. All right, are there any questions for Dan? Once, once, once. Oh. Right. oh, yeah, there's always one. Okay, Island. <laughs> um, I think this is a tremendous list, and it's great that you guys are doing this. Um, I think uh, just a couple of things to note that you might consider adding are requirements that apply to the board, things like open meeting, you know, back looking requirements. Um, I noticed the conflict of interest. I mean, I was really looking at the government code provisions. Um, conflict of interest requirements. I noticed that you have something in there for reporting. Um, but then also, a lot of this seems to be sort of affirmative requirements, things that for reporting is mandated, but I think we should also make sure that we have controls in place with respect to things we need to refrain from doing. So things like in case of reports of improper governmental activity, um, retaliation and certain measures are prohibited under the government code, so if there, I think we need to track that there are proper controls in place for that. Great. Sounds good. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item C, review implementation of recommendations from the state auditor and other external audits. Ms. Counsel. I have um, a handout. I 
of Research and Institutional Accountability. And this is also an informational item. And as you're all aware, the bar is subject to audits that are imposed externally. We have several audits, I guess, pretty much every year. We have an audit by the Bureau of State Audits. We also have undertaken some audits um, to ensure that we are um, operating efficiently and um, with the highest levels of uh, protection and security for our operations. And so this is intended to provide a summary of recommendations both from um, the outs but from the Bureau of State Audits as well as audits that we've um, uh, undertaken of our own accord on our own initiative. And as you can see, the, the, the uh, agenda item provides a very high-level summary of the number of recommendations for each of the audits and the status of the recommendations. Um, and I wanted to point out that for uh, the one from 2015, there's, we've implemented all but one that's still in process. Um, and we hope to conclude that very shortly. The one from 2016, there's also just one that's still in process. Um, and that's also, uh, this is one that had to do with um, accounting for information technology projects. And we've actually implemented it. We've developed a policy, we've implemented it. It's the, the formal adoption of the written policy is all that's left to be done. So um, that's almost completed. And then for the 2017 state audit, the outstanding, outstanding item is the um, the metrics for the discipline system, and that's on the agenda for the board tomorrow. So we're well on our way to uh, implementing all of the recommendations from the state auditor. Um, and then in terms of the audits from, from Moss Adams, this is, again, we, we're in progress with, or have completed most of them, and we will be implementing all the ones that are left to be implemented. And then we did undertake a cybersecurity audit, and the um, the IT department is in the process of implementing all of those recommendations to ensure that um, we are taking up all the uh, identified risks. <coughs> are there any three questions for? Uh, all right, thank you to your, your team for uh, the implementation of this long laundry list. <laughs> All right, going on to item D, Kevin, what is the new audit Yes, uh, so the state bar's audit has been conducted by Moss Adams for the last five years. Um, the board's policy is to bid, to go out to bid on the, on the annual audit every five years. Um, and the policy is not to require a change of auditors, but just to go out to bid. And that policy is consistent with best practices, both for five years and the not a requirement to change audit firms. Uh, the RFP was released in July, and we got six proposals back. Um, four of our staff evaluated those proposals to identify which of them met our criteria the best. Um, the, and our criteria were responsiveness to our requirements, uh, the technical ability of the firm, the financial viability of the firm, um, and their total cost. Um, based on those uh, staff evaluations, we select the three firms to interview. Um, and in the interviews, uh, staff found all the firms qualified. Uh, so all three were found to be very professional and competent. Um, they, they then rescored, and they, they then discussed the results of the interviews and rescored the, um, the firms and found that uh, the firm of Macias Gini O'Connell was the best qualified. Uh, Macias Gini O'Connell had a fee of 125000 per year. That is uh, approximately in the middle of the range of the six firms, which ranged from 95000 a year to 170000 a year. Um, Macias Gini is also the firm that audited the state bar prior to Moss Adams, so they have experience with us from a few years ago. So the risk is considered lower when it, with a with a firm that has some knowledge of us. Um, uh, Macias Gini has significant government audit experience. They have uh, over 300 government clients. Uh, they're pr 
their, their clients are all here in California, and therefore the team that they propose to serve as our government-specific uh, auditors, and that's important to us because we follow government auditing standards. Uh, the partner was extremely knowledgeable, experienced, and uh, instills confidence both in the, in the interviews and we believe, therefore, in presentations like this to the, to the board or to the public. And, uh, and they were the firm that best understood and were able to have a good conversation with us about the scope of the uh, five-year internal control uh, audit that uh, that we just completed with Moss Adams and we'll do within the next five years as well. So therefore, we're asking for the audit committee to approve our selection of Ms. C.S. Genie, uh, and then, if so, then on the uh, board's agenda is the contract uh, for the first three years of that uh, of that contract. The, the contract is uh, three years plus two optional years, so the contract will be for three, and the five-year internal control audit would be an optional year, so it's not actually contracted yet, uh, or it's not in that proposal item. So with that, are there any questions, or do I have a motion? Okay. Second. Second. Is there any objection to substituting the roll call? All right, matter is deemed approved. Thank you. All right, coming up on our thirty-minute limit here. Michael, uh, close. Do a couple more minutes. I, I encourage all of my committee chairs to try to stay on time today. So we are going to have a very interesting afternoon. All right, so with that said, I don't want to curtail the discussion uh, for our last agenda item that relates to the uh, implementation of, or excuse me, the uh, work plan for the audit committee. So, does anybody have any uh, thoughts on the uh, work plan? I think, you know, before we get into that, just a couple of comments from the chair. Um, you know, one of the things that the audit committee took on this year was the implementation of, of the previous audits. And uh, as you uh, tell from Linda's uh, presentation, this was a significant task. And um, the board really felt like the committee really needed to own uh, the implementation of, of these findings in order to improve, to Josh's point, uh, our relationship with our stakeholders and just to send a strong message that uh, we are wise stewards of the funds and the power entrusted to the state bar. Uh, that we do this out of the partnership, and when uh, one party wants to see something, then uh, we hopefully can deliver that. And to that point, uh, Kevin's team has done an incredible job. And uh, I know that it's been a, a burden on Kevin to take, take himself away from his busy practice um, but to stick with the bar through a time where we've seen turnover and finance staff uh, to uh, contemplate the significant uh, implementation process and to lead uh, your team, I think, should not go unnoticed. So um, I just want to take this uh, moment to thank uh, Kevin for his dedication uh, to the bar and for uh, making the audit committee's job uh, so much easier and making sure that we didn't develop too many wrinkles. So, Kevin, thank you so much. All right, so with that said, did anybody want to add anything to the work plan? And I think you know, we had some discussions about the uh, workplace violence uh, issue as well as any sort of ca catastrophic events. So um, is that something that we should add, uh, that the audit committee should uh, oversee? Because I really do think that is an important uh, issue was discussed. I think we should be adding um, oversight of the development of a coup to continue the operation. And, um, I, I, I believe that the work, uh, workplace violence issues can be folded into that as well. But we don't have a coup. Um, and many of the issues identified in this document will be addressed in the coup. So perhaps anything that we don't think is going to be addressed by the coup, we can also add as an individual item. Said coup, not coup, like we're coup, rising. Yeah, okay. uh, operations 
students and this is the finance and bank committee meeting, so welcome. Um, I don't have a chair's report except to say that um, so my, this is my final meeting and I want to thank all of you for the pleasure of my three years here. It's been a great pleasure. Welcome to the new board members. I don't think they're on this committee yet. Um, but I really want to thank Michael for his leadership. It's been a wonderful year. Um, and um, Brian stole a bit of my thunder, but, but uh, John, under very difficult circumstances, uh, your uh, six, six, our interim CFO has done such a wonderful job. And so again, I want to echo what Brandon said. Thank you very much, Kevin, for everything you've done this year. It's really made this, you know, when you take over a committee and you have an acting CFO, you get a little bit nervous, but <laughs> never was I with you. Your steady leadership was really, really wonderful. Thank you. And, and I'm really looking forward to the transition of the job. And I guess the board is looking forward to it. Um, but I know everybody is in great hands with Jason and with Alan. Um, so I'm looking forward to great things from this board. Um, I always think that when you serve on a board, you should leave the board better than you found it. I think through, uh, through Leah and Vanessa and the rest of the team, I think we've left this board. This board in next year will be better than three years while I was here. So um, I'm looking forward to great things. So that is my report. Uh, before you uh, move on, uh, our second new trustee has joined us this morning. And you might want to get him a moment to introduce himself. Oh, I'm sorry. Welcome. Any mic? Any mic will do. I am sorry. Renee, I have the not pleasure. I'm Todd Stevens. Todd, nice to meet you. I'm Ruben Duran. Ruben, nice to meet Very you. Very excited to be here. I apologize for my late, my late arrival. I'm a little bit of a crazy day. I just got appointed yesterday. <laughs> Great. Um, Would you mind taking a moment and tell us a little bit about Sure, yourself? certainly. I'd be glad to. Uh, Ruben Duran, I'm a partner with the uh, law firm of Best, Best and Krieger, working out of our Los Angeles office. Uh, coming up on my 20th year of practice, and my practice is exclusively for, pub exclusively for public agencies. I serve as general counsel to uh, five different public agencies, including a port, a library district, a community services district, and I've 
uh, enjoyed working with cities and counties and school districts for the entirety of my career. Very excited to be joining the, uh, the State Bar Board. I've been working with um, the Malpractice Insurance Working Group over the past eight or nine months and uh, ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work. So, thank you so much. Ruben, thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks. All right. We have one consent item. Does anyone wish to pull that item? Hearing none, I assume we can substitute the roll call. Um, update on strategic plan. Oh, I guess we should take the roll call, shouldn't we? Here. Proctor? Here. Paul Antino? Here. Lamar Rossi? Here. Kachula? Here. Slade? Here. Thank you. All right, Ms. Wilson. All right. So, my hands are planning pursuant to revisions to the charter that were adopted in January does have responsibility for oversight of the state bar strategic planning process. And to that end, I'm bringing forward to this committee an update on uh, strategic plan implementation activities to date. I'm also uh, teeing up a request that I will be making to the board in its October meeting to make modifications to the strategic plan. As you can see from the report and the attachment, uh, we have made tremendous progress on the plan. There's kind of a laundry list of items at the beginning of the agenda item, and then of course each uh, aspect of the plan is uh, detailed in the appendix to the report. Uh, it is not without a tremendous amount of effort on the part of all of my staff that we've been able to, to accomplish what we have, and I want to recognize uh, them really at this time also in recognition of the effort that's been put forward i do want to uh, be clear about the nature of the uh, workload uh, impacts facing us at this time as noted in the report we are about to begin the audit contemplated by the 2019 fee bill we've already been contacted by the state auditor if you would like to uh, begin that audit right away we also have been contacted by the legislative analyst office who is eager to begin their audit of the state auditor's work. Uh, the leadership team has spent some time reflecting on our ability uh, to achieve, success, successfully achieve all of the goals and objectives outlined for us uh, at the same time as we are undertaking two audits that have critical significance to this organization. Uh, when we got together as a team and talked about what is the most important uh, priority for the organization, we unanimously identified it is securing a fee increase. Um, as Michael alluded to in his earlier remarks, we are operating on a structural deficit. Uh, Kevin will give you an overview of the anticipated general fund uh, position for 2018. And we must secure an increase for 2020. So with that in mind, we've gone through the strategic plan and recommended uh, objectives either for elimination from the plan or for uh, extension, a due date, of, uh, extension of their due dates. And so those are laid out in the report. Um, I've tried to provide a rationale, particularly where uh, I'm going to be recommending elimination of an objective from the strategic plan. Um, and so I'll, I'll pause here and see if anybody has any questions. I do want to highlight a couple of initiatives that perhaps have not gotten um, very much attention so far. We haven't brought them to the board very visibly yet, but I wanted to provide you with an update on those. Um, and then I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the uh, state audit uh, that is about to begin. So any questions on the agenda item from staff? Uh, yeah, Josh Bertula. I have two questions on the um, recommendations for elimination. So 2D, um, the evaluation, I, I, I don't know how, uh, I understand the need to extend the due date, but I'm not sure how you can have an MCLE program and not have some kind of evaluation. So I don't know if there's a evaluation that goes on that I'm not aware of, or if maybe um, there's a streamlined type, but to have the program and not have a kind of living, breathing, um, uh, organization that sees changes that continue and continue to evaluate for doing the best job we can at it, I think um, uh, would be a mistake. So that, I'm a little, that, that's the first one. And then the second one on goal 2-0, uh, you know, again, 
uh, it gets, gets alerted. I'm about semantics, but routine right now around the bar exam, I think, is unacceptable. Um, there's too many stakeholders that are concerned about what's happening with passage rates, and so um, I do believe that this is not a time for routine, and, and there may be um, some more analysis that needs to continue to exist. Okay. I think I can take the routine. I, 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 that certainly wasn't meant. I think what that's just that we we. Um, weren't as rigorous in the past, shall we say, with respect to uh, the exam and, and, uh, and its analysis. And so I think a better word might be um, annual or semi-annual, whatever the term, whatever, that's probably better. I understand what you're saying. And you want to take the first one. Right, so I, I think the issue here, uh, we do, uh, uh, the issue is what is the nature of the evaluation? And perhaps that would be a more appropriate for discussion. Right. So. When I think about an impact evaluation, I think, speaking of the 2D, what is the actual impact of the MCLE that we're providing? That's a very difficult type of evaluation to conduct, as opposed to a self-evaluation that the um, user could take at the end of the course, um, and certainly they could rate the uh, utility of the, of the course. So I think it is that former type of true impact evaluation that I don't believe we have the capacity uh, to undertake at this time. So that's uh, the distinction that I would make. Uh, and so perhaps we could leave this in, but be more clear about the type of evaluation that's expected for 2D. Uh, for 2O, we do do um, an evaluation of pass rates after each administration of the exam, and we also uh, evaluate the cost of the exam after each administration of the exam and as part of the annual budget development process. Again, um, it's the issue of calling this out as a separate a particular report. Um, in my mind, it elevated the nature, the comprehensiveness, the volume of the report in a way um, that did create an unnecessary additional workload. We are doing a number of things on the bar exam right now. The productive mindset intervention is underway and those results will come out in December. The California job analysis is a major undertaking. Um, that is one of the things I wanted to talk about here more sensitively. So we are doing a number of things on the bar exam. Um, and my feeling was that in addition to those, we did not need to do a particularly uh, comprehensive or specialized report, I should say, on the 2000, on the two-day bar exam results. Um, and, and, and I think that's fair. I, I know from the conversations this board had in uh, prior meetings that that's uh, something everybody takes very seriously because the bar exam results. And I knew, uh, uh, I knew that there were other um, methods uh, of evaluation that were ongoing. I just, I, in a public document like this, I just want to make it clear to everybody um, how important this is to the board. Uh, and how serious they take it. And with the elimination of it, um, I was afraid to send that uh, the wrong message. Do you have anything else? So I did, I did want to take an opportunity just to... Just wait, what's it, Michael? Oh, sorry. Yeah, just a quick comment. It was just to say that um, we've had a statutory mandate to have a strategic plan for some time. Um, we've always had the form of a strategic plan but we've got the substance of the strategic plan under Leah's leadership, and I want to appreciate that leadership and um, recognize the strength of the school to keep us on track um, as an agency that is improving uh, consistently. And with that, I'm happy to move the recommended uh, action. There is actually no recommended action. It is simply an update, and I'm letting uh, this committee know what I will be recommending to work for a couple of months. But I echo Mike's comments, what you've done, at least the three years, the, the, the year you've been most actively doing this is incorporating it constantly into what we're doing, which is great, because it's, I think it's important for this board to, get, this board to continue to focus on the, those objectives and making sure that some of the backstop, everything that we do in some way is further in that strategic plan. And I don't think that happened when I first came here. That's happening now. So I, I like that. I appreciate that. Thank you. So I did want to just highlight a couple of initiatives, as I mentioned. One is the California Job Analysis. I did provide an update on this in my executive director report. Uh, but just to uh, sort of reiterate that in the next a couple of weeks, we will be soliciting nominations 
for the working group that will oversee this effort. That working group will ultimately be appointed by the Supreme Court, not by the Board of Trustees, and we've been working very closely with the court on that process. I want to highlight the fact that the methodology that we'll be using for the California job analysis includes something called random moment data collection in addition to a traditional survey design. This uh, type of data collection modality fits very well with the young attorneys that we will be surveying. Um, it is it can be an app-based uh, application that will ping them and say, what are you doing right now? And what skills do you need to know to do it? And we'll be uh, sending out tens of thousands of pings over the course of the survey period. And this really represents, I think, the fact that we, were, we are introducing this methodology alongside the traditional survey methodology reflects the benefits of having sort of a powerhouse research skills internally, uh, what, what that results in. We have been able to meet with the uh, researchers or the consultants designing this study and um, articulate the reasons for introducing a new methodology into the process and the anticipated benefits. And I fully anticipate that after we conclude <coughs> the important job analysis, you will see other uh, bars, but also other licensing entities outside of the attorney profession using this methodology with California leading the way. Also wanted to note the California Justice Gap Study part of the strategic plan and goal for access to justice initiatives that the justice gap study is moving forward at your next board meeting you will be asked to approve of a contract with um, NORC out of the University of Chicago who we will be working with to do the California version of the national study that was done for the legal services corporation in 2017. One of the really interesting questions that's come up with respect to this study that the board will need to grapple with is who should be included when we are trying to measure the justice gap. Previous studies, certainly the 2017 study, limited the study population to those at 125% of poverty, or meaning federal or state poverty guidelines. As we know from Professor Henderson's report that we received at our last meeting, there is an increasingly shrinking people law market. And it's not just those at federal or state poverty uh, limits that are having an access problem. And so part of what we'll need to decide is who will we include in our population to be studied? Uh, do we want to see if the access to justice problem extends up the income chain as I believe that, that it does? So that's an interesting uh, question that the board will have to grapple with as we proceed with the study. And lastly, just wanted to highlight for you that diversity, diversity is part of our uh, goals. It's uh, in our core uh, mission as, a, as an organization, but it's not fully articulated via a set of objectives in the strategic plan. Uh, this is something that I think will need to change, and I'm hopeful that the January planning session will allow the board to identify specific diversity-related objectives for the strategic plan. Although not in the strategic plan, a great deal of work it has been done to try to advance this particular aspect of our mission. Um, as outlined also in my ED report, we recently held a summit with statewide and regional affinity bars designed to help to begin to answer the question of what should the goal, diversity goal be for the legal profession and what is an appropriate role for the state bar in helping to get there. And so you should expect to hear about more, that more in the coming months. Um, we're also kind of walking the walk or practicing what we preach, implementing new uh, efforts to ensure that the Board of Trustees is diverse in all of the sub-entities to which you appoint uh, diverse representation, and also for the first time bringing mandatory training to our own staff on diversity and inclusion and making sure that we are protecting against the impacts of implicit bias in our own work. Uh, so I wanted the board to be aware of that as well. I do have up on the screen my favorite thing, the smart sheet, which you all seem to remind you that it's there. This is the device that you have at any time to uh, track every single objective of the strategic plan and where we are, and I do update it. And so I had uh, Louisa put up goal two because I wanted to note that a new addition here is the actual work plan for the California job analysis. So if you click on that, it will be some on 2P, wherever you see a paper clip. 
she's already brought it up. But this is new. This is the uh, entire project plan for the California job analysis. So perhaps more than you ever wanted to know, but it's there. Um, so just a reminder to go to your smart sheets. Um, lastly, Todd, if I could have a minute, I wanted to talk about the audit that's upcoming because that is, of course, the impetus for my uh, request to modify the scope of our strategic plan. I wanted to read quickly to, the, uh, to this committee the scope of work for that audit so that you see uh, what it is that we are about to undertake. So the scope of work includes an assessment of how much fee, revenue, staff, and resources are currently budgeted and subsequently expended to perform existing tasks and responsibilities. An assessment of whether the bar has appropriate program performance measures in place and how these measures are used for budgeting purposes. An assessment of the usage of real property owned by the bar. A review of the bar's cost allocation plan. A review of any proposals for additional funding or resources requested by the bar to determine whether those proposals are necessary to meet the bar's public protection function, as well as the accuracy of the identified associated funding needs after reviewing how efficiently existing resources are used. And a calculation of how much fee revenue would be needed from each active and inactive licensee to fully offset the state bar cost to perform existing responsibilities and to support additional proposed expenditures. Uh, this calculation shall take into account any proposed business process re-engineering reallocations or efficiencies identified by the state auditor. So this is a very expansive scope of work, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've already been contacted uh, by the auditor, uh, and so this work will begin very shortly. Welcome, John. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to know, we've given Kevin some accolades, and I haven't done that because I am not anticipating that we are fully going to say goodbye to Kevin. John and I have talked with Kevin as well about how we might continue to use uh, uh, Kevin's support, albeit in a different role, as we um, undertake uh, certainly these audits uh, that, we, that we have to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and speaking of Kevin, um, uh, you're up for, for uh, 3B, please, the financial statements. Uh, yes, we have two linked items next, uh, the, the quarterly, the second quarter financial report, and then the mid-year financial uh, variance report and projection. So since they're linked and um, the second one goes into some detail on the variance compared to budget, I'm going to focus my comments on this first one, the quarterly report on attachment three, which is um, variances compared to the prior year. So if you look at this, you can see that, um, that revenues are up by 1.8 million from the prior year. It went from 126 million so far year to date to 127.8 million. And uh, that is despite the fact that we have uh, 5.9 million less in revenue from sections. So how did we get up when we, when we had the, the loss of sections? So we made up uh, $3.7 million uh, in licensing, licensing fees because of the reinstatement from the, uh, the fee level from the 297 back to the normal $315 per attorney. Uh, in 2018, and we had an uh, increase in late fees of 1.1 million this year. Uh, legal specialization fees went up 1.7 million uh, because the, those fees were reinstated in 2018 after a fee holiday in 2017 as part of the legal specialization fund spin down plan. Uh, trust account revenue is up by 1.2 million. Uh, because of higher interest rates on the IOLTA accounts. Um, and the equal access AB145 filing fee, that's the $4.80 fee per court case for legal services for indigent persons went up by uh, 1.2 million. So we had, so we've had several increases to offset that loss of sections. On the expense side, you can see that expenses went from 88.6 million, sorry, from 75.9 million last year up to 88.6 million this year. That's an increase of 12.7 million. And that is uh, 
despite the fact that we lost expenses from the loss of sections of 4.7 million year to date. So, so how did we uh, go up with, uh, with that loss of sections? Uh, the single biggest piece was we paid out $8.3 million to uh, California Lawyers Association for the remaining fund balances of all the sections funds. So when they left, all of the remaining assets went with them. Uh, OCTC headcount as we uh, fill the open positions in OCTC versus last year, um, those personnel costs went up by 2.2 million. Um, grants expense went up by, by 2.4 million. That's primarily use of the B of A settlement funds. Um, GNA expenses, gen general administrative expenses went up by 2 million, uh, which is primarily uh, professional services for case management and implementation and uh, some, some uh, personnel increases. And the uh, CSF payouts went up by 2.1 million from last year, 1.9 million up to 4 million this year. So, uh, so the total, as you can see, the total excess of revenues over expenditures year to date is 40.2 uh, million. And uh, you, you recollect that we budgeted a deficit this year. So we're, we're running well above deficit so far, but that's solely because we collect all of the uh, licensee fees in the first half of the year, or virtually all of them. So we are well ahead of uh, revenues over expenses. But the next item on the agenda will show you where we expect it in the, in the year, we'll project through the end of the year. I'm happy to move the recommended action on items C and, is it C and C? I, I would like to make a few comments on C. Okay, I'll amend my motion to Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. I such a throw call. Okay, thank you. Meet your budget variance report. Right. So, so the board, the board book requires um, the finance uh, office of finance to prepare two mid-year reports. So these are based upon June 30th numbers. The first one is to look at in more detail uh, and provide you uh, explanations of variances that are greater than hundred thousand dollars at any individual line item in any individual cost center. So it's. It's looking at the at basically the lowest level uh, and looking for variances, and, and uh, that's what you'll see in attachment one of this I attachment A of this item. Uh, this the second uh, required report is a projection of results through the end of the year. So taking the, the halfway point of the year and saying based upon what's happened so far, how do we think we're going to end up the year? So. Um, the first one, attachment A. Um, so first of all, the, this uh, to help to help anybody that wants to link these uh, items that are listed here as individual variances back into the quarterly report that we just looked at. Uh, we've added, uh, we've shown the fund item and the revenue or expense category item, so you can find the line item uh, that it's related to for, for linkage. Um, however, if you, just looking at these individual line items, I know it's a lot, so I'm just going to summarize for you that we had, um, there's about $13.7 million of favorable variances in these, in, in these variances. Um, when we look at and talk to the operations people around the state bar, about $9.6 million of the, these variances appear to be timing related. So uh, some combination of we put it in the, we, we guessed that when we would spend it in the budget and it, and it appears that it will occur at a different time. Um, and about four million of it appears to be real uh, improvements compared to budget. Um, the, this, uh, this four million then you will see projected in attachment B. So let's look at that next. Uh, attachment B, We've taken the uh, each of the funds and uh, summarize at least summarize for you at the fund level. 
um, where we think we're going to come out. So we've compared the annual budget for revenues, the annual budget for expenses, to the projection for the year. Uh, so we took June 30th actuals, we, we reviewed the results of the variance report of attachment A, um, talked to, talk to the operating people that knew more of the details, and, and projected what we thought was going to happen in the second half of the year. Uh, so you can see at the, uh, at the third group of boxes on that page that we expect the general fund to come out with a, a deficit of $5.9 million uh, for the year. And that compares with the $8.8 million that we did project the deficit to be, or the budget projected the deficit to be. So that shows that we are projecting for the, uh, for the general fund to come out $2.9 million better than the budget. That still is a deficit. We're still overspending revenues, but it's uh, coming in better than we had originally budgeted. Um, similarly, for the other funds, if you look at that, we had originally budgeted a deficit of $19.3 million. You know, large, half of that is paid, you know, by use of the bank settlement funds. Um, and we anticipate now that we're coming in about $2.4 million better than that uh, original budget. Well, I just think Saying that the three million is that's not that's a significant number, so I, I yeah. commend this out. Yeah. Unfortunately, our, it is the red, but it's less red. <laughs> so there's that. Right. <laughs> it's less red. So all right, thank you, Kevin. Right. Anyone have any comments on that, Michael? Uh, I'll move the recommendation. All right. Anyone want to second that? Second. All right. Such so, roll call. Thank you. All right. On time and um, D, we got the 2018 budget update, Mr. Harper. Yes. So, so the the 2018 fee bill um, and previous fee bills required us to file the budget with the state legislature on a preliminary basis in the middle of November, and then the final budget in February. the The new fee bill, the 2019 fee bill is changing that to require only a final budget at the end of February. However, in this transition period, in 2018, we're still under the old rule, so we still have to file a preliminary budget by November the 15th. Uh, your next board meeting is November the 16th, so we're gonna be filing the preliminary budget uh, before we bring the preliminary budget to the board. So this agenda item is to show you uh, where we currently stand and what we think the, the budget is starting to unfold. But we're in the very early stages of, of preparing the budget, so there will be changes, but we're going to show you, uh, we're showing you here what we think, uh, what we know so far. Um, if the board has changes that need to be made after, uh, you know, based upon the review in November, then we certainly have the opportunity to make uh, budgetary amendments and, uh, and then file a final budget if necessary with the board, with the, with the legislature in the November campaign. Um, this agenda item, we're showing you only the general fund uh, estimates. Uh, the rest of the funds are, as you know, restricted funds and uh, therefore basically spend what you have available. So this is the, the discretionary funds that we're showing you. So page two of the staff report um, shows that um, in 2018, we budgeted, as I mentioned before, a, a general fund deficit of 8.8 million, uh, primarily, as you recall, due to the needs to fund IT and building projects. The 2019 estimates so far, you'll see on that page, uh, we're projecting $13.2 million deficit spending. Um, that, that continues the need for uh, significant investment in IT projects and some significant increase, increases in personnel costs. So specifically on the personnel cost side, um, there's about $2 million uh, increase for merit increases. That's 5% uh, increases for staff uh, that are not already at the top of their uh, salary range. We, we estimate that there's about 40% of people that are, that are thus red circle at the top of their range, but the rest of the increase is about 
about $2 million. Um, last year we had a COLA that came about late in the process and therefore it wasn't included in the budget that was adopted and therefore this that $1.0 million is included in this year's budget. Um, we have a transfer of legal, uh, legal services trust fund staff to the general fund uh, that will increase uh, general fund for about $600,000. We are planning three new FTEs, uh, three new personnel in the, uh, for the year. One for the fingerprinting effort, uh, one for backfill in the finance department related to the implementation of the new financial system, and one for, as we talked about earlier, the uh, continuity of operations plan. Uh, and then pension costs are going up very rapidly for the next three or four years, and so we've uh, added about 300000 uh, for that. So all told, personnel costs are, as you see, projected to go up $4.3 million at this point. Um, other revenues is another uh, big change there. You can see up from up by $3.1 million, uh, from 8.5 last year to $11.7 million this year. That's primarily due to uh, projection of rent revenue. Uh, we, we are now renting floors one and 11, uh, and so that's about 1.7 million. And we have significantly higher interest rates on our investments, uh, so there's about a $600,000 increase from interest. Um, you can see those transfers we had last year. We had $2.2 million of transfers in revenues last year, none this year. Those transfers were from the uh, IT Special Assessment Fund, the Admissions Fund, and the Legal Services Trust Fund, primarily to fund their share of the AIMS system. So we don't have that, those transfers coming in this year. And we do have new costs related to the strategic plan elements and the risk assessment that we talked about. So. The, none, none of them are individually big, but they add up to about $600,000. Uh, for example, a, ju a California Justice Gap study, grant writing and subscription services, uh, study of an online legal services delivery model, strategic communications, um, threat assessment, etc. So if you look at the bottom line there then, the reserve, the, it shows that we, we are planning currently a $13.2 million uh, excess of expenses over revenues. Uh, we, we are projected at this point to end 2018 with a, uh, with a $19.9 million reserve, uh, meaning that if we do come out with, uh, you know, if we do come out with the meeting that projection at the end of the year, um, that we would end up with 6.7 million in reserves in the general fund. That's about uh, six, that's about 7% of expenses, and you recall that the board policy is that these, uh, the general fund should have a reserve of 17%, so we are uh, projecting to be significantly below the, the minimum uh, reserve level that the board has set. Uh, just, just recall that, that uh, this is the very beginning of the, uh, of the budget process, and therefore, these numbers will change as we look more into certain areas. The big items um, are, are that could affect the numbers in a big way, you are familiar with their building projects, uh, tenant improvements for floor three if we, uh, if we have enough interest in floor three to look like we would need to make uh, investment into the uh, tenant improvements. Uh, IT projects, the state audit, which we are uh, in, the, in the process of negotiating the contract with, uh, and how and whether whether we in 2018 the way that we are projecting in terms of this beginning reserve. So those those things will impact these budget numbers by the time you see them in November. But I wanted to show, share with you what we think it looks like currently. Right, Michael. So my sense of this preliminary budget is that big picture, we are maintaining essentially the status quo of programming. We are continuing modest progress on vital IT projects, and we're not adding 58 positions to 
the Office of Chief Trial Counsel as the workforce study that we'll receive later today suggests it's necessary to do the mission that has been set out for us. That's correct. And that, it, that budget nevertheless requires us for a second year to significantly deficit spend into limited revenues. So we are flying ever closer to the ground, um, and unless the legislature in its wisdom sees fit to give us some lift, we either crash and burn or get much less ambitious in our efforts to accomplish the mission that's been set before us. And uh, I wish all of you well. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Um, just uh, as a housekeeping item, I want to thank Renee for all the really co-chair services she provided this year. And, and, and Kevin mentioned a tiny issue. I just want this committee to know and the full board to know that even though things might come to the board in a tiny that's not ideal, they're still being considered by the chair, and I'm sure that Jason will continue, whoever sits in this chair will continue those meetings. We meet every two weeks telephonically with, with Kevin and now with John and the co-chair, Renee, did that, and whoever I'm sure uh, Jason puts into the seats will continue that. So, so when things sound like they're not timed perfectly, they're still being vetted by this committee through chair and co-chair, and with a lot of communications with the CFO and, and with um, with the yes, I just don't think that there's that those things aren't being vetted. They are. Um, so thank you, Kevin. All right. Um, shall we move that item? I guess we don't. Do we need to move that item? It's really more of an update, so we don't need to. Um, we've got item E on the uh, schedule of 2019 fees, penalties, and it's always been exciting when it's here every year. <laughs> I love this one. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Robert Cabell. I'm a manager of the Attorney Regulation and Consumer Resources uh, Department. I'm substituting for Dean DeLoretto on this item. This is a routine item that happens each year. Um, the fee bill, once it is passed, sets the amount that the bar is authorized to charge. So each year, contingent upon passage of the fee bill, the Board of Trustees needs to establish and set what we um, call our schedule of fees, penalties, charges, and deadlines for the year. So this item is a routine item to set the 2019 uh, fee schedule. It is, of course, contingent on the governor signing of uh, the licensing fee bill. Uh, the uh, brief highlight of the item is that this year, um, the 2019 proposed fees will be exactly the same as they were in 2000. 18, uh, there are no substantive changes to the schedule of fees. Uh, contingent upon the fee bill being signed into law, if this board passes this, we will start our uh, normal fee collection process on, on about December 1st. Uh, this will be the third year that we are using a paperless model to collect fees, and this item authorizes us to do that. Um, just a, a quick update. That the whole paperless thing came during my tenure. How, how is that overall? Would you say has it gone? I mean, everyone on the spot here on TV. <laughs> there have been some rolling pains with it. Uh, we did that lot of work uh, with Kevin's team over the summer to uh, identify and take care of problems. I think the uh, positive side is that is a lot less paper. Um, that we have to deal with both mailing, getting returned, paying to get printed, and ultimately our rate of fee suspension seems to have remained about the same. Um, we had some growing pains last year. We hope that those are fixed to make it more streamlined and easier for uh, the licensees to use. It's kind of interesting. It was really fairly smooth. The first year seemed like it went and then better. The second year, we really had some unpleasant um, surprises. Uh, there was lots of conversation about, you know, there was maybe a deep dive conducted as to what were the sources of the problems, how much of it was State Bar, and how much of it was the bank. And we did consider, um, as you know, changing banks, but made a decision that that presented a tremendous risk at this time. So. Um, you know, as Bob indicated, I think we're well positioned to not repeat uh, the same um, set of circumstances or problems that occurred in this last cycle. Um, and I, I would note, I think it is about 15 to 20 percent of licensees who are requesting a physical bar card. So that was another component of switching to the paperless. Um, that, and it has uh, borne out to be 
future that there's not a tremendous demand for the plastic particles. And we saved hundreds of thousands of dollars by not just mailing them out to every yes. single licensee. And, and ultimately, we're going to save money with the use of paperless billing. We, 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 don't, we, just, we no longer incur mailing costs, for example. Right. And, and as somebody who has to track the billing statements for 23 lawyers, I'm really grateful that they come by email to my family. And I, I hear positive things in the community about paperless billing and that people like it and have adopted to it well. So it's the 21st century. I'm happy to move it right now. Um, Michael moves the 2019 schedule fees and penalties. Anyone second that? Second. Thank you, Josh. Substitute roll call. Thank you. Appreciate that. And last but not least, um, our work plan for review is up. Uh, yes, as you recall, the, the committee adopted its work plan for 2017-18 back in the fall of 2017 and it was approved by the executive committee in January of 2018. The, the XCOM is currently considering how to review work plan results, update work plans annually, and link to the strategic plan. Um, so uh, the staff has worked with, uh, with Chair Stevens uh, to add a, a status column to the work plan you can see in your agenda item. Uh, and so this uh, item is just for a discussion about whether there are improvements that need to be made to the plan for next year or and or for the process for next year. Comments on that? I personally am very much looking forward to um, I'm fortunate to be in the process of, of interviewing John. I know John, would you just maybe take a, a moment to tell us a little bit about your stuff? Some of us, uh, Brene and Alan, we have the pleasure of meeting you in the interview process, but many folks here haven't. And um, we have a couple minutes. Yeah, it'd be, it, it would be a pleasure. Thank so um, I'm John Adams. I, I met most of you. I will meet the rest of you uh, after this meeting. Um, actually, uh, I'm actually coming from the city of Cosmo, so where I was the uh, finance director slash city treasurer. Um, had been there for over 12 years. Um, prior to that, I actually worked for the city of West Hollywood um, as the accounting manager, really came up on the accounting side. Um, lived all my life in uh, Southern California. Um, had been married for over 20 years, uh, two children that are in college, um, looking for a new challenge, um, looking for the opportunity to work with the state bar. Um, you know, um, have a lot of experience on the governmental um, accounting side and finance and really look forward to being here at the state bar so I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you, John. John's been very humble because his resume makes him very uniquely suited for this position. We're very, very excited to have him here. We were really impressed with John in the interview process and the experience that he brings. The wealth and depth of knowledge and, and the things that we need as an agency. So welcome. We're really looking forward to your service. Well, with that, thank you for that. Um, I delivered it on time, on budget, <laughs> less read uh, year. So we're measured. I think we'll get a seven minute break before we come back to the program. <laughs>
survey. Okay. I'll let that right still Okay, let me get started. Can we go ahead and take the roll call, please? Broughton? Here. Chen? Here. Colin Tuna? Here. Manny? Here. Ritzwood? Here. Solon? Steinbrecher? Here. Stevens? Here. And we we don't have any items on the closed session today, so we're going to convene the open session for the morning. Uh, I don't have anything to report on the chair's report that we're not going to cover in the full meeting, so I will skip that. Is there anyone in the audience that wants to make a public comment generally or on a particular item this morning? Um, if it's a particular item, I want to find out who you are so we can have you called up at the appropriate time. Yeah, come up to the microphone. Just look, identify yourself and let us know what item you wanted to speak to. Turn the mic on. So let me the Legal Aid Association of California to comment on the proposal of the Access Commission and Legal Services Association. And okay. I there's a few others on the same agenda. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Hello, Kevin Kloon from Legal Aid at Work. Can you turn the mic on? Sorry, there you go. There you go. Uh, Kevin Kloon from Legal Aid at Work to comment on the same item. Uh, cool. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, we have no items on the consent agenda today, so we'll go ahead and move on to our first item of business. Call it broadly. No, broadly. Rodney Lowe, our Senior Program Analyst for the Office of Access and Inclusion, pre presenting a report on the revisions to the Lawyer Referral Service Certification Rules and a request for circulate or comment. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, okay. uh, good morning, uh, board members, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, we uh, <clears throat> request that the proposed rule re rules revised for referral services be uh, circulated for public comment. Um, we went through uh, exhaustively the uh, proposed changes of the August uh, conference call, uh, so I won't bore you with those details, but there have been a few minor changes and I want to address those. Um, quick background, this is uh, actually following the board's strategic plan goal for Objective C, which was updated this March uh, to wit, by December 31, 2018, review lawyer referral services certification rules with the goal of increasing access to justice. Under that mandate, uh, staff has reviewed the current lawyer referral service rules with these facets of the access lens in mind. Uh, and by the way, staff includes uh, programs chief uh, Donna Hershkowitz, uh, general counsel attorney Mark Schaap, and comments from Leo Wilson as well. Um, the facets that I re refer to are these questions in reviewing and considering revisions to the LRS rules. Does the rule impede or discourage consumers from contacting NLRS? Does the rule impede or delay consumers from receiving a referral from NLRS? Does a rule make it difficult for an LRS to serve its potential consumers? Does the rule impede or discourage attorneys from joining the lawyer referral service? And does the rule make it difficult for an entity to apply for certification as an LRS? And of course, superimposed over these filters is the final guide. Would amending the rule sacrifice public protection or service quality for greater access? Now, since the August 17 Programs Committee conference call, a few changes have been made, and that's what I'm going to address. Um, rule 3.820C3 is uh, an important rule that uh, requires, pursuant to Business and Professions Code 
D5, that the services design uh, services for uh, persons of limited means. Now, we've left that the definition intentionally vague. That's going to be up to the uh, services uh, to define. Our original proposal was to eliminate the waiver or the request to waive if the uh, attempts at creating certain services for indigents uh, was impractical or unreasonable. Our first proposal is to remove that waiver. So now it falls back on the true uh, mandate of 16, BNP 6155. Services must uh, design these programs to serve persons of modest means. The addition that we made after the uh, discussion with the working group from the California Access to Justice Commission was to increase the uh, examples. So we've uh, proposed modest means panels, limited scope panels, flat fee panels, and free 30 minute consultations. To that we have added uh, sliding scale or sliding payment uh, arrangements. Um, now this list is by no means exhaustive. It's uh, not to be not to be intended to limit only to these examples. Each program is free to design their own panel or program, and staff will review. Um, the next rule, Rule 3.825, was also amended to address a suggestion by the ad hoc working group. Here, a change was inserted to permit attorneys with offices in multiple counties to be eligible to join a panel if there was a suitable alternate location to meet with a client. And to that we added for a method to provide legal services to a remote client. And this is in contemplation of methods such as teleconferencing tools used to serve remote clients. The next change uh, addresses Rule 3.82C, clarifying an applicant's right to withdraw their application and receive a fund of their application fee, which is typically attached to the application. CCHA Working Group wanted to set a time limit when a withdrawal and refund could occur, and staff decided to simply state the right to withdraw an application, request a refund, which is now any time prior to certification, and then additionally, once certification is granted, no refunds may be requested. So that makes that rule a, a bit clearer. Rule 3.807B provides for say, uh, files obtained by the State Bar in the course of a complaint and investigation as confidential. That had been the previous rule. That's been superseded by California Public Records Act, so we simply have deleted uh, that. It is not, we, we do not maintain those files as confidential. There were other additional suggestions by the working group that were considered and rejected. And these are Rule uh, 8.302D, which uh, sets forth, I'm sorry, 3.802D, which sets forth the grounds for a request of a waiver of the application or referral uh, renewal fee. And we proposed that, we originally proposed that it be limited uh, simply to financial hardship. In other words, if uh, there was a application uh, and a renewal fee, uh, and then th there was a request to waive it, that it be simply limited to a demonstration of financial hardship. The um, ad hoc working group felt that, and believed that additional language from Business and Professions Code should have been added. Uh, however, that additional language did not refer to this particular fee, and therefore it was, it was not appropriately uh, applied to, to that request. So we uh, did not uh, take that suggestion under consideration. The next rule that the working group wanted to amend deals with Rule 3.803, which addresses the change changes for the process of a party litigating the denial of certification. Previously, uh, when an application for certification has been denied, it was um, designated to state bar court. Um, staff proposed 
that this function return to the office of the executive director. The working group felt that it would be greater due process if it was presented before an adjudicating body. However, staff research revealed that the State Bar Court never adopted procedures to address denials of certification. Additionally, the role of State Bar Court is attorney discipline, not intended to be the court of administrative review for the State Bar. Therefore, it's more appropriately handled through the office of the executive director. Other rules subject uh, to internal reviews uh, resulted in some cleanup language, which are minor. Uh, and then addition additionally, there was concern about the requirements for quarterly governing committee meetings. This is something we require of all services that they uh, have uh, quarterly governing committee meetings and they submit their minutes uh, along with their annual report. There was also concern or question about why annual reports and financial reports were required. Uh, staff concluded these are necessary for public protection, uh, provide records of compliance, uh, assist also in evaluating the need for technical assistance. And uh, importantly, the recertification fee is based on the financial records. So in conclusion, staff is requesting the release of the attached revised rules uh, as attachment A for a 45-day public comment period, and I'll take any questions. Michael? The Public Records Act allows government to maintain in confidence files related to pending investigations. And in local government, we routinely conceal the identity of the complaining witness until an a, a investigation is determined to be baseless. Because if you don't, um, that complaining witness finds themselves the object of unwelcome attention from the people that they're complaining against and it discourages complaints. So I believe the Brown Act, the Public Records Act, would allow us to maintain complaints and confidence if we wanted to. Um, and the question I have for staff is, do they think the opportunity for a confidential complaint against a lawyer referral service would be sufficiently valuable that we ought to provide for it? Did you say that the <clears throat> files could remain confidential pending the investigation? 6254F of the government code makes exempt from disclosure any file pertinent to a pending investigation by any government agency. And the, the rationale for the rule is obvious. You don't get to look at the criminal investigator's investigation file until after they've um, arrested you, charged you, and you get criminal discovery. Pending the investigation, our investigatory files are confidential. And we apply that to all sorts of complaints in order to avoid discouraging the act of complaining, which we need um, to enforce our rules against those who regulate. So I'm not suggesting that we need a rule that blanketly makes all complaints confidential. I'm asking the question whether we should have a process that allows some of it if uh, either the complaining witness or the bar feels that, that confidentiality would serve our regulatory objective. I just want to clarify, Brian. Michael, are you, are you suggesting that we put in these proposed rules well, to allow it for us? Well, that's really a question for staff, because if we leave the rule, we send the rule out as it's written, it eliminates the provision for <coughs> confidential clients. And I don't know whether we can interpret what we're sending out to simply eliminate the mandatory confidentiality and allow for selective confidentiality, or whether we need to amend what's going out on this plan, or whether this can follow later. I'm just asking the question. I don't know the procedural consequences of my question. So it could be done in two ways. The rule, proposed rule can be amended now, and the board decide uh, to approve it going out. Uh, or it can go out as is, and Michael's comment be treated like we would members of the public comment and consider the proposal and um, in the revision, revisions, if any, after public comment. Do we have thought as to whether the program needs this opportunity to allow confidentiality to complain witnesses? No, I, I don't. I don't have enough um, sort of context. I don't know how many complaints that we've received. <coughs> you know, a couple, a handful have come to me over the course of three years, so I, I don't know. Um, we've, we've had <coughs> a few complaints. We've never had a request uh, to release the records. You will. The minute you pursue an investigation, the, the party who is the subject of the investigation will make a public records request. It's routine. Um, and we routinely say, no, you don't get that. 
Um, my suggestion would be, so we send these out as presented, treat my comment as though it had come in during public comment and deal with it at that time. That way we don't slow this down, but you still have the opportunity to think about it. I agree. Thank you. That would be my motion. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? We need to take the roll call. Rodden? Yes. Chen? Yes. Paula Tunick? Yes. Manning? Yes. Perfula? Yes. Stalin? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. yes. Stevens? Yes. Adams? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda, item B, is revisions to the special admission rules, request to circulate for public comment, and Amy Nunez, and we the palm from the Office of Admissions and Access and Inclusion, will present the report. <coughs> Looks like there's more than those two. <laughs> to modify. So the board strategic plan, goal 2Q, um, called for the review of the special admissions rules with the intent to reduce barriers um, that potentially, let me get to that, thank you, that potentially um, hinder pro bono opportunities and to make recommendations that could <coughs> increase access to legal services in California. So. The review consisted of uh, two, uh, two categories of attorneys under the NJP program. This includes registered in-house counsel and registered legal services attorneys. We also looked at the special admissions programs of foreign legal consultants, which permit attorneys in another country's jurisdiction and who are in good standing in that jurisdiction to provide legal advice in California exclusively regarding the law of their foreign jurisdiction. For the purposes of increasing access, we're focused on the registered in-house counsel and registered legal services attorney. And the board also directed us to uh, develop a pathway for military spouse attorneys to practice law in California. So these are the proposals that we have before you. As the rules were re reviewed and we developed proposals, these are the general considerations that we had in mind. Specifically, um, and probably to create consistency between the special admissions programs where that was appropriate, to increase uh, legal access or access to legal services, to comply also with the spirit of the law while allowing flexibility with our rules, and to encourage non-California attorneys to take the bar. <coughs> so these are the specific recommendations that we made for registered in-house counsel. The first change uh, refers to the qualifying institution. We are requiring that at the agency or the institution employ at least five employees rather than ten, and they're not all required to be in California. Also, the current rule of board uh, governing registered in-house counsel, that is 9.46, Restricts attorneys who've been disbarred, resigned with pending charges, and have been suspended from being able to participate in the program. And the goal of that prohibition is to um, restrict attorneys who've been disciplined. We have modified language to allow those who have perhaps have administratively been suspended rather than um, disciplinary contact, con uh, misconduct. And so the rule has been modified to address that. Also, the current pro program allows the registered in-house counsel to function as both registered in-house counsel and as registered legal services attorney. We propose to modify the application process so that only one application would, would be required. We've added language to explicitly allow pro bono work, and this would also eliminate a second set of fees for applicants. And lastly, um, supervision is still required for the pro in the pro bono aspect of registered in-house counsel. Um, the initial staff recommendations for registered legal services attorneys. Um, Is your microphone on? Oh. 
the initial is speaking so the initial staff recommendations for the regular registered legal services attorneys um, were to first change the name to registered legal aid attorneys staff um, determined that this broadens the definition of attorneys that would qualify um, and that would uh, be able to work under this uh, categorization um, so moving forward we'll be referring to this group as registered legal aid attorneys um, the second is to uh, expand the definition of a qualifying legal aid entity. We extended this um, to be um, beyond those eligible for IELTA funding. And uh, we no longer required uh, the organization to serve exclusively in California. We're looking at organizations that may have a national presence but a California office. Uh, the third is to distinguish, uh, as Amy mentioned, to distinguish between the administrative suspension and disciplinary misconduct. Um, the fourth <coughs> uh, are, are the next two bullet points, which are to extend uh, registered legal aid attorneys from three years to five years. And um, the reasoning behind this was to accommodate multiple attempts at taking the bar exam and to encourage um, out-of-state attorneys to take the California bar exam. Uh, the fifth is to also simplify the application process if an applicant wishes to work at multiple legal aid organizations. Um, and the sixth, uh, similar to registered in-house counsel, is to ensure against um, uh, UPL uh, by defining your level of participation in court and with clients and to require supervision. The military spouse attorney proposal um, <clears throat> was drafted largely to conform with the registered in-house counsel rules as well as registered legal aid rules. Um, in that way, it does not adhere uh, precisely to the model rule uh, that is circulated by the Military Spouse JD Network. Um, as you can see, we define spouse to conform with California law, which includes civil unions and domestic partners. Um, and we try to have consistency in language with, uh, to mirror both the registered legal aid attorney and registered in-house counsel rules. Um, we are also um, requiring that uh, registered military military spouse attorneys be supervised uh, and this aligns with the oversight for registered legal aid attorneys so um, these proposals have been the proposals have been reviewed by um, the committee of bar examiners I uh, mentioned that we brought it here and we incorporated feedback that we were received at the August Programs Committee meeting. It was also presented um, through um, committees with uh, the California Commission on Access to Justice. And so uh, these are some of the, uh, some of the uh, initial feedback that we received in each of these areas. Uh, so with regard to the registered in-house counsel, there uh, was comment that uh, that we prefer no minimum employee requirement. Um, and um, thanks to our colleagues in um, professional competence, we were able to find uh, the original goal of this rule, uh, which was um, expressed in the report of the California Supreme Court Multi-Jurisdictional Practice Implementation Committee, uh, final report and proposed rules in 2004. Um, and the goal in having a minimum employee requirement was to limit the use of the rule to those organizations that have an ability to make an independent assessment of the quality of counsel. Um, and so the committee felt that these requirements would better ensure that the rule was used appropriately. After uh, looking at that history, staff determined uh, that five employees uh, would be appropriate and um, have, have not made further uh, revisions to the uh, proposed rules. The uh, sec second uh, bullet point feedback was the requirement to submit an addendum to application every time a registered in-house counsel uh, wished to engage in pro bono work with a different eligible legal aid entity. Uh, program, uh, commenters thought that this may be cumbersome and may discourage participation in pro bono. Um, and so uh, staff uh, reviewed this comment and determined that a form could be submitted and not the full application uh, to simplify the process. Uh, the third uh, comment was to eliminate the requirement to use registered in-house counsel title only and no other title. And so uh, staff revised the state bar rule uh, to remove the requirement on that no other title be used. Uh, 
the initial fee, the initial feedback for the registered legal aid attorneys um, included uh, a, a request to add a provision allowing an eligible legal aid organization to charge a nominal fee for service. Staff reviewed the rule and determined that their uh, the, the the proposed rule did not explicitly state that uh, a nominal fee could be charged, nor did it prohibit it. Um, the second two bullet points uh, go uh, together, and it's whether a legal aid attorney would have to pay fees for each application if they're working at multiple legal aid organizations, and how expanding the requirement to five years would be applied to attorneys currently participating in the program. Uh, staff determined that there would be no need to pay for multiple legal aid organizations for each uh, application, and also that uh, attorneys who are already participating in the program could participate um, could extend a participation for a total of five years. So if they're in their second year, they would just be allowed to participate for three more. Uh, there was a request to replace the term non-English speaking persons with limited English proficient persons uh, and uh, to, to conform with uh, the term of art that's currently being used. Um, fourth, uh, there was a requirement added that the organization notify the state bar within 30 days of the cessation of the applicant's employment with the organization. So this puts the onus on both the employer and on the applicant to notify the state bar that there are changes to their employment. Um, and fifth was to eliminate an application fee for registered legal aid attorneys and registered military spouse attorneys. Um, anecdotally, a lot of organizations pay these fees for their employees, um, and we haven't, staff has not um, otherwise come up with that recommendation uh, in regards to that. Uh, initial feedback for, for registered military spouse attorneys uh, includes uh, these three points here. The supervision requirement, um, there uh, was some strong feeling that uh, the supervision requirement would hinder a military spouse attorney's ability to find employment and be too onerous on the employer. Uh, there was a, a counterpoint to that where uh, that supervision requirement is not overly burdensome and would be important to public protection. Uh, staff's uh, recommendation is that given the absence of a California law license and that the classification does require the attorney to be well, well versed in local laws, applicable case law, and rules of court and ethical conduct, uh, supervision by a California licensed attorney would be appropriate. Uh, there was a concern about whether there would be a disparate impact on women attorneys through the loss of registration by leaving a spouse or partner or by not leaving a spouse or partner to maintain the registration. Um, and so staff added provision to extend um, this category for, for the applicant uh, for one year to allow for dissolution. Um, and the third is also to eliminate the application fee for registered military spouse attorneys. So the proposals have been attached to the agenda item and we're requesting a 45 day public comment period. But if there are any questions, I want to thank staff for all the hard work that you've done to do these, uh, review these rules and make changes. It's been a long process, but it's also been a long time in coming. So it's very exciting that we're, we're doing this. If there's no discussion, do I have a motion? Debbie Manning is moved. Second? Second. Lynn? Seconded. Just one quick comment. Um, I'm going to ask the idea of updating the rules has been circulating in this building for at least a decade. And the topic of accommodating military spouses has been around for at least that long. And I just want to appreciate our staff for dragging this across the finish line. This level of productivity is not a coincidence. It is a, a reflection of the hard work that our staff is doing under new leadership. And I just want to express my appreciation for it. Absolutely. Do I have an objection to substituting the roll call? Very good. Before the end of the year, maybe we'll have some great changes. Yeah. The next item up is um, item C, the annual recommendation regarding attorneys and non-compliance with the MCLE audit. And Robert McPhail, the program manager for attorney regulation and consumer resources, will present the report. Good morning. So this agenda item is in two parts, so I will explain each part. Uh, the first and primary part is each year we do what we call an MCLE post audit. After attorneys have reported their compliance, 
uh, MCLE compliance. We select an audit group and notify them that they are going to, in addition to the declaration that they made, actually provide proof of completion of the courses in the form of their attendance records. We then manually audit those attendance records uh, to determine whether or not they were in compliance. Uh, the MCLE rules uh, allow us to do this, and what uh, determine, what we determine within the audit is if they are not in compliance, we tell them that, and they are required to make up the hours, essentially. Um, if they do not respond to the audit or are unable to provide uh, proof of the required number of hours by November 6th, just like in conventional MCLE, they are deemed to be out of compliance and are placed on involuntary administrative and active status. Um, that's the first part of this item is uh, we, we require board approval to do these um, status transfers. Uh, a couple of highlights about the audit and this particular item as it pertains to the audit. This year we did a 1% audit. We selected 1% of the people that reported in compliance. As of the uh, date that the item was written, approximately 180 were out of compliance. What that means is they had either submitted a lot of submission, which was incomplete, or they hadn't responded at all. Um, I say approximately because this is a moving target, because we're still contacting them, we're still uh, reviewing the audits we've received, and so it is a moving target. We anticipate that by November 6th, we will actually place on administrative and active status 30 or less uh, based on our history of audits since 2011. Before they are placed on administrative and active status, they will have received the same kind of notifications that we do during the conventional regular MCLE reporting cycle. They got a notice that they were subject to audit. They've gotten reminder emails. They got a 60-day notice last week that they have till, or now two weeks ago, that they have till November 6th to comply. At the end of this month, we will send certified mail to them, and it, we will do additional email reminders. And so by the time November 6th rolls around, we will place approximately 30 on not entitled uh, eligible to practice law status. The second part of this item is the uh, MCLE rules and regulations also allow for what is referred to as a modification of MCLE. If an attorney has uh, an, an ongoing uh, financial or medical condition that affects either themselves or their family, they can request a modification of their MCLE requirement. Generally, this is in the form of an extension of time to complete it. We have a handful of people who have not uh, met a modification request by their deadline, and so we do a similar process. We send them a 60-day notice. If they were to contact us and present uh, additional information that maybe they need an extension of the modification, we will also do that. We would expect to perhaps place on not an eligible status of the five or six we have, maybe one or two. And so what we're seeking is uh, the board's permission uh, to on November 6th, if they, uh, the, if these individuals have not brought themselves into compliance with their requirements, we will place them on involuntary ineligible status. They can get off that status by providing proof of compliance and making up any discrepancies they have. Uh, then upon proof of that and payment or reinstatement fee, they would be reinstated to active status. Do you have any questions or discussion from the board? Can I have a motion? Um, I'm happy to move the, the recommended item. I just want to make an observation, and that is that we reduced the number of folks who are audited this year. Um, and, and that disappoints me, although I understand the reasons for it. And the reason that it disappoints me is that it's been one of the most effective, from my perspective, programs we have to identify lawyers who are no longer fit to practice uh, because of their infirmities of various kinds. If you can't do your CLE, after multiple warnings from the bar, well after the deadline to do it, and you can't save your own license, how effectively can you advocate for your clients? And so this has been, to my mind, a really beneficial consumer protection effort. It's going to be replaced by effectively 100% auditing when we automate the process of collecting this data. And so I, and I know that we've got um, many other items in fire this year. The reason I'm giving this tale of lament is because I want to observe that not only are we deficit spending this year, we've 
because our existing fee amount does not cover our programs, we are having to make hard choices about how to use the limited resources available to us to accomplish our public protection mission. And this is one more straw in the veil that persuades me that the legislature really needs to look at the level of funding for this agency. With that, I'm happy to support the motion. Do I have a second? A second. Second is like Stevens. Do I have an objection to substituting roll call? Seeing none, it passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item up is item D, which is expended Appendix I, expanded discussion on legal services trust fund and California Commission on Access to Justice. We'll have our staff report, and after the staff reports, then we'll take public comment on this item. Good morning. Okay. <coughs> I forgot to introduce Donna Hershkowitz, our Chief Programs Officer, which presented the report. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as um, we indicated to the programs committee in August, and staff have not included in their recommendations that are going to the board later today, um, uh, governance changes with regard to the California Commission on Access to Justice and the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. Based on input that we had received, we determined that the most appropriate course of action was to defer recommendation. Well, we have the opportunity to re-engage with stakeholders uh, over the course of uh, this coming fall and to better develop the recommendations that we would then bring to the Board of Trustees. As a result of that, staff are proposing the, pro the following process and timeline for the engagement with the stakeholders for these two commissions. Um, so first starting with the uh, California Commission on Access to Justice. Staff are proposing that we have a stakeholder working group that's co-chaired by an appointee of the chair and vice chair of the California Commission on Access to Justice and co-chaired by a trustee appointed by the state bar. Um, overall, there will be nine members and two liaisons. On the next slide, we'll get to the composition um, of those nine members. Uh, the purpose that, of the meeting would be to review the OGC opinions that we talked about previously here at the board um, uh, regarding the operational autonomy that CCAJ has um, has operated under um, pursuant to the grant of that authority by the board. Um, and take a look at options for um, the future structure of the California Commission on Access to Justice. Um, these include, um, and have included in our discussions, that the commission remain in the bar with the operational autonomy that they currently have. They remain in the bar without op operational autonomy and are treated similarly to other sub-entities, um, that there be some hybrid between those two, and the um, commission itself is going to provide some options for what, what a hybrid might look like. Um, and uh, certainly another option would be um, if the board were to conclude that the, uh, that the only approach for the uh, continuation of the commission at the bar would be to remain um, with, without operational autonomy. Certainly the commission would have as an option um, separation from, from the bar in order to perform the functions that they, they believe that, that they need to do um, that they would not be able to do without that operational autonomy. And of course, anything else that comes up. Um, I think we've sort of laid out the, the gamut of possible options generalized here, but um, certainly um, the table um, would be open for other options. That's, the purpose of the stakeholder process is to really allow a, a complete and comprehensive discussion of the various options that might be available for how we would go forward. Um, so the membership of the committee that we proposed, um, the commission uh, itself would have, uh, in addition to the co-chair that I mentioned, um, they would appoint three uh, commission members. Um, the um, the I think this is the older version. Um, the, uh, the board, we'd have the board, uh, in addition to the co-chair that the board appoints, uh, also appoint, uh, which we envision as a trustee, the board appointing a second trustee to the commission. Um, there would be appointments by uh, the legislature, one by the Senate Judiciary Committee and one by the Assembly Judiciary Committee. Um, we would ask the Judicial Council to make an appointment, and then we would um, provide that there would be liaisons, uh, one from the Supreme Court and uh, a state bar staff liaison um, for the Access Commission. Uh, we're uh, contemplating that that staff liaison would be me. 
we are um, thinking that this would be able to be accomplished in um, three meetings. Although we do not believe that it is technically subject to the requirements of Bagley Keene, we thought it was appropriate that these be noticed and open meetings. We have the opportunity for public comment at these working group meetings. Um, and um, we are proposing that um, the meetings would happen October, November, December. We would conclude by um, the end of the calendar year, which would put us in a position to provide a, a final report on um, the governance issues as it relates to this commission in a report to the board in, uh, Jan in January 2019. Um, we are not um, speculating on whether or not there will be unanimity of opinion or not. So one of the things that we are sort of laying out here is certainly to the extent that there are majority and minority opinions that result from the discussions of the uh, of the working group that those would be able to be presented to the bar and um, to, the, to the board of trustees as well. Um, the uh, uh, next we have the legal services trust fund uh, commission um, and uh, this is a this is very similar um, to the California Access Commission proposal um, except where it's not. Um, so for this working group, um, all, we uh, envision a working group that would be co-chaired by an appointee of the chair or vice chair of the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission, as well as a, um, as a trustee that would be appointed by the board. Um, we are envisioning a working group that would have 15 or 14 members. I'll we'll get to that distinction on the next slide. Um, and again, two liaisons. Um, the meeting content here will focus on um, two items. One is the, gov the, the governance question about um, the role of the Trust Fund Commission versus the Board of Trustees versus staff, sort of looking at those issues that we've been looking at with, with the Appendix I um, governance questions. Um, the other um, uh, topic that we would roll into this stakeholder process um, is a review of the IOLTA formula. The, um, the formula that we used to distribute the IOLTA monies was uh, enacted in 1984 and is, has not been changed since that time. Um, we, um, we had had some preliminary conversations with some legislative staff um, when we were talking about the components of, of this year's fee bill. Um, and uh, at that time, they, the, the, they had expressed that this might be the right time to start having these discussions. Um, about the about the IOLTA formula, but, and they had asked us to certainly defer that to the fall um, when the legislative session is out and we can engage in some of these in-depth discussions. So um, uh, it seemed appropriate and natural to us that we would sync up these two processes um, and include them together in the in the stakeholder process. The membership that we are proposing um, would be like. The stakeholder working group with the California Access Commission and um, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission would, in addition to their co-chair, have um, three Trust Fund Commission members. Um, we also think it's important to have three of the programs that are funded um, by the state bar um, pursuant to the IELTA formula. We um, would like the state bar, in addition to the trustee appointed as co-chair, to also appoint a, an additional co-chair. Um, we think it's also appropriate to have non to have legal services providers who are not currently um, funded under the IELTA formula. Um, that would certainly be more so to the second part of the conversation that I discussed, looking at the IELTA formula, um, who gets funded, who doesn't get funded, the timing of the funding, sort of all of those aspects. We thought it was appropriate to have people, um, maybe who applied before and uh, were denied funding, people who didn't apply because they found the process very onerous, um, or people who simply don't have a program that currently, the current statute um, would fund, and taking a look at whether or not there are opportunities to provide funding in different settings that we do now. Um, in addition to the Trust Fund Commission appointees and the state bar appointments, we are um, uh, suggesting legislative appointments, uh, one by the Senate Judiciary Committee and one by the Assembly Judiciary Committee. Uh, again, a judicial counsel appointment as they are a key partner with us in, um, in the grants that we provide to legal services providers. 
Uh, also, we would like to have the Legal Aid Association of California have an appointment to this commission. They are also a key partner um, with us as well as the 97 grantees who receive the current title to funding. And again, um, uh, liaisons from the Supreme Court and state bar staff, we are currently anticipating for this stakeholder process, the state bar liaison would be Leah Wilson. Um, backing up um, to the state bar appointment of the non-grantee legal services providers, staff had, addition, had originally proposed that there would be three, um, three uh, legal services providers who are not currently funded by the, uh, by the formula that we use today as part of that discussion. We had received some feedback that maybe the, non -grant, the number of non-grantees were, um, uh, it was a sort of disproportionate representation of non-grantees on the um, on the working group because of their sort of um, they wouldn't be interested in the first part of the conversation in terms of the uh, the role of uh, how the work is done at the state bar and the role of the legal services trust fund commission that that might not be a, a place where they would have uh, considerable input um, and since they were not currently funded I think the feeling was that the input that we got was that it uh, might not make sense to have the same number of uh, legal services providers who aren't grantees as we do the, those who are. So we've put an option here for the board's consideration in addition to the fact that obviously all of this is an option for you. Um, but in addition, in, in lieu of the three that staff proposed, um, to reduce the net number to two. Donna, is the Legal Aid Association a grantee? No. Um, so one of the uh, one of the things that we would have happen at, uh, through the this working group, this stakeholder process, um, in addition to talking about the content that um, that I addressed before, uh, we would also have the group develop a survey for legal services organizations to provide some feedback on both the issues of the um, structure, the governance structure that we have, as well as the funding formula. Um, we, although we are propo proposing notice in open meetings, certainly um, not everybody has the ability to appear, not everybody has the ability to present comment, and so um, we felt it was important to make sure that we can survey, get the input of all of the individuals and consider that as we're going forward, um, because the, um, the legal services providers are so affected by both of the issues, the, um, the uh, who makes, who, who is making the decisions on the grants, as well as certainly the issue of who can be funded under the statutory formula uh, for determining uh, how to allocate funding. Uh, because we have uh, added the IOLTA formula to this um, uh, stakeholder process, we um, identified the need for five as opposed to three meetings. Again, they would be noticed, they would be open, and we would hope to conclude um, by the end of the calendar year the same way we wrote into conclude with the Access Commission. Um, the purpose of that, again, would allow us to do a report to the board um, at their January meeting on the governance issues um, and to move forward um, through the legislative process with um, potential changes in the IOLTA formula. Um, and again, sort of we would allow for majority and minority reports if that were necessary in order to make sure that the board is presented with full information about what the, um, what the feelings of the working group um, are. Uh, one of the things that um, that I've heard from a couple of people now is, oh, I didn't know this was animated. <laughs> um, one of the things, <laughs> I just thought it was a static picture when I put it in there. Um, one of the things that, I <laughs> that we've heard is um, is a concern that you know the end of the calendar year wouldn't be enough time to conclude all of the discussions on the IOLTA formula, and certainly I hope that if those if, if those discussions are, are proving productive and fruitful, that um, that that we continue those discussions, which would be the natural course if we were moving this through the legislative process. Nothing is nothing is final on December 31st before it gets introduced. There's certainly opportunity, so I would imagine that that would certainly be something that the board would encourage us to do is to continue to be working through the IOLTA formula issues should we come up with a, a, a goal of moving forward on that at, by the end of the calendar year. Questions? Uh, I believe we have a public comment. Just keep in mind that we're supposed to have the Chief Justice here at 1130. I'm not sure if we'll be running on time for that, but we will go until the Chief shows up. 
Uh, but with that in mind, I'd ask the public comment be limited to two minutes each, and I hope that'll be enough. But, um, so first we'll have Selena Copeland. Good morning. Thank you for allowing us to come to this. I think my comments are probably under a minute. Um, I'm Selena Copeland, the Executive Director of the Legal Aid Association of California. We were actually founded at the same time as the IELTS statute. And we were founded to help coordinate and support the legal aid programs that receive IELTS funding. And we've worked closely with the state bar since our creation. And then interestingly now, we have a mix of membership of largely IELTS funded programs, but a small number of non-IELTS funded programs. We work with them as well. For nearly 10 years, I have attended meetings of the Access Commission, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission, and, and the Board of Trustees. And I've seen this body take on issues of access to justice pretty regularly. Um, and largely through reports of the Stakeholders Committee, which is now reworked as a Programs Committee. And I want to particularly note the past leadership of David Pasternak, who I happened to see walk in behind me earlier. Um, he was our appointee to the Access Commission for several years and stepped down when he became chair of the Board of Trustees. And the Board of Trustees has relied on the, um, on the input from your stakeholders, from your experts, and liaisons to various access to justice bodies for guidance on how you should act. And I'd like to comment on the process here today that Gomez has presented. Um, we strongly support the open noticed meetings. I think that's going to be really important as we move forward so everyone can see what's going on. Um, we also strongly support the co-chair proposal. We think that's a great idea. And um, we ask that the proposal, as it's being developed from the various working groups, that it be open for comment before the Board of Trustees acts on it in January. Um, my final request is just on the, on the piece about the um, Legal Services Trust Fund Commission and the IELTS statute. We hope that as the working groups and as the Board of Trustees move forward, you continue to look at the input from your stakeholders and your experts. And um, the discussion of the continued existence of the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission should be separated from the IELTS statute. The IELTS statute is too complicated and too heavily relied on for stable funding for it to change in just a handful of meetings. So I'm happy that Donna um, suggested that we continue that conversation if it's a fruitful discussion. Um, I think any changes to the statute may affect thousands of low-income Californians who really rely on their local legal aid programs. So if any existing funding is cut in a different way, that may actually impact thousands of people. So um, thank you for the opportunity to comment, and I'm hopeful to engage in the process in the future. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Next is Kevin Clinton. Hello, uh, thank you for wanting to speak. Uh, my name is. Can you use the mic back on? What, what is it? Can you use the one next to it? Apologies. Sorry, hopefully you hear me now. Uh, my name is Kevin Kloon, and I am with Legal Aid at Work, uh, uh, which participates in the ALPA program currently. And uh, I am here just to emphasize on behalf of the many legal aid organizations across the state just how important this process is to us and not. Not because we're financially involved, because obviously none of us get into legal services because we wanted to financially enrich ourselves. We are here because we want to make sure that the already comparably low level of service that uh, civil legal aid is providing to low income Californians uh, doesn't decrease as a result of this process. And in particular, um, you know, California by some metrics has some of the largest rates of poverty in the United States right now, and um, we are comparatively less. Uh, uh, serving low-income Californians less than other uh, comparable IOLTA programs in other states, certainly other comparable states such as New York. And we just want to make sure that when it, whatever changes are made, particularly the statute, but also to the government structure, doesn't harm uh, our clients at the end of the day, which are low-income Californians. The second point I'd like to also emphasize is what Selena just said, the notion that there are two fundamentally different issues that are before the, the working group here. The first, on the governance structure, I think it's a relatively discrete issue that we likely could be able to wrap up at the end of the year. The second question about the structure of the IELTA formula, who gets funded, what sort of programs get funded, and how much money gets allocated to different geographic areas, those all involve incredibly complicated issues that not only require significant deliberation among the various stakeholders, but also, I think, research and outside input that's going to last uh, beyond the January time period. So, we would, we would very much uh, be interested in separating out those two issues and, and viewing them as separate processes uh, so that we can have uh, considered discussion and informed discussion, particularly about the structure of ALT statute. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
We're going to um, suspend the meeting and finish up uh, later with the Chief Justices here. She'd like to proceed, and so we, we will accommodate her. I think it seems to be an appropriate thing to do. So, Michael wants to take over the mic.
meeting today. And I'm not going to introduce the chief because I think everybody in this room in particular knows her rather remarkable life story, her remarkable commitments to serving California, and the various ways in which she achieves that as the Chief Justice of California. So instead, I just want to comment for a moment on the significance of her presence here today and what it symbolizes for our democracy. I think all of us recognize that you can't have a democracy without independent courts to, re to vindicate the rights of individuals and restrain the political branches. And I think the people in this room also know that you can't have independent courts without a professional uh, body of lawyers to serve those courts. And therefore, the regulation of lawyers is in the judicial branch. We are a judicial branch agency, and we serve under the Chief Justice. We have statutory missions that are very much like the court's missions. We exist to protect the public. We strive to achieve access to justice for all Californians without respect to their income or their geography. And we strive to construct an inclusive profession that is as diverse as are the 40 million people who call themselves Californians. And so the Chief Justice's work is very much our work. And it's very fitting that we welcome her here today to swear in two new trustees, three returning trustees, a new chair, and a new vice chair. So please join me in welcoming the Chief Justice of California, Tommy Contos Akua. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you and to see you and to see your families in the audience. I want to thank Michael for his comments and also thank Michael for your work this year, your work in preparation for this year, as well as your team, as well as all the board, as well as those coming, those leaving, and including, of course, the administration. These have been watershed days for the bar, watershed days for the administration of justice. And the good work that's been done over the years has been collective good work. It's been the kind of good work that is born of disagreement. The kind of good work that's born of civility and respect and hard conversations and frank conversations, understanding our duties and responsibilities. I believe that Michael said it best when he said the one single word is service. That's what we are doing here. We are serving. We're serving because we've decided to take a different kind of role separate and apart from our professional personal life, and that is to serve for access for justice, to serve for public protection. And it is true that the state bar is a judicial entity under the California Supreme Court. And you know that we take an incredible interest in the work you do, and we support you in everything you do. And that we understand that every entity has goals, and under those goals of responsibility include, of course, public protection. But under that comes regulation and discipline and admissions and diversity and inclusion and legal access for those who are least able to have it for themselves. And of course, it also means working with the other two branches of government. And it means that leadership has to have the fiduciary duties and responsibilities we all took an oath for. It also means that we must act with integrity and transparency, and that we must solve our problems first before we take them outside of our branch to ask for others to solve them. Because we know, honestly, that we are the best problem solvers for the kinds of issues we have because we know them intimately. We've experienced them in our careers. We have colleagues who've experienced them. And because we're here to serve a profession that we elected to be part of and put behind our name. And so I speak to the challenges ahead, but I also speak to the strengths ahead. And I will say, I know exactly where this entity is because I was here eight years ago with the judicial branch and our judicial council and the changes that were required of us as an entity to regain trust, to regain accountability, to regain acceptance, not only within our branch, but outside to the other two branches. And I know you've heard me say this and it's been mentioned before, but it is truly the storming, norming, or storming, forming, and norming process. And who better to storm substantively than lawyers and judges, and then to form and to know that we have to norm the form. And so that's what I understand you are going through. That's where we support you. That's where we know that you have hard choices ahead. 
But we also know that we have to be guided by signposts, not only public protection, but let me just say flatly, the state bar needs a dues increase. There hasn't been one in 20 years. It's hard to turn the lights on. Now the real question is, how much? And then the real question is going to be, how much and how much will we have to report and be accountable? And that's all built on trust. That is all built on everyone's fiduciary duty here to bring the best of their game to find solutions that make this bar at the continued success that it can be. It means coming together, as we all know, it's going to be negotiation and compromise in our reorganization and restructure. And we have some of the best minds to bring to bear new creative ways that we can go forward under our new regulatory scheme and reporting scheme, but also pursuing the individual interests of every sub-entity. And I believe that the people around this table can do that. And it means novel thinking, respectful thinking, open-mindedness with the goal in mind that we have to be a cohesive unit if we expect to have that dues increase which we so dearly need for every other aspect of this entity. I know this because eight years of my own experience in the judicial branch, the largest in the country, tells me that we needed to reorganize, reassess, make some difficult choices, go forward, reassess those choices, reintegrate some of what we had cut, but we did need to cut to go forward. And we needed to establish new relationships. And it's true not everyone was happy, but we did it with transparency, we did it with integrity, and we did it with the always notion that we can reconsider. But we had to move forward, and we had to make progress, and we had to be new in our new formation. So I say that to you because it's going to be a big road ahead. But I have complete faith in the talent here at the Board of Trustees and your experience. And I thank you for giving up your time to take on this challenge. I thank you because I know you don't have to. And I know the talent that exists here. So for that, my eternal gratitude and all of our Supreme Court justices' gratitude. We watch you carefully, we get regular reports, and we're proud of what you're doing, and we're proud of the goals, but we need a dues increase. <laughs> <laughs> so it is uh, my pleasure to bring up members to be sworn, and also to maybe be resworn. So I call up at this time Brandon N. Stallings, Sonia T. Dellen, Ruben Duran, Jason Lee and Debbie Mann to be sworn. Between the five. Here we go. Excellent. Here we go. Please raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I state your name. I state your name. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That will support and defend. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I am about to enter as a member of the State Bar. The duties upon which I am about to enter as a member of the State Bar. Thank you. Congratulations. I now invite Vice Chair Alan K. Steinbrecher to be sworn. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. 
That it will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I am about to enter as vice chair. The duties upon, uh, uh, upon which I am about to enter as vice chair. Thank you. Thank you. I next invite our future chair, uh, Jason Lee. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That it will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation for you. That I take this obligation for you. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. That I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter as chair of the state board. Upon which I'm about to enter as chair of the state board. We will be in recess for a few minutes as we reassemble the stage we had previously, and then we'll get back to work. And I think we'll probably take our lunch break after Joanna finishes her agenda. Actually, we're going to do a working lunch with program committee, so if you can get your lunch, okay. you can be seated as soon as possible. That would be great. Thank great. you.
Live. We have a couple members of our committee that have left us temporarily. We'll go ahead and proceed without them. We still have a couple more members of the public who would like to make a comment. So I will next call Catherine Blakemore, who is the Vice Chair of the Commission on Access to Justice. Uh, thank you, and I, I will do my best to be uh, brief. In addition to being the Vice Chair of the Access Commission, I'm also a Legal Services um, Executive Director of the Legal Services Program Disability Rights California. We're actually one of the programs that provides legal services in all 58 counties of the state. So we're a wide breadth of what we um, of what we what we do. Um, first, I want to say I just echo the chief's comment of I think we are all here because we care in part about access to justice, and that's why I, in addition to my day job, spend a lot of time working on on access issues. Um, I appreciate the fact that we have slowed down the process so we can be more thoughtful in the time that staff has taken to put together a process that's designed um, to do just that. And I look forward to the process, um, which will really allow us to be thoughtful and to consider all the options and to come up with solutions that work for both the commissions as well as for the um, as well as for um, on the on the trust fund side, I want to just note how much I appreciate the Board of Trustees and the uh, Trust Funds Commission uh, for support of legal aid, and particularly the recent decisions to increase the amount of legal aid funding through the IOLTA program. Um, that infusion of additional resources is, does much to eliminate the justice gap in California. Um, I think it comes at an important time. The studies this last week um, indicated that California continues to have the highest poverty rate in the nation, um, and that there are 7 million Californians who struggle to make ends meet. So we continue to have a long ways to go to meeting the needs of Californians, including their needs for access to courts and access, um, access to, to lawyers. Um, just a couple of comments about um, the process. I think you have a very ambitious process, particularly on the Trust Fund Commission side. You have two distinct issues as have been pointed out, both the structure of the Trust Fund Commission as well as taking on look and examination of the IOLTA um, funding formula. I think the notion of considering how we can be flexible and do the kind of work that's necessary, particularly on the Trust Fund Commission side, is really important. As I saw on the IOLTA formula side, is really important. It's a complex formula. Um, there's lots of, of uh, details, I think, that have to be um, examined. And in that regard, I, I think it's interesting to note that we are at the same time embarking on an access um, of the bars and um, working on a study about the justice gap in California, I would hope that we find a way through this process to consider what information are we getting from the justice gap study as we're looking towards any revisions to the IOLTA formula. It seems a little premature to adjust a funding formula at the same time we're trying to get our our, hand, our hands around what is the justice gap in California. And that study may point us to the need to look at a variety of things, such as what are the resources that the state of California uh, puts to meeting the unmet legal needs of, of Californians, both that meet the current indigency standard, as well as modest means individuals. I think as Leah appropriately noted this morning that the justice gap needs in California can be 
well beyond what we have traditionally thought of an indigent population. So I think it's it's worth just considering how we might um, might bring those um, together. Um, so thank you for again uh, taking the time to be thoughtful about this. I look forward to working with you on on both of those committees, um, finding solutions that work um, for for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your work this year with regard to the Access Commission and really being collaborative about it. Really appreciate it very much. Next, we have Rich Brightness. Did I get it right? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rich Brightness. I'm the co chair of the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, the commission uh, was a bit surprised a few months ago when uh, it appeared as though a recommendation had been made that the services of the commission might no longer be needed. Uh, and I think this process we're about to undertake, as Donna had outlined, is uh, an approach that we all welcome. I think a study of what the commission does and the role it serves with respect to the board of trustees and with respect to the grantees is a significant one and this process appears to be one that will be deliberative and we hope that the commission will uh, the working group will consist of diverse voices so that the end result will be include uh, funding activities uh, for those of you who are new uh, to this process the legal services trust fund commission uh, in the coming year will be granting 60 million dollars in grants to about 100 grant recipients the role served by the commission is considerably uh, more detailed than I ever imagined when I first volunteered for this duty. Uh, it mention has been made of the proposal of linking or combining uh, the tasks of the working group to include the IOLTA formula. You should understand that the commissioners and our, many of our grantees have appeared at commission meetings uh, with concern that there might be a linkage of these two issues. It's efficient to have a working group consist of parties whose um, insight and experience will enable the Board of Trustees to determine the future of the Commission and its role on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, to re-examine the IELTA formula and see what tweaking might be necessary in order to improve the delivery of services to the Board. Uh, but that efficiency is um, a, a reward for a certain amount of risk the legal aid community has surfaced, and I, uh, I think you've heard twice already. I won't belabor the point, but I'm not sure the risk-reward ratio of having those two issues decided by the same group in the same context over the next three months is uh, not fraught with some risks that will have to be addressed. And I think communication will be essential uh, as it relates to what we're doing and uh, the effect it has in the legal aid community. Um, it will be important that we clarify the goal of the working group. Uh, I have to tell you that the commissioner's surprise at the recommendations is in part due to the fact that it was unclear to us as to what problem was sought to be solved by the re-examination of the role of the commission. It's been in existence for many, many years. And as I mentioned at my last presentation to the Board of Trustees, you should understand that the role of the commission is the same role that a board of trustees or board of directors plays in the corporate environment. Some of you are general counsels. So you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, management of a corporation should be equated to staff, and the commission's role here ought to be equated to that of the board of directors. We get involved in issues that are driven in part by the imprecise language of the regulations and the statutory scheme under which grants are made. And our involvement in those activities includes um, not only um, approval of the recommendations made by staff, but it also includes interviews with the grantees, uh, quality control reviews, confirmation, this is all uh, regulatory, uh, if you take a look at the state our rules on this, confirmation of professional standards maintenance, staff oversight and volume distribution of the $60 million I just mentioned to you, uh, an annual grant that we make, resolving complaints filed against grantees, which is a 
regulatory obligation of the commission that would have to be replaced were it not in existence. Um, and preserving the institutional legacy, I have to tell you that I've served in this capacity now for about seven years, and it took me a number of years to truly understand the role that commissioners play in helping staff understand the regulations and how they apply. I'll give you one brief example, and I don't want to overstep my bounds in terms of time. Uh, we recently had to determine whether or not the accounting obligations of grantees could be met by a law school providing legal services through that law school that enabled uh, law students to gain experience and the indigent community to benefit from those services. It's impossible for an accountant to provide the statement required by the regulations simply for the function of that legal services provision by the law school because the law school is involved in many other functions, as many other expenses, and so separate statements are provided. That's required by the regulations. This is a problem staff brings to the commission. The commission has to understand how to navigate through the regulatory language in order to approve a grant under those circumstances. And this is only one of many different examples. I could take you through the regulatory language. I won't bother you with that now, but you'll find that it's imprecise enough to require staff to come to the commission for interpretation. As far as the working group is concerned, the working group's role will be in part to create a survey. It needs to have the skill set necessary to be certain that the results of that survey are not in any way skewed by the form formulation of the questions. So I, I applaud the effort at seeking the input of stakeholders through the survey process, but I am concerned that it, the, the group have the right constituency in order to prepare a survey that you can rely on in making your final determination. Uh, we also have many trust fund commissioners who are no longer on the commission. They've been termed out. My term was extended by the Board of Trustees for three years, and then because of my status as an executive, it was extended. So those extensions ultimately run out, and very valuable commission members are uh, now retired, but I'm very interested in the work of this commission. And I would recommend that the working group consists at least be open to membership from the retired members of the commission who have a, uh, an understanding of the history of the commission and its legacy that can be passed on to you and in your determination. Otherwise, we applaud what you're doing. I think it will be a very worthwhile conversation, the end result of which I hope will enable all of us to provide more funding and better distribution of those funds for the purpose of providing legal services to the board. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just for the audience, we'll have further discussion on the other subentities on the appendix side uh, later during the full board meeting. There is a sign-up sheet if you want to make public comment on any of those other subentities during that or any other item to be heard today. So if it's in the back, <clears throat> Just pass the clock on that table. So if you're interested, go ahead and sign up. With that, we will um, proceed with this discussion amongst the members of the board regarding what we should be proposing with regard to these working groups. We have two options to consider for the Legal Services Trust Fund Working Group, and we need to make a decision which one of those two we think would be better if we have another idea we'd like to propose. Do I have any thoughts? Do you want to put the slide up that shows those options? Sarah. So I can. Yeah. Um, I can highlight the, the two differences. Um, were just uh, it had having to do with the number of legal services providers who are not currently uh, funded by the Yolta formula. Uh, as I had mentioned, staff had originally thought that it made sense to have three uh, three such grantees on this, uh, non-grantees on this working group in addition to those three who are currently receiving uh, federal funding. We've received feedback from some that, there's, that, that, that um, due to the issues on the table, that might be a disproportionately high number of um, those who are not currently legal services of uh, IOLTA grantees. And so uh, the, um, the options that staff have put in front of you are either uh, three that staff had recommended or potentially two um, uh, legal services providers who are not currently funded under the IELTA program. Um, I'm, com I'm comfortable with two. I think it's most important that they be in the dialogue. Uh, 
um, and that they be in the room and that they be heard. Um, but two articulate folks can um, accomplish that. I, I just want to make a couple of comments about uh, what we've heard today. First, I want to thank our friends from the Legal Services Committee for being here. I know you have a lot of other things to be doing uh, and scarce resources to do them with, so I'm grateful that you're here. And I want to underscore that nobody questions the value of the work that you do. We greatly appreciate the sacrifices that you make uh, to represent your clients as well as you do. I think like almost everything else hard that we do here at the Board of Trustees, there are competing values to be addressed. And among the values that I think need to animate this conversation are the need for stable funding for vital organizations that serve the poor. And the need to encourage innovation by new ideas, new service providers, um, and new uh, social needs. And existing organizations can innovate, um, but we also need to make room at the table for new folks. And as to the, there's an equity issue here um, that is easier to identify than to address, I'll be frank. The IELTA formula was adopted in 1983 when George Duke Magian was governor and Rose Burke was chief justice. That was a long time ago and very far away. And if you live in places like, to be frank, Brandon and I do, California is much different than it was. There are millions of people who now live in the Inland Empire counties that did not live there in 1983. And if you look at where the service providers who are funded by all oils are located, they're mostly in counties that have salt water on their feet. And those of us who don't touch the salt water don't have the level of services, even per capita, that others have. But there are many reasons for this, and funding is only one of them. But it is time for the 40 million Californians to rethink how they fund and use this vital um, service. And the board will be part of that discussion. The last thing I want, I want to say is I would tell our friends on the Trust Fund Commission that you should not feel singled out by the hard questions we're asking about your very existence. It is not a reflection on you and your work. Quite frankly, it's a reflection on us and our work. It's a reflection of the fact that we found the sprawl of advisory bodies unmanageable, that we found this board to easily disengage from essential parts of our own mission, and that we needed to reorganize in order to be successful. So if this is a breakup, and I think it's not, it's not about you, it's about us. <laughs> and with that, I would be happy to support the staff recommendation, opting for two seats for non-IELTA-funded entities. And that would be my motion. Do we want to do um, a separate motion for each group? Or do we want to include the access Whatever commission? Whatever the pleasure of the chair is. Well, there's only one recommendation for the access commission. I, I suggest we just include that into a single motion if you I'm, take I'm that. Ready. Do we have a second? I'm, I'm, this is the second one, the two. The two. Yeah. Unless there's a, you know, if someone objects and wants to vote on them separately, please speak up. No, I just have one question. I think you we were talking about rep in the break. I just want to make sure that, that you know, people were involved in the process for the process. I hope, I feel like you, it, privately, you did tell me that, that the staff feels like the process process was effective. And I just want to make sure that's true. So, for example, the, um, uh, the notion that there would be co-chairs from the Board of Trustees and the commissions was, um, was based on a conversation that I had with Judge Juhas and Catherine Blakemore from the um, from the Access Commission, and so we had talked about the process um, and what ultimately we recommended. Um, I, I told them in a follow-up email that I stole liberally from their ideas um, because I thought they um, they provided some some uh, really good suggestions that would that would make sure that that um, that folks felt that folks were included and just didn't feel like we created a process to make it look like people were included. Thank you. Do we have a second to Michael's motion? Second. Alan Steinberger seconds. We've had uh, people come and go, so I think we'll have to take a roll call on this. Broughton? Yes. Jen? Yes. Yeah. Roland Jenna? Yes. Manning? Yes. Virtula? Yes. Stallings? Yes. Steinberger? Yes. Stevens? Yes.
Thank you, Donna. Staff, have anything else they need to present? Do you have work plan? Work. Are you going to present it? Or am I going to present it? Do you have a question? I thought you would want to okay. get back on this. Okay. I'll go ahead. Okay. <laughs> You're going to be prepared. Okay. So uh, this will, the last item of this year's programs committee agenda has to do with our work plan. And um, as you all know, the work plan for the programs committee this year was quite extensive. We had a huge amount of work to do. It was the first year that stakeholders and admissions and education were combined into a single committee. There was a lot to do. Uh, I have to uh, congratulate everyone for the things that we did accomplish, because it was quite a bit. The bar exam studies, that we were working on got concluded and we're continuing with a job analysis study that we are about to endeavor upon. The sections have been successfully separated from the state bar. We developed and implemented the 10 hours of specific non-attorney training. We had the very productive joint meeting of the California Commission on Access to Justice and uh, our committee. The challenging uh, job of reviewing the sub-entities under Appendix I of the Governance and Public Interest Task Force um, has been uh, very uh, involved and has involved a lot of personal time on the part of trustees and certainly a significant amount of time on the part of staff. And as you heard today, we, we've gotten the revisions to the lawyer referral services rules. We're sending out the public comment after a year we're working on those. And the special admissions rules after many years of those needing to be updated, we got those accomplished too. We, we, that was all in addition to our recurring items that we handle every year through this committee. So it's been quite a year. There's some things remaining. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at the work plan to see if there's anything that you want to see added to that that you think would be appropriate for the committee. And um, if there's anybody that wants to comment on the work plan, feel free to do so now. The, uh, the going forward as well. Yeah, this is what you're inheriting, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so no, we can't remove everything. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is going to be a part of the larger conversation this afternoon with the full board. Uh, but the appendix I review, um, I'm wondering if we need to have a separate commission to review the recommendations because appendix I. I, I, I like it to uh, govern this task force. We had um, a, a mountain of work to do, many stakeholders to engage with, and echoing what um, Chief Justice has spoken about just before lunch, you know, support to engage, uh, engage everybody in the process. And I know staff has done an incredible amount of work on this. Uh, those working closely with the appendix I review have put in you know, hours and hours and hours. Um, but I wonder if if we get more uh, effectively satisfy our uh, government's objective by uh, continuing to have this open, open and inclusion, the inclusive process. Uh, one that uh, you know, opens up these recommendations to public comment uh, to make sure that all sides are heard. And I've, I've been receiving communications from various stakeholders that touch on each one of these areas, but not necessarily, <coughs> excuse me, in a cohesive way. So I'm wondering if we're in order to accomplish that buy-in that we're looking for from all of our partners, if we should have a commission to examine the appendix I recommendations and how to go forward. I think that would definitely be something the full board would be in a position to discuss. I mean, the the appendix I issues presented to us today, obviously we are engaging in some additional stakeholder involvement, but uh, I do think the full board should probably weigh in on what we should be doing next. Yeah, my sense is that uh, this is an elephant that has to be eaten a slice at a time. Um, and we have some slices on our agenda today, and 
some of them will be remained to the PGI justice. I'm not sure this is no longer my responsibility. But I do think we're, it's going to be a conversation. It's going to take some time. Uh, but we need to make sure that we can make Thank you, John, for all your hard work to show this off. Big agenda. Yeah. Yeah. You, you did a lot of work. I, I, I thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I wanted to say it's been a real honor and privilege to serve in this role, and I wanted to thank Michael for giving me that opportunity and providing us with such great leadership, great leadership this year. So thank you, Michael. I also wanted to thank Mark, my vice chair, for being so loud in all your opinions this year. I say <laughs> with, sorry. About that. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I also wanted to thank Leah for all of her help this year with these really challenging issues, and DAG, who participate with a lot of our necessary data development. Richard Schaffler, who helped put together the Appendix I report and was working <coughs> significantly with this committee. I really appreciate all the work that went into that. I want to thank Amy Nunez from the admissions office, Donna Hershkowitz, who we all just heard from, Greg Shin, who worked a lot on these uh, particular work, uh, work plan items that we had presented to us, Rodney Lowe, who presented earlier today. This is giving you an idea, Brendan, of all the people you're going to be working with this year. Um, Elizabeth Hom, who we also heard from today. Pat Lee, who isn't here, but who's been a a huge voice in the legal services world has been very helpful this year. We have uh, Dina DiLoretto, Robert McPhail, a wonderful general counsel, Vanessa Holton, who's been critical with our Appendix I work, Dusty Overbeck as well, Nicole Pereira, Ron P, who loves his data, and especially Justin Ewart and Andrew Conover, who really helped staff this committee and keep everything going. So I wanted to thank everybody all of the staff for an incredible year that we've accomplished a lot, and it couldn't have been done without everyone's hard work. So, thank you. <laughs> and with that, this committee is adjourned. Okay. We have a meeting of the Executive Committee next. It is scheduled to go for 40 minutes. I think we can wrap it in 30. I think we can probably do the closed session in about 10 or 15 minutes. Is that a good estimate? Can we have an estimate? Fair closed session? The executive director performance review and one uh, dispute before I can. I don't know. I will make an executive decision that we anticipate will be in closed session for 15 minutes. So uh, let's go ahead and get started, and we will start in closed session after we call the open session roll. So, executive director, can you guys?
right before you go to bed. Yeah. And then, and then when I wake, wake up, up like, I've got to catch it. I do actually, you know what? I got to say, I just want to spread it. You would spread it. You would spread it. You would spread it. Like something I want to set up is a novel, like I think about how I would lay it out. You visualize it. Yes. That's impressive. I mean, I don't actually always go see it. it. Okay, so uh, let's let's get back to it because I would like to finish by um, one o'clock if we can because I think Rad can use the extra time and we really don't want to start the board meeting late because we have a chorus of unhappily certified specialists to listen to this afternoon. Um, so um, we are an open session of the executive committee of the board of trustees. There will be a meeting of the whole board of trustees in an hour or so. Um, is there any public comment for the executive committee? Seeing none, we turn to the chair's report. As is my habit, I will get my chair's report at the board meeting. Um, I do have one item for the board report, however. The board book, which, as you know, has been allowed to fall into disuse, or at least into disrepair, um, has uh, a number of requirements. One of them is that when an incoming chair constructs his committee assignments, that he is required to consult with the outgoing chair. Um, and the board book has a structure which makes the executive committee comprised of the committee chairs. And historically that has, um, because we've had committee chairs from the third year class, we've generally had 100% turnover on the executive committee every year. The statute that um, got us a fee bill required that every committee of the Board of Trustees include at least one member of each of the four appointing authorities, Governor, Senate, Assembly, Chief Judge, and Court. And so Jason's appointments, which are on tomorrow's agenda, reflect that statutory requirement and do not reflect the board book requirement that the executive committee be comprised of committee chairs. Appropriately so. The board book will catch up with statute, but the board book cannot uh, defy statute. And so I just wanted to note that we have recommendations that will be acted on tomorrow, and that I wanted to note that I am aware of them, feel appropriately consulted, and I wanted to note for the record that that consultation had occurred, and that there's this odd tension that will get fixed as the board book um, comes into the 21st century. That's uh, just a report, no action or discussion required, but if there are questions or concerns, um, this is your moment. Okay, that takes us to the consent calendar, which is a recommendation to conform board committee work plans to the calendar year. Is there any desire to remove that for discussion? Silence being consent, the consent calendar is approved. That takes us to our one item of business. Um, Donnie, you've been awarded a whole five minutes for this. Take it away. I would say two and a half. Uh, what you have before you today is um, an agenda item for uh, extend the, a brief extension of the terms of the chairs and vice chairs of those sub entities that are subject to the appendix I review. Um, if the chair and vice chair term was set to to end in September, um, because we knew that one of the considerations that the board was going to make during this appendix I review was about the size of the committees. It didn't make sense for us, we staff thought, to be providing to you all for consideration under the normal calendar, which would have been May or July, filling vacant positions. Because if you ultimately decided to turn to the size of the committee, then that would have been for naught. Um, we do think, however, because implementation activities will take some time, that if we do a brief extension time with the chair and the vice chair, that will allow us to proceed in a more orderly fashion. When we come to you, um, with implementation for each of the committees to the extent that we need to adjust this extension of term, we'll do that on a committee by committee basis. So effectively, we're keeping our options open, but we're not committing to any particular outcome with respect to the appendix I review process. Yes, exactly right. Is there discussion, or may I have a motion? <coughs> so Joanna has moved it. Is there a second? Second. Deborah has seconded. Is there a need for discussion, or may we substitute the role? The item is approved. And we're adjourned, and Mr. Rad Chairman, you can start early. Thank you.
I, I'm sure he did. He was very hesitant when I brought him the fact that he's still doing it. That's true. <laughs> that was my happy to serve, so yeah, <laughs> right I'll, I'll burn off. <laughs> you're, just, you're just saying that because I'm a millennial. I'm actually, actually a what? I'm a millennial. Actually, I'm a millennial.
Petrula, there. Soleil, here. Scully, here. Steinbrecher, Steinbrecher, Stevens, here. And Jason. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to go into closed se session. Uh, we're in closed session pursuant to government code section 11126, uh, subsection C, subsection 2. Thank you.
Steinbrecher. Here. Steven. Here. Thank you. Uh, we'll start the meeting out in open session with a call for public comment. I understand there's at least one person. Welcome. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Please uh, identify yourself and um, proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is David Carr. I am a lawyer in San Diego, and I'm here today as the authorized. David, just hold that button. There you go. Say that. Yes. Yep. Thanks again. Uh, my name is David Carr. I'm a lawyer in San Diego, and I'm here today as the authorized representative of the Association of Discipline Defense Counsel. Uh, as a young staff lawyer at the State Bar of California, I was tasked with telephoning a complainant with the happy news that the lawyer that she had complained about had been disbarred in another matter. Uh, I was surprised by her reaction. She was very angry and said, what? Is that all you're gonna do to him? Uh, confusion about the purposes of discipline is hardly new. Uh, the California Supreme Court noted that in uh, March versus State Bar of California, a 1934 case at 2 Cal Second, two Cal Second 75 and page 78, the California Supreme Court said, it must first be noted that although the word punishment is frequently used, the discipline of an attorney is not punitive in character. Uh, confusion it still exists. Even state park court judges on occasion uh, had slept, or I think they slept, and referred to discipline as punishment. So the principle that discipline is not punishment, is not punitive in nature, and exists to protect the public, of course, long predates the existence of the State Bar of California. Now the State Bar has been transformed into an agency whose sole purpose is focusing on protection of the public. Uh, in my view, and the view of many, that's a change that uh, is long overdue. And I personally welcome that change, although ADPC doesn't have a position for that. But that transformation does not alter the fundamental principle that the purposes of discipline are not punitive in nature, but exist to protect the public. Discipline Defense Council are concerned about recent proposals that will have an undeniable punitive effect. Uh, the revival and the expansion of the Consumer Alert Batch proposal on discovers is being discussed today. Uh, the resuscitation after 25 years of a Moribin statute providing for monetary sanctions, they're clearly punitive in nature. And we're sure that other principles, other proposals will be forthcoming as we go forward. ADDC, Distant Defense Lawyers, um, we hope and pray that the board clearly embraces the principle that discipline is not meant to be punishment and looks critically at these proposals and the proposals that will undoubtedly come forward in the future with an eye toward make, drawing the line between those things that truly protect the public uh, and reject measures that are punitive in nature that have little or no public protection impact. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Um, I am going to the large part forego my report other than um, the agenda today is, uh, has been over the past year a remarkable effort um, between various offices, including OCDC and GC and the court. Um, and as this is my last RAD meeting, I wanted to acknowledge just really the fine work that uh, the staff has put in um, and really assisted myself and Sean uh, in, in doing our job overseeing our, uh, our response system. So thank you. Uh, and uh, Sean, if, if you give you the opportunity, I will continue on as the co-chair of RAD, but uh, if you wanted to say anything. Well, I'll just second that. It's really been a pleasure to to work with the staff and see all the hard work that they're doing and that they're and that they're doing. So we have a number of items on consent that we're going to pull off. Uh, the first one that we're going to pull off is item two A, uh, and that is um, 
DOC can see proposed rule changes uh, going one through four, though I think there may be some slight adjustments as to what's going to be addressed. So I can invite Melanie and Steve to come up. of the proposals two through four, two, items two, three, and four, the judicial notice reinstatement cases and third party subpoena items. Uh, it was brought to our attention subsequent to uh, the drafting and submission of these items that it creates difficulty for uh, other areas of the bar in regards to the publication and circulation of the new rules and procedure. And so at this time, we would move in the recommendations for those items uh, to strike the words immediately and will apply to all pending and future matters and insert the words January 1st, 2019 and thereafter will apply to all pending and future matters. In addition, I guess we can just move directly on to item number one, which is the uh, consumer alert item. And I would point out that in addition to the public comments received that were submitted to this board, we also received from the San Diego County Bar Association a letter that is dated July 11, 2018, and they uh, informed us that they mailed it through the U.S. mail, uh, but it was never received. And so uh, they emailed that to us this week, and therefore we felt it appropriate to bring that to your attention as well. So I will distribute that letter now. I do have additional copies available for people in the audience. So in total, we received six comments. Uh, from the public on this proposal. They are from the Association of Disciplined Defense Council, the Los Angeles County Bar Association, the Solo and Small Firm Section of the California Lawyers Association, the Orange County Bar Association, the San Diego County Bar Association, and uh, Ellen Pansky, an individual practitioner. And we appreciate the time and consideration of all of those that made public comments, uh, they raised appropriate concerns and thoughtful concerns, frankly. Uh, and I appreciate Mr. Carr's presence here today to raise some of concerns to you uh, in person. The vast majority of the comments were regarding the uh, notice of disciplinary charges item, the, essentially the first, the first half of item one of those that proposal. And in fact, three of the six comments state that they have no objection to the other proposals, to the non-notice disciplinary charges uh, proposals that we have. I have summarized the objections in the written agenda item and have uh, drafted some responses. The San Diego County Bar Association echoes many of those concerns that were already addressed in the written item. There are some additional items which they to which they object that are new. Uh, the first is the San Diego County Bar Association objects to involuntary inactive uh, to a consumer alert for, based on an involuntary inactive status for involuntary treatment. And I would just point out that that is actually uh, specifically excluded from our proposal, that somebody who is, uh, has that type of an issue, that alert would not go up on that uh, under this proposal. Uh, additionally, felony charges, the San Diego County Bar Association uh, lodged an objection to the posting of, uh, upon the filing of felony charges based on the threat uh, of that the posting has the potential to distort the criminal process 
by giving criminal prosecutors an unfair advantage uh, to negotiate pleas in essence that, that uh, if, if the case is not resolved, then the consumer alert would go up and uh, could, in essence, get somebody to, to uh, plead when they otherwise would not. And generally, criminal dispositions are negotiated after the filing of a criminal complaint or a charging document, whether it be a, a complaint or a information or indictment. And so this alert would already have been posted as is required under the statutes that are mentioned in the item and that we had previously discussed here. So again, I'm not sure that that concern necessarily is apt, although, uh, as I mentioned, I certainly appreciate there are other concerns. All of that said, I do think it is important to correct a misperception. And that misperception is that scores or dozens or hundreds of attorneys have their cases, their disciplinary cases dismissed every year. And all of the public comments received expressed significant concern that the posting of alerts upon the filing of a notice of disciplinary charges would potentially prejudice these lawyers, a significant number of lawyers who might later be exonerated or whose matters might later be dropped, dismissed, or subsequently reversed. And two of the public comments uh, cite the closed by state bar with no action and closed by state bar with non-disciplinary action statistics from the annual discipline report published by the state bar for to support the proposition that large numbers of lawyers are, in essence, uh, charged with disciplinary charges and subsequently exonerated. But the statistics to which they're, they're pointing have very specific definitions in the ADR and are essentially unrelated to the number of attorneys who are later exonerated, have their charges dropped, dismissed, uh, etc., or subsequently overturned. Closed with non-disciplinary act, disciplinary action is defined as an admonition or the granting of a petition pursuant to section 6007. This means that when the state bar court grants a petition pursuant to 6007 paren b paren 3, for example, uh, as a result of uh, mental illness on the part of the attorney, that is properly counted as a matter closed with non-disciplinary action. This is not a situation where an attorney is exonerated or has been charged with a, with a notice of disciplinary charges and is then uh, dismissed, dropped, or subsequently reversed. Of the 82 cases listed as having been closed with non-disciplinary action in 2017 in the ADR, 47 of those attorneys were actually disbarred. 29 of them received some form of disciplinary action, state suspension, actual suspension, probation, etc. There was one of those 82 attorneys who received an admonition, and rounding out the 82 was some uh, 6007B3 matters. Closed with no action, on the other hand, uh, is defined as closed by the court with dismissal, termination, or denial of a petition. Generally, disciplinary cases are initiated with the filing of a notice of disciplinary charges, not a petition. OCTC does file petitions on occasion, including substantial threat of harm proceedings, the petitions we just talked about for mental illness and things like that, but those are, the, uh, those are not the disciplinary actions that we're talking about. Disbarred attorneys and resigned attorneys and attorneys seeking relief from actual suspension, on the other hand, do file petitions. It is reasonable to believe that the vast majority of these dismissed or denied petitions are actually not failed prosecutions, but in fact, petitions submitted by respondents that are subsequently denied. Of course, none of this means that there is not a valid concern about the impact on exonerated attorneys. That is a, a significant concern. So we took a look at the number of exonerated attorneys. And to understand the impact of posting a consumer alert at the time a notice of disciplinary charges uh, is filed, it's important to understand that this policy would only implicate 
four types of cases that OCTC handles. Uh, and that's because OCTC files notices of disciplinary charges in only four types of cases. The first is a, what's known colloquially as a J case, which is a reciprocal discipline case from another jurisdiction where an attorney has received discipline in another jurisdiction and we are now seeking to, to uh, impose reciprocal discipline. Another is O cases or original matters, H cases, which are matters involving a violation of previously imposed terms of discipline, and N matters, which is Rule 9.20 violations which also arise from a failure to comply with the terms of prior discipline. According to the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability, in 2017, there were only 17 cases dismissed after an NDC was, was filed in State Bar Court. 16 of those cases were original matters, and one involved a violation of previously imposed discipline in each case. In one of those O cases, it was in fact dismissed uh, by the hearing department. However, the review department dismissed, uh, or excuse me, reversed the decision and recommended the, that the attorney be disbarred. The Supreme Court later followed that recommendation and actually disbarred that attorney. So when we remove that uh, attorney, uh, we are uh, we are de then down to uh, the to the sixteen. Excuse me. Uh, to gauge the number of attorneys who then may be prejudiced by uh, having this consumer alert being put up on their profile, we then looked at the number of unique attorneys that are part of this group, and that brought us down to 13 individual attorneys making up those 16 cases. Of those remaining 13 respondents, four respondents, uh, excuse me, five respondents had their uh, cases dismissed for non-disciplinary reasons. For example, four of those five were dismissed because the respondents had physical or mental health issues to such an extent that they could not be prosecuted. So we eliminated those respondents from the uh, exoneration type dismissal list. Of the remaining respondents, four had their cases dismissed on OCTC's motion after we discovered post-filing additional information that led us to believe that a dismissal was warranted. These I would count as exoneration type dismissals, at least for the purposes of this analysis, where we're looking at somebody who may have been harmed by the posting of this consumer alert and subsequently has their case dismissed. There were also four additional cases that were just found not culpable, uh, four additional respondents who were found not culpable after a trial in state bar court. That means that there were eight respondents who received exoneration type dismissals in 2017. In 2017, we filed 256 unique against, we filed NDCs against 256 unique respondents that were closed by State Bar Court. This means that the charges were admitted or proven true against slightly less than 97% of the attorneys against whom we filed notice of disciplinary charges in 2017. Again, that doesn't account for everything, though. We also have to consider other attorneys who are partially exonerated or who may have, uh, we may have filed more serious charges, but we only get lesser uh, uh, findings against. And so we went through to try and look at that issue as well. Part of the issue there, or part of the problem is that when we looked to determine whether we could find the number of attorneys who were charged with, for example, moral turpitude allegations that were not subsequently sustained uh, or, or proven, uh, or charged with serious offenses but only disciplined for less serious offenses, that were somewhat limited by the data available, and unfortunately the AS400 mainframe computer with which we currently deal does not track the disposition of charges at an allegation level. It looks at it more on a holistic case level. So all we know is that this attorney was subsequently disciplined and uh, etc. rather than knowing that they had count one was dismissed and count two was found true. The other issue with that is that because 
uh, charges are not necessarily filed in order of severity, we can't just look at, even if we could track by allegation, this individual had uh, count one dismissed but was found culpable of count two, that wouldn't necessarily get us where we need to go. Need to go. So we would have to develop a somewhat detailed ranking of the significance or seriousness of charges. Uh, and so we were not capable of doing that for this purpose. So we looked at an alternate method, and it's not perfect, but we tried to find some other way of approaching this, this problem. And we looked at the outcomes of unique attorneys following the filing of an NDC in the State Bar Court. Of the 256 unique attorneys against whom OCTC filed an NDC, 213 of them were either disbarred or received an actual or stayed suspension. Now, what does this show and what does this not show? It does not show that these attorneys were found culpable of moral turpitude offenses, or at least all of them. It does not show that these attorneys were found culpable of all or even the most serious charges against them. I acknowledge that. What does it show? It does presumably show the fact that 83% of these attorneys, of these 256 attorneys charged by NDC were either disbarred or received an actual or stayed suspension, does tend to show that these are not de minimis or minimal violations. I would point out that less than 20 attorneys against whom OCTC filed an NDC received a public or private approval. I again want to voice genuine appreciation for the public comments received, not only uh, in writing, but received today uh, orally by Mr. Carr. Uh, they have prompted significant internal examination, not only of our proposal, uh, but of discipline system outcomes, and of our record keeping, and, and our ability to gather data. And as a result, we have uh, proposed to the board that the board adopt the agenda item as posted for public comment, but acknowledge that there is some room uh, for alternatives, and that the, this board may choose, as a result of the public comment and, and frankly my comments here today, to defer action on the first poor piece of that proposal, the NDC portion of that, uh, and instead direct OCTC to come back to you at a future date with a proposal that would attempt to address some of these concerns. And with that, I'll, I'm happy to take whatever questions we have. Uh, why don't we proceed this way? Let's, let's take care of, I think, what would be the straightforward uh, proposal here and then turn to the questions related to the consumer rights. This, this, this is related to the timing of items two, two, four. Would it be helpful to move items two, three, and four with that change and reserve item one for the session? Correct. I'll make that motion. This is actually what's what's on the up here is actually two a one, and it is the consumer notices piece. I just went ahead and modified the language there, so. Oh, I, can, uh, I think this effective date applies to all four elements of two a. Is that right? The first paragraph only applies to consumer notices. Good. The proposed change, or at least the motion that I made, of course the board can make any changes it wishes, but the the proposed change that I made was only applied, as for the date, only applied to items two through four. And what we've got here is four kinds of consumer alerts. Alerting consumers on people's websites as to various no. kinds of, of circumstances, one of which is more comfortable than another, is that right? Did I get that wrong? There are several types of alerts. I, I don't know if it's four or five, uh, or six if you break out the substantial threat of harm. Uh, but those are all covered under the same agenda item. In any event, I'll move item 2A, 2, 3, and 4, reserving item 1 for discussion. Second. 2A, 2, 3, and 4 with a modified implementation date Eight. of January 1, 2018. Correct. Got it. Yeah. And this is just to send it out to public comments. No, no, we're no, 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 no. These are drawn no comments, even from the village and Mr. Park. So everything except what's up yes. is being moved with the modified implementation of January 1, 2019. Right. And Mike, what you, you moved in the second was from? Uh, Mark, I believe. If I, 
if I may, just for you know, some candor, uh, there were public comments received to the other items, one of which was submitted by the Association of Discipline Defense Council for the, the reinstatement item, I want to say it's item 3, 2A3. Uh, there was another public comment uh, received for the judicial notice, but that was in support of that item. Motion. We have a second. Can I substitute a roll call? No. Uh, you no. I, I don't know. I, I, I have brought the second. The, the point the procedure. Mr. Brock to discuss. The problem I have is with the felony uh, filings, and I think that's what you were addressing earlier. That there was some other public comment that was dealt with that. This, this motion is not. It does not address that particular proposal. But this that's is with why respect I was to two pieces. So we're voting on not on A1, okay. just two. So this is about the very six. Oh, that's in A. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then uh, you'll have a question. I understand it. Okay. That's, that's right. why I was asking questions about what the. So you're content to substitute the roll call? Can I yes. substitute the roll call? All right. Actually, thank you. Yes. Uh, Dylan. Absolutely. Was Ron? Yes. Mendoza. Yes. Tula. Yes. Soleil. Yes. Stallings. Yes. Steinbrecher. Yes. Stevens. Yes. And you just count me as a yes. I I never got a second on this. It was a mistake. Here's Ron. Here's Sean. Sorry, Sean. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. So now let's turn to. Uh, any questions on item 2A1, which is the consumer notice of the envelopes? It sounds like Mark will have one. So what we want to do with 2A is to send it back to staff to work it up further and bring it back to us. Is that what you're proposing? I'm proposing that if the board chooses to defer action on the notice of disciplinary charges portion of it, uh, that, that, that yes, the board could certainly send it back to us for additional uh, study of that portion, and we would uh, be directed to bring it back to you at some future date with it, with uh, either additional data to support it uh, or uh, a modified proposal. Okay. Thank you. 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 The charging document that is filed to charge the attorney with a disciplinary action. Is that right? In, yes, in specified cases, in, in J, O, H, and N, the, the jurisdictional, uh, other jurisdiction charges, original matters, which are probably the, the, the main one that, that you're thinking of, uh, and then violation of probation and Rule 9.20 matters, yes, sir. So they're just allegations at that point, correct? Yes. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I read the statutes regarding the reporting duties on the felonies, which is separate. I don't know that I, that I agree with what I understood your position, I mean, I personally, but the, the item to say that you had an obligation to report once those were received by you from the prosecuting agencies. That's not how I read that statute. That statute says that if there's an inquiry made, then you would you would give that out. And your presumption is that if somebody was looking at an attorney's uh, page there on, on the state bar, that that is an inquiry. I'm not so sure that I agree with that justification. The other thing that I have a real problem with these these allegations is that there is a presumption of innocence. And of course, you people know where I come from. Once you post that, the damage to the attorney is done. And if you were one of those 17 people who was, the case was later dismissed, and with a, and I hate to bring this term in, but you have a backlog that can be a very long period of time where this person has this red flag on their profile, the damage can be substantial to that attorney. And I do look back at, I, I do think, you know, hardly and what Michael said earlier is that you always have the balance between protecting the public 
and we're ready to do a turning. And on this one, though, I tend to fall on the damage that can be done to the attorney a little bit more than I do on the protection of the pub because these are only allegations against an attorney. So those are my thoughts. And if you're going to study this, I'd like a little bit more study on those issues. So on the inquiry, if my comments during previous meetings were interpreted to, to say that I, that I was saying the statute required us to publish it on the website for that in response to an inquiry, I want to be clear that, that I was making the, as you pointed out, I was make, drawing the analogy between uh, the creation of what I previously referred to as this attractive nuisance of the website. I think it's a great way to distribute information. But I do think that people who go there to check on the status of an attorney will be dissuaded from picking up the phone and calling us, at which point we would then be obligated to make that disclosure. And so, yes, and I would point out that the disclosure is not made at the time, according to the statute, even if it were an inquiry, is not made at the time of conviction. It's made at the time that we find out that they've been charged. When we have the information pursuant to the other sections, we are obligated to convey that information in response to that inquiry. But I do agree that that you know going to the website may or may not be defined as an inquiry. It seems to be the rationale, at least in part, on which you're basing um, the recommendation that just the allegation should be posted on the attorney's profile page. And, and let me explain. You know, I'm not a member of the public. But let's say I wanted to go to Sacramento and find an attorney in Sacramento who dealt with a particular issue. And I received this attorney's name. And I went on to the attorney's profile page, which I'll do frequently. If I saw the red thing there, I would not be calling that attorney or be referring them a case or anything else because of the red flag. That, that's my problem. That attorney may actually have not done anything wrong or ultimately, you know, that case will be dismissed against the attorney. So, you know, there, to me, there's real damage that can be done by posting this to the attorney where there may not be an interest in the public that's greater than that attorney's interest in their license. I think it's important to be clear the distinction between the, the felony, being charged with a felony in Superior Court versus the NDC item that we're, that, and I want to make sure we don't conflate the two. Um, the first is that we really have the statutory obligation to turn that information over. And again, it depends on whether you define that as an inquiry or not. Uh, if we are discouraging people from making the inquiry because we appear to be giving them a clean bill of health on the website, uh, then I, I think that's another another issue. Uh, as for the the issue of the NDC and that those are merely allegations, I, I think that that is potentially an issue and that's why we've attempted to demonstrate that uh, that the number of attorneys is not as great as the perception. That's not to say that there isn't the potential for harm to those individual attorneys who, who may be affected. I agree. Any other questions? Right. Are the notices of discipline already posted? So this just adds, well, to make, bring it to people's attention, but it's already on the profile page. It does, and the consumer alert would merely say, you know, click here to read it, which would take them down here where it is, and it would also say click here to read the reply, if any. And you can go there and read the reply as well. John? Um, I'll have some comments on that NBC <clears throat> proposal in a second, but let me stick with what I think mean, Mark was focusing on felony. Well, a little of both, but we didn't get to the film. I mean, you, you know, I'm sure you do, that you know, the person is presumed innocent, even though the charge is filed in a felony case. Um, the vast majority of those cases, as you know, are going to settle, and many of them will settle for misdemeanors or be dismissed or something else. Again, it's the same to me sort of damage that can be done simply by posting that information when the person may not have done anything wrong at all. Let me just ask, so to stick on the felony point for a second, just to ask you a question. So uh, when I started practice, we actually had this thing called the telephone that was plugged into the wall. And so <laughs> if we wanted to find out if uh, a lawyer had a disciplinary record, I vaguely recall doing this, actually picking up the phone and calling the bar. <clears throat> the receptionist would put you through some department that was in charge of that. So and you're saying that as you interpret the statute, 
if someone made that inquiry by phone, they would get information about felony charges against an attorney if the bar knew of them. <clears throat> is that system actually operational? In other words, if someone, I presume people can still call, and there's someone who takes these kinds of calls, and is there a mechanism where the person who's answering those inquiries on the telephone would know about these felony charges that are supposed to be posted on the internet? Well, I, I think that that raises a number of issues, not the least of which is that there are gaps in our reporting system in the sense of that, it, that we get information. There are a number of places where we are supposed to get the information about somebody being charged, for example. Um, the first is that, that district attorney's offices are supposed to notify the state bar by statute when an attorney is charged with a crime. And courts are supposed to notify uh, the state bar by statute when, it, when an attorney is charged with a crime. Uh, and the problem is that the, we're only sh as strong as the weakest link there. And generally, having been a, a prosecuting attorney for 20 years, it's reasonably rare that we know the, the employment of the individual. Uh, we, you know, or at least that we connect the dots that we then have to, to supply that information. Unless it's a, an attorney that we've dealt with in court or that we know from the community or something like that, or they, on a DUI, stumble out of the car and say, you can't do anything to me, I'm an attorney, or something along those lines. We don't necessarily have that information. We certainly didn't look everybody up on the State Bar website to see whether they were an attorney. Uh, we will be moving rapidly into the uh, uh, fingerprinting, and we will get information. OCTC will get information about when an, an attorney is charged, and so, the answer I hope to your question is yes, we will have that information and we will be obligated by statute to turn that information over. And arguably, I believe that we are obligated by statute to turn over not just felony charges, but the, I believe the statute says misdemeanor. And again, here we have uh, tried to be uh, mindful of the potential impact and, and, and be circumspect. And I don't see my closure. I realize I may have asked a question about the department that's not in your office, which is, might be more ideas for you. But I'm not sure anyone would know the answer that I'll cut right now. The end of no, I think the, the issue is where OCTC knows about it. Then if somebody called up, they would be given my information. And as Steve points out, um, it's very uneven now because the whole system relies on reporting. We will be talking about the data that we're going to start receiving from the DOJ, or we have begun receiving more comprehensively, that would allow us, uh, presumably, to determine when any attorney had charges filed against them. Right now, that's not the case. We have very uneven information, which in my view is another reason, perhaps, to be concerned about doing the posting right now, because there is disparate impact. It's simply based on whether or not we have the information. It's not based on whether or not this attorney has had felony charges filed against them. Because today, we don't have that information for all licensees. Yeah, understood. And but if we know about it, then people who call on the telephone get that information. That's what's supposed to happen. Okay. So, um, all right, so let me move from the felony proposal, just for clarity, to the aspect of this item that proposes a consumer alert for all NDCs. And um, that's the item that I think is one of the most public comment most concern, and um, I'm inclined to th think we shouldn't adopt it today. Um, I think philosophically, I think it's overbroad in general. Uh, the NDC itself is posted, so the information is available to the public, and if it's not sufficiently <clears throat> prominent, because I think the point has been well made that if you look at the way the bar's website is currently structured, the place where the discipline record shows up is down at the bottom, but that could be corrected readily without the consumer alert. The consumer alert is sort of a big, you know, a scary sort of sounding warning, which to me is a little too much for mere allegations in state bar court. I do want to say I really appreciate the detailed work to look at the statistical um, information, and I think the information you gathered is very helpful. Um, I think it's identifying some places where the way the, the annual discipline report 
report statistics could be clarified. We talked about that on our calls. Um, and I think also the work you did uh, in, you know, you pointed out that the computer system is not currently capable of tracking individual charges within a case, and that the analysis you did of the results as to respondents in the last year was helpful. So I think it's at least a partial response to the public concern, the public comment concern about overcharging and whether, you know, possible overcharging by the office means that there could be the risk for more harm in posting each and every NDC if the most serious charges are not necessarily uh, uh, found to be valid by the state or court. So, but with that said, I think there's more to do on that point, and I think you're my view, I would not be in favor of adopting that today. I know from talking to Leah, and she might say that, that she is anticipating a case file review that will be able to give us more information about the particulars of charges that have been filed and the outcome. And so one of the things that can be incorporated into that effort um, is this particular issue of moral turpitude charges and the outcome. Recognizing that, you know, the concerns that are raised I think by the defense bar and by the bar associations, and they may have a very different perspective from your office. And so that's why it'd be helpful to get the data so we can we can look at it. I think what you provided is somewhat reassuring to be candid. But I think given the possible repercussions on attorneys who may found be, be found not to be culpable of the most serious charges included in the NDC, it's posting the NDC itself is is quite fulsome notice to the public. We don't need to take the extra step at this time of the consumer, consumer the alert. So, uh, yeah, I think I both you and and you have um, touched on what I was going to ask: you know, how is this consistently applied, and how if, if there are the disclaimers in the once you put it in there, it is in an internet with the social media, you can really get the information immediately. And how, if you have the full disclaimer, of course everyone knows that, you know, proven until, you know, guilty until proven. And so, um, um, <laughs> innocent until, uh, until proven. So then, um, all this, all this, and so, uh, <laughs> that's what I mean. So, but, but that is the most important thing is the disclaimer and what it is and, and uh, at the end of that that there is uh, not just taking out that uh, information but explaining that it isn't enough that there is that it is not like it has been dismissed or anything like that I just want to make sure that as a public person I also would like the full disclosure I have the ability to get that but at the same time I do not want to you know be, be able to tarnish a person's um, uh, reputation and his and service and business person. So for me, it's really, oh, you know, how do you get this data? It's going to be out there. Once it's in one internet site, it will be on the other internet site, and then and, and people can uh, get that information. But at the same time, to be really um, be consistent and at the same time be able to disclose that the, 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 those have been dismissed, not just taking away. Um, the, the uh, allegations or anything like that. For me, it's a protection also of both uh, as a consumer, I'd like to know, but at the same time, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, punish the person too if the person is really not guilty. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, some of this has been covered by, I had a few other just clarification. So um, I guess to say I'm, I'm also concerned about the adverse impact, even if it's not a very small number, it's still not fair to those people. The, I think it was 8 out of 256 ended up being cleared. Is that, did I get the numbers right? Yes, either dismissed by OCTC or found or not called. And were those, um, I know past doesn't predict the future, but were, were they all any particular kind of case? Like were they, um, uh, the, the eight were dismissed as a put like felonies versus you know, smaller charges? Uh, I don't know that we looked at them for that purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know, just because I recall one off the top of my head, was a prosecutorial misconduct case, um, uh, but I don't recall 
the others. And I don't know if that would change my mind since it could just be the luck of the draw, right? But um, my other question, are the, um, is it one alert? Like is it the same regardless of what the status or the charges? That was, that was the proposal. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we could look at is uh, modulating the nature of the NDC proposal based on the charges um, or applying it to only certain things that may, you know, to, and I'm spitballing here almost literally, um, depending on what the standards call for as far as the potential punishment for those charges. And Again, just to make sure I understand, does the alert um, change to something else once the like the charges are proven? Then it it's then it's just a stamp like this person has this bad mark, right? If they are placed on on probation, then it will say that they're on probation until the, uh, for example, conditions are are uh, completed, so on and so forth. Yeah. I, again, I don't know if those things would change my mind. I think I'd still be concerned about the the innocent person being, you know, unfairly tagged and harming their livelihood. And I don't know what the liability on our side is for that either, but um, it's just at least something to look at what the difference in results has been and maybe there's a way to, you know, split it. Because I also don't want it, someone who's done something really heinous to continue to get clients. So I don't know how to handle that, but just something to think about. Um, so, I understand the uh, important conflicting interests. Um, I, I do think that we probably need to put a little more thought into it. I know a lot has been put into it. Um, talked about it a couple of meetings before now, but I do think a few things were um, raised today that uh, may make people look at it a little differently. Um, number one, I, I, I think you made a compelling argument around the felonies. If we have a duty. Um, if someone were to pick up the phone and call us, I think that there is an understanding with consumers today that if you're going to put the information on the internet, that it's a full amount of information on that page. Um, and so the idea that there would be some information, but yet we also had an expectation that we're going to pick up the phone and call us for additional information, I think is an unfair expectation. Um, as far as the uh, OCTC charge uh, and, and what, we, um, what we would actually put on there, I find the debate um, a little funny uh, on where <coughs> the actual information should be, whether it should be in an alert, uh, what color the alert is, what font it is, it's down below, should we make it six point? Uh, I mean, at some point, um, I think <clears throat> the question for us is what is our mission? Um, is it to ensure that consumers know, uh, or is it a perceived duty to report? I think we just need to figure that out to understand what that uh, is going to look like. Have we looked at what other um, administrative bodies have done, such as like medical board or uh, nursing boards? Like, how do they report their filing of these administrative actions? I, I don't have that information. I recall during this process looking at the medical board, for example, but I, I don't recall exactly what I found there. And then on the NDC, excuse me, NDC's charging document, is that signed to under? Or is that just allegations? No, it's not. Okay. So it would be similar to, let's say, like a civil action where you have um, one assigned to verify a complaint and an unverified complaint. Um, so it would be more along the lines of an unverified civil complaint. That's right. It's simply signed by the documents. Okay. Uh, then regarding the ethical standards uh, that our prosecutors are under to file a case, what what is There has to be probable cause. We have to believe there's probable cause to actually file the charges. And then, and then we have to show them by clear and convincing evidence. It's funny because Mark and I were on opposite sides of the aisle. On. Well, we were smiling together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, just I, I think, you know, from a prosecutor's standpoint, you know, the prosecution definitely has an interest in, in having a fair trial and having, um, you know, making sure that someone's right. Unless they're perhaps to support it. Um, I did find compelling um, a comment about, um, I guess, this sort of consumer alert being used in a tactical way by, by opposing counsel. Really, if you can't win on the action, you go after it. So I think this is a very, uh, 
this does have the Individuals who are entitled to that uh, presumption of innocence. So uh, I want to give you just this, uh, this question. Well, I hope everyone recognized that that was a prosecutor that just said that. Um, I think that uh, a lot of good discussion, and I think we can leave it with Michael, and then we can entertain some motions. I just have one other question. Yeah, I was just going to move that we table this item. Um, we can either table it till October, or we can table it indefinitely and have staff bring it back when they're ready to bring it back. But I have not heard a consensus to adopt this item today, and it's now 2.10, and we're still on the first item on our agenda for a meeting at the end of 2.30. Yeah, very quickly, you know, it might make a difference, um, or I doubt it in my opinion, as you know, on these felony charges or whatever, you know, you can see um, the charges as to what they were. In other words, if the guy was charged with felony vandalism, that's one thing, but if he's charged with whole number of thefts, it would be another type of thing. It's an alternative thing. So it, if you limited it somehow, it might help a little bit. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and I guess, uh, obviously, the board can do uh, the board wishes. Now, as is, as now is the time for a motion. Do you have references to whether it's October or indefinitely? Uh, I think that if, the, if, that if this board is looking for additional data other than potentially the case review, uh, as far as the moral turpitude issue, that uh, it may take more than October in order for us to get the new case management system up and get additional data out of it that would support uh, the NDC portion of the proposal. However, I would point out again that that portion of it is severable from the other items. And I would encourage the board to act on those other items that, that don't have quite the other uh, the attention that the NDC item does. Um, we adopted items two, three, and four. We're only debating item one. Are you asking that we further parse item one? Yes, there are a number of consumer alerts within item one. I'm still inclined to take this um, and let staff decide when to bring all or part of it back. Just in the end, just making sure that we do it thoughtfully and wrap this meeting was not being pulled, the integration. It was only B2, to, and we just wanted to talk about it to make sure that the, the committee was clear. Uh, oh, can you show on your mic? Oh, sorry, Tony and Darling, Chief Reports. Um, B1 was not being pulled off consent. There was no objection to it from the public comment. It was only B2 where we did get some public comment, and I wanted to make sure that the committee was clear what those comments were and why we still recommend it going forward. Uh, B2 had to do with an amendment to um, Rule 5.30, Rule of Procedure 5.30, that controls early neutral evaluation conferences. This is a procedure unique to the state bar, where OCTC is required to send a notice to every respondent prior to bringing charges 
um, seeing that they're going to bring charges and offering them an opportunity to have a conference with the state bar court judge to have an early neutral evaluation of the merits of the case. Um, the procedure is, has been around for a while. It, as I said, it was unique to the state bar. I think Justice Judge Louie came up with it a number of years ago. It does require that um, OCPC prepare a statement of what the case is about for the judge. It does not require when that has to be provided to the judge other than before the meeting. So one of the proposals is that they have to give it to the judge three days before the meeting so the judge actually has time to read it. The other proposal is to change the rule to require that a request for an early neutral conference be on a particular form so that we get all the information we need and that the party consult with the other side and come up with some tentative dates so we don't spend a lot of time going back and forth. It's a very short window. You have 10 days to request, make the request and then the meeting has to be held within 15 days and we can burn a lot of days going back and forth. Those are the only two proposals that we were changing. We got comments, again, from the um, Association of Disciplinary Defense Council and from Alan Pansky. None of the comments, however, actually objected to our proposed changes. The comments had, um, they had issues with the process, the timing of it. Um, they had made proposals interesting proposals that there be a sort of an overlapping exchange of the statements that OCTC has to do theirs five days before and then the respondent has three days so they can respond to it. Um, there were some questions about whether it's too short a time frame. But again, none of them actually addressed our proposals. In talking with OCTC, I realized that they have some concerns about the process. And so we started to do some statistical analysis on is this really a very effective use of everybody's time? And again, some deficiencies in, in the data that we do keep. We have no idea how many ENEC letters get sent out by OCTC. They have no idea how many get sent out. We only know how many people request a, hearing, a, a meeting. Of the people who request them, 19% end up settling the cases. Now that's 19% of the people who ask for it. So we're kind of looking at, we need to examine the entire process. Is it really the best use of everyone's time? Is it valuable? Does it just create delays? So our proposal is adopt the rules of the change and recommit to doing an in-depth study of the entire ENEC process, top to bottom with all the stakeholders, and see is it worth pursuing? If it is, how can we make it more effective and to where people really feel like they get some meaningful use out of it and, and find out. I mean, it may turn out that 19% is 19% of everybody, or it could be 19% of 10% of the ENEC. So we, again, we have to do some more statistical analysis to figure out the value. So that is why we're saying, despite the fact that there are many comments about this rule change, none of them are negative as to what we specifically asked for. So we are asking that you recommend to the board as a whole that they leave it on consent and approve our proposed changes to 5.30. Good work. Any questions? Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a motion to pull this off. So moved, thanks for the fun. Thank you so much. I'll second that, although, uh, Sean, I'd like to include in the motion that we direct staff to go ahead and look at and evaluate this, this rule to determine whether or not it's really going forward. Come back to the board. An examination of mm -hmm. the early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Friendly amendment? Yes, exactly. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a paperwork I'll be friend on that, so. Rod? Yes. Palatuna? Yes. Dylan? Yes. LeBron? Yes. Jula? Yes. Stallings? Yes. Steinbrecher? Yes. Okay, <coughs> passes, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good work. Um, any other requests to pull any item on the consent agenda? And we'll move on to our regular agenda. All right. We've got 10 minutes. <laughs> 11 minutes. 11 minutes. Items 3A uh, request to send for public comments, revisions of OCTC discipline standards for attorney sanctions for professional misconduct. Again? So can I make a procedural request? Sure. So uh, I met with LNC earlier and made some modifications to this proposal. And I'm just reviewing that. So if you could move this to the end of the agenda. 
discretion to disclose confidential information while otherwise preserving the confidentiality uh, to two new categories of people entities. First, uh, it would grant uh, ex express uh, authority to uh, the Chief Trial Counsel to disclose information to any State Bar employee or Special Deputy Trial Counsel. This is a change from the current rule which expressly allows disclosure only to OCTC staff, OGC staff, and Special Deputy Trial Counsels. And this uh, change would reflect the reality that other state bar employees, uh, such as IT employees or riot analysts, sometimes need access to confidential information. Uh, the second category of expansion would uh, grant the Chief Child Counsel or her designee uh, authority, express authority to share confidential information with any state bar vendor that enters into a confidentiality agreement with the state bar. This expands on the current rule, which expressly allows translators and interpreters uh, such access. And this change recognizes the reality that sometimes other vendors, uh, for instance, the CMS contractors who will be digitizing OCPC files, uh, sometimes need such access from their work in the state bar. The proposal also makes a few small non-substantive changes uh, to clarify the rule and spells out the factors that the Chief Child Counsel should consider in exercising their discretion to disclose or not to disclose uh, pursuant to the rule, including um, the purposes for the disclosure, the State Bar's policy of promoting internal information sharing where it's necessary to advance our goals and objectives, and any concerns regarding maintaining confidentiality and minimizing the risks of a, a broader disclosure when necessary. Uh, Finally, the proposed revised rule expressly authorizes the Chief Trial Counsel to impose any limitations or conditions on the disclosure, uh, such as anonymization of data, redaction, or limits on use. Um, before I conclude, I'd just like to note that the copy of the proposed revision that was posted uh, contains the phrase, quote, limits on the use of disclosed documents or information twice in paragraph F. This was a clerical error. So I would request that the committee approve circulating the proposed revision for public comment with the first use of that phrase in paragraph F stricken. And we will, of course, take care of that. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Is there some reason we're sending this out only for 30 days instead of 45? Uh, yes, and that is because uh, of the necessity to get the rule in place um, uh, for the uh, ongoing CMS project. And we wanted to have sufficient time to uh, get any public comment back before the November meeting. Okay. And 45 days would be? For, uh, 45 days would really be pushing it. Well, then I, will, I will move and adopt the change that we've got a second? Second. That's not a question. Oh. So other than implementation of new CMS, systems, what are some other common ways that this information would need to be disclosed on this um, <coughs> That might be a question for Melanie. So as far as vendors, I, I uh, hadn't thought of any besides obviously the translators that we currently use. I could, I could think of if there was some big project we needed to use a copy service. Um, uh, you know, those, those are the kinds of things that come up in the law firm world quite a bit. But, but the way that we made these changes was to give the flexibility um, so that we don't need to come back if there's some unforeseen, um, unforeseen change. I think I saw a second. So 
customer over here on the left side. That's Alan with the second. Any further discussion? Now the name's gone. Okay. Sounds <laughs> like a roll call. Right. So Mendoza moved and Steinberg seconded. Yes. Broughton. Yes. Palatina. Yes. Dolan. Yes. Tron. Moved. Uh, Tula. Yes. Soleil. Yes. Stallings. Yes. And. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to item 3C, uh, which is a fingerprinting update. That's uh, Suzanne.
they will be um, referred to OCTC as, as we discussed, charges are reportable actions and uh, failure to report them uh, is also itself a disciplinable um, offense. Um, well, might be, I should say, it's uh, required under the statute. So we were very uh, concerned, you know, we want to make sure people are adequately reporting. So that's essentially what we recommend. Um, we recommend to you both um, that uh, for prior information, um, OCTC will only get convictions, and for going forward, um, OCTC will get notification of charges. Thank you. Any questions? Michael? I'm happy to move the recommended item with sort of one comment. Um, I certainly agree with the rest of the report that we should not be sort of handling all of this information off indiscriminately to the prosecutor, partly for social justice reasons and partly because we want to use the resources of the prosecutor's office efficiently. The second point I would make is that um, OCTC is a particular management challenge because of the decision to place this leadership in the hands of the Senate, unratified chief prosecutor, and to have that chief prosecutor report to this committee in his or her prosecutorial role and not to Leah's office. Um, and there's important policy reasons for that, but it also makes making the train run on time challenging. Um, and uh, keeping this work outside of OCTC, because it's going to be clerical and analytical in, the, in, in its basis, and it's not going to involve the exercise of prosecutorial discretion. I don't think the complications of putting it in the prosecutorial unit are, are warranted. And so for that reason, I support the staff recommendation. Remove it. Thank you. Thank you. Who's that? Moved. Yeah. Seconded. Rotten. Yes. Uh, Delent. LeBron. Mm -hmm. Tertulla. Yes. Seleg. Yes. Stalin. Yes. Steinbrecher. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to item three. Which is the CMS updates? Okay. Afternoon. Um, Welcome. I am Satin Makhelic. I'm the director of the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability. Um, I did prepare slides, but I'm going to race through them, uh, highlighting the the key uh, message that I wanted to. Uh, to share today. Um, you, many of you, I mean, know that we've been uh, with working on the CMS implementation for quite some time. Um, I'm very pleased to announce that on the 15th of October, we're going to go live uh, with a soft go live to a selected group of users from every department that's involved, OCTC, State Park Court, and probation. Um, within that period of time, we are going to have both systems up and running at the same time where we have dual entry, but the system of record remains the S400 until the end of the year, um, which will help us uh, kind of flush out any uh, remaining issues that we have not <coughs> covered today. Um, in addition, also, I'd like to um, share that in the, on the Monday the 15th as well, we're going to roll out a new functionality that wasn't in the scope of our uh, CMS implementation, and that's the online complaint submittal. Um, what that's going to allow the public to do is submit all their complaints online through our website uh, starting on Monday. Um, and I'm going to spend maybe a couple minutes just showing you um, how that's going to uh, work. Um, so essentially what we have, um, this is um, our test website. From the main website of State Bar, the public will be able to submit regular complaints as well as uh, non-attorney complaints um, following a very, very simple process we put together. Um, initially, they'll put in their, their personal information, uh, submitting it, then they fill out the complaint information, um, you know, giving them some, um, we're trying to eliminate the uh, ambiguity in the messages, so where we could, we provided some kind of controls, yes, no, of some sort. Um, in addition, also, uh, when they fill out the the attorney that they're complaining about, the initial uh, functionality will allow them to search our database uh, of attorneys by last name and then their first name as well. Uh, in the next en enhancement, we're going to allow them to search by the member number that they have it. So that way, where when we receive the information, the work that the staff has to do internally is minimized in searching and validating because that data comes directly from the database. 
Um, then they have the ability to um, add any uh, outside court cases that they're aware of that they want to include in the complaint. Um, given the ability to attach documents as well, any supplemental uh, information that they would like to attach as part of their complaint. Um, any functionality, the other functionality would be if translation is needed. Uh, and we have a, uh, you know, just about 75 or a little bit more than that languages available in there. Um, and then at the end, they'll be able to review their complaint before submission. And once they sign it and consent to it, the staff and OCTC will receive the same exact complaint that the complaining witness prints out. Um, and they'll be able to process that internally. Uh, so this functionality is going to get rolled out on October 15th. Uh, we're currently working with OCTC uh, to test it and implement the process by which they're going to uh, accept and process these uh, complaints. Um, I, I do want to take a moment to just we spent so far over 19,500 hours on CMS from the beginning, and it's, uh, it's an effort from teams from State Bar Court, OCTC, probation, with obviously support from management and the board. So thank you for everyone who's involved. Any questions? I know we're racing through, but I do really want to recognize you have time that we wouldn't be where we are with CMS without you. Did incredible job managing this effort. So I want to recognize you in front of the committee. And I also want to say how excited I am about the online complaint form. This is a consistent theme. Uh, and you will notice I am pushing us to go paperless throughout this organization. And I appreciate that, although it was not in the original scope of the project, you have made it happen, you and IT. So I, I appreciate that as well. Yeah, I, I echo that, and if anyone has not had the pleasure of stopping by Hatem's office, there is a billboard size printout spreadsheet uh, that plans up every iteration of this rollout. So there's a tremendous amount of effort that goes into this. And, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Dag, you have five, two minutes uh, on the work plan. Everything is going smoothly. Everyone's working. <laughs> <the same direction. laughs> You're turning it over perfectly, a, right? A plus for all of the work yeah. that we've done. So I would only say that the um, the the review of work plans has been on the uh, agenda of all of the board committees today, um, and the reason for that is that this is a relatively new process. Uh, we got a coordinated system last year and so far as we coordinated with one another to ensure that each of the board committees developed a work plan and we ran through a process where the board executive committee in January adopted those or approved of those work plans that had been adopted by the board committees in the fall. Um, the process issue that, I, that Leah just alluded to that I wanted to emphasize is that we are seeking to align and the board executive committee just approved uh, the alignment of the timing of the adoption of these work plans with the strategic planning process so that in January when we conduct our strategic planning meeting we then follow that process with the finalization of the work plans so that we can align each of the board committee's work plans with the strategic planning process so that's one of the things that we're working to to do to tweak this process to make it a little bit better and the only thing that I would say in, ter in terms of the substance and not the process of this issue is that um, we've accomplished a great deal during this last year. I'd like to thank all of you. It's been a pleasure working with you on RAD, Jason in particular, our chair, and Sean, you are vice chair. It's been a, a real pleasure. Um, we have a lot more to do still. So that would be my comments. So any plans? I'll take it. Um, thank you, Jack. It's been a pleasure with you as well. Uh, let's move on to uh, item 3A. Ready now, Sean? Yep. All right, thank you. Sorry for the mix up. Hello. Um, so, first off, um, we're here about an item that we'd like to send out for public comment, and it relates to modifications <coughs> to the standards that govern uh, the discipline system. The item that was, um, the proposal that was actually distributed has since been modified. Um, and I'm going to hand out copies of those. 
um, after some further discussion um, and reflection, we've um, uh, more narrowly ta tailored the proposal um, for this purpose. So I'm going to go ahead and um, give you, it's a clean version and red line version. Should, should I eliminate the language that was on the projection file that was provided earlier? This comes from the uh, file that Steve provided me this morning. Yes. to put in uh, a 
violations of 9.2 of the rules of court, which is when an attorney is suspended for 90 days or more, that they have to advise clients and, and opposing counsels in the courts and then file a declaration. Um, the Supreme Court has said that the presumption of discipline is disbarment, but there was no standard that covered that, so they didn't put that in there. Um, again, the emphasis here is the attempt to place the new rules within the framework of the old standards. That's what we were attempting to do here. Um, and I can give you some examples. Like 2.2, which deals with uh, commingling, we added the language that addresses the duty to retain advanced fees in a trust account, um, and we placed it as a commingling violation. Uh, there could be an argument it's a misappropriation, but we took the more conservative approach and put it as commingling. Uh, we didn't think it belonged on the next paragraph of the 2.2b, which deals with other violations of trust account rules like accounting, failing to account. So we thought that this is where it belonged, and it's consistent with our understanding of the case law regarding the general duty to put funds in, that belong to the client in the trust account. Uh, similarly, 2.6. Uh, we have a lot of new rules on the misuse of confidential information. We place that with the traditional breach of the duty of confidentiality. Uh, and because we now have three new rules dealing with this misuse, 1.8.2, 1.9c, and 1.18. So again, we didn't change the discipline. We simply added language so that it would cover these new rules within that standard. Um, we did create a new Subparagraph of 4.4 to, uh, to, to deal with Rule 4.4, which is inadvertent receipt of confidential information. It seemed to belong to this standard, um, and we placed it there. We did our best to be conservative of what the level of discipline for that kind of violation should be. Um, similarly, 2.13, which is sex with the client. We kept the integrity and the approach of that standard. This one's probably in some ways the most confusing um, in terms of having to deal with it because while we have a new uh, rule which prohibits all consensual sex with the client except if you're married or have a pre-existing relationship, which is 1.8.10, the Business Professions Code section 6106.9 still exists and essentially still we kept the integrity which is that what you do with is either assaultive or overreaching sexual conduct, and that's one part of the, of the standard, it is in the current standard, and then what would be consensual sexual relations, which is a different standard. So it's the same levels of discipline for the same kind of conduct. Um, I right, can give other examples, frivolous litigation, we now have a 3.1 and a 3.2 to go with 6068C, and G of the BMP code, so we place that, again, keeping the same level of discipline. Um, conflicts uh, was not a difficult one, but we, it has always been done in terms of the conduct, not so much in terms of the rule, so what we did is we adapted it so it would apply to both the old and the new rule, because for a while we're gonna be dealing with both rules. Uh, again, using the language of the new and old rule, but not changing the level of discipline. Uh, I talked about 9.2, we placed that as a new subparagraph 2.14c. Um, and so those are the, our examples, of, and the new ones um, that we, we did are uh, 2.20, which deals with a criminal act with no criminal conviction. It's somewhat similar to 6068A, but we thought it have, should have its own standard because we wanted to give it uh, a separate, uh, some breathing room, but it has the same exact discipline uh, that you would get for violation of 6068A, which is a violation of law. Likewise, 2.21 deals with Rule 8.4D, conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. Other jurisdictions you have replaced their moral, character, moral turpitude, statute or rule or concept, and instead use this concept. So again, we paralleled it. It has the exact same discipline as moral turpitude, but we made it a separate standard so that 
we can take a look at it and examine it as it develops in, in, in the years to come. Great, thank you. The beauty of that for comment is you'll get, a, I think, a lot of eyes on this, but thank you very much for your work and investment in work. So, Sean was instrumental in that. Go ahead, Sean. Um, I just want to thank you for your work on this, Alan, and Alan and Steve as well, and everyone else who contributed to it. And uh, with that, I'll move adoption of the item. So, any further discussion? And I finally substitute the roll call. I think Renee rejoined. I don't think I had you in the last vote. Okay. All right. Ron. Yes. Yes. LeBron. Yes. Mendoza? <laughs> yes. Stallings? Yes. Senator Rector? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Let's take a brief uh, recess for then folks have been sitting for a while. We will start at three. I am planning to move the closed session to the end of the afternoon to accommodate the audience. I'm also planning to slip the order into the discussion items that I think is more interesting second than the first. So uh, see you back here at three o'clock sharp. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final uh, meeting of the Board of Trustees of the uh, 2017-2018 Year of Service. We have. Let me get my agenda in front of me. We have two items. Um, we only have one item on the closed session agenda. Um, and assuming as may be safe that it does not require any discussion, um, may I have, um, is there any objection to deeming the closed session consent calendar approved? There's two. There's minutes and a contract. Both of them look rather straightforward to my mind. If there's a need for discussion, we can move the closed session at the end of the day for that discussion, but if there isn't, I'd like to dispense with these items. Any concerns? No. They're both on consent, therefore silence is consent. These items are being approved. Okay, um, at this point, we will open uh, the microphone for public comment. If you are here to speak on a particular item that's on the agenda, particularly if you're here to speak on any of the appendix I sub entity reviews, I would ask that you not speak now. Uh, there is at least one member of the audience who needs to speak now because he's got another commitment and I would be happy to hear his remarks. But, we'll get there. Um, but I would, I think that the way I would like to handle the appendix I discussion, which is what I think most of you are here for, is that we've got a lengthy slideshow that covers all of the sub entities up for discussion today. I'm going to ask staff to present each entity and then stop. Receive any questions from the trustees then we will take public input on that sub-entity, then we will deliberate and act on that sub-entity, and then we will move to the next entity with the same structure. So each of you will be asked, will be given an opportunity to speak on an entity by entity basis. If you want to address more than one entity, you are free to do so. Um, if there are several of you of the same perspective, I would encourage you to uh, pick representatives so that we don't have to hear um, repetitive comment. And if you um, alert me that you've done that, I'll give that person a bit more time. Um, given the number of people who want to speak and the time that we have to accomplish our work, I'm going to ask you to try to limit their remarks to two minutes. Um, so with that, maybe call the roll. Broughton? Here. Chen? Here. Lee? Here. Manning? Here. Mendoza? Here. Petula? Here. Saleh? Here. Stallings? Steinbrecher? Here. Stevens? Here. And Stallings is now here. Here. Okay, is there anybody who has public comment that's not specific to an item on our agenda today or who needs to speak and cannot stay for when that item might arise? Yes, sir. Please go to the table, illuminate a microphone, and uh, let us know your thoughts. And if you can, give it the two minutes, please. I will. Is that all? Yeah, it is. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking me out of order, uh, and thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. My name is Stuart Shea, and I'm the present chair of the Lawyers Assistance Program Oversight Committee. I have a prior commitment, so I have to speak uh, now. Uh, I've spoken to most, if not all, of the members of the Oversight Committee and they've encouraged me to voice their opinion that they are in full support of Option 1. They support Option 1 because they feel they've been doing the work and they will continue to do the work. They feel that a bifurcated uh, program will be have an extremely negative effect upon the use of, uh, the, oversight of the LAP program. Public safety is best met with this option, and we're not adverse to change or reform. There is a willingness to work with the BOT, the Board of Trustees, and the administration at all times. Uh, the bar hired Patrick Krill to, as an expert, so I believe we spent tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for him to do, evaluate, review, and come up with some programming for us and uh, recommendations. And it's his recommendation to opt with uh, the uh, option number one. So I just want to make this brief. Our expert wants to go with option one. The oversight committee wants to go with option one. And they encourage you, the board of trustees, to go with option one. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your service to the commission. Is there anyone else who wants to be heard at this time? Okay, then we will dispense with general public comment. We have um, minutes 
on the open session agenda, or is there any desire to discuss those minutes? Seeing none, those minutes will be deemed approved. As you know, it has been my habit uh, for the last year to use my president's report to give you a, um, a lengthy list of things that are going on, um, mostly to keep you up to date on what's happening behind the scenes, um, to daylight to the public and the press, um, the work that this agency does so well, and to get you thinking about things that will be coming up. No longer my, my priorities. I handed off the, uh, the uh, responsibility for that kind of discussion to my successor. So instead, I want to use just a couple of minutes um, to reflect on our year of service together uh, and to say thank you and farewell. First, I want to congratulate Jason and Alan for the Supreme Court's expression of confidence in your leadership. Um, your peers share that confidence, and we look forward to uh, the benefit of your leadership in the coming year. I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to serve as the last president of the California State Bar. I want to thank the court for its confidence in giving me the role as the first chair of this board. I want to thank each of you on our management staff, on our line staff, and on this board for the hard work you've done over the past year to implement the unification bill the legislature has established as the policy of California. We've had a lot of um, challenging conversations. We have had respectful differences of perspective we have had to um, confront um, the need for change um, and how painful change can be. You have uh, performed admirably as a board. We have maintained harmonious and civil discussions throughout, and we have gotten a lot of good work done because of your diligence and creativity and energy, and I just wanted to acknowledge it and thank you for it. I want to thank um, Leah and the team that she has built. Uh, in leading the bar. There are so many action items that I see on agendas under her leadership that have been discussed for all of my six years and not acted on until now. We have seen really meaningful change. She has put together a management team that has great confidence in her and that <coughs> one of them said we would walk through fire for her. And I've heard that about other leaders in other places, but I have not heard that about other leaders here. And it is a, a breath of fresh air, and I want to acknowledge it and appreciate it, and encourage this board to continue to support Leah on her path of change. But Leah can't do what she is doing without the support of every employee in the bar, in this building and in the one in San Francisco. And those employees can't make the changes that this organization needs without training, investment, appreciation, communication, feedback, a respectful relationship with their union. And all of that takes time and energy and hard work too. And Leah and her managers have been doing it. I know this board supports that work. And it is my uh, profound hope that that will continue. Lastly, I would want to say farewell by encouraging you to stay on the path of reform. We are going to hear voices today, um, and we will hear voices other days that like certain aspects of the status quo and would, would like to resist change. That doesn't mean we should not hear them. We will hear them. And they may even be right. But the general thrust of the path towards change must be maintained. The court has demanded it of, uh, demanded it of us. The legislature has legislated it. We have to do it. We have to do it in a way that's sensible, a way that respects all the voices in the conversation, but we cannot go back to being a trade association. We cannot go back to being the voice of lawyers. We must continue to, to understand that we are a regulatory agency charged with public protection. So at the end of this little homily, um, let me tell you what my priorities for your board would be, if I may be so presumptuous. Um, you, um, you need, we need to establish um, a permanent chief trial counsel. That will be an important challenge. It needs to be somebody that can uh, have the confidence of our staff and, uh, and the Senate rules. And that will be the important work um, led in part by um, our co-chairs of RAD next year, Alan and Sean. We need um, a fee increase. I know this is so because the highest court in the land from which there is no appeal announced it earlier today. We need a fee increase. And it, without that, 
we cannot maintain the path of reform in this organization. Um, and the last thing that I would think needs to be an essential priority for this board is that we need to continue to improve our relationships with the legislature and the court. And we need to establish a relationship with those supervising entities that allows us to manage in a consistent, stable way and allows us to stick to our strategic plan and does not require us to constantly zigzag across the field of action in response to whatever's latest on the front page of the Daily Journal. I have great confidence in this organization. I have great affection and appreciation for the people who are willing to lead it. And this is just my opportunity to say thank you and Godspeed. Okay, that takes us to staff reports. Leo, we have your dashboards, we have your written reports. Did you need or wish to augment them? No, I wasn't going to say anything at all, but I do want to take this public opportunity uh, to thank you, Michael, and thank you for the excellent chair. Uh, and I think we have uh, developed a great partnership, and I will miss you. I think we've been quite effective together. So I just want to recognize you publicly and, and say that. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay, we have a consent calendar. Um, is there any item on, uh, and I will review them um, quickly because I know there's some changes that we've accomplished already. The 54-121 includes sub-item one, which, which is the consumer alerts item that we have tabled indefinitely, so that is deemed removed from this consent calendar. The 122, I think, came through entire. I see no other item on the consent calendar which requires a change at this time. Is there a desire to remove anything from the consent calendar for discussion? Seeing none, the consent calendar will be deemed approved. That takes us to item 701 and 702. We're gonna, as I said earlier, flip the order on these. We're gonna do 702. And as I said, um, we'll start with Richard's presentation. Richard will stop with each entity. Um, invite your questions, and then when your questions are satisfied, questions not um, debate, dialogue, just questions to clarify the staff report, and then we'll hear from the public. To my friends in the public, I have your sign-in sheet, and I intend to go through it entity by entity and call you by name, and then when I get to the end of the names that I've been able to discern, I'll ask if there's additional public comment on each um, entity, uh, and then we'll proceed. And again, as you're organizing your thoughts in the audience, if, uh, try to keep it to two minutes, and if you want to pick a representative of several of you and have that person speak for a bit longer, I'd be happy to accommodate you in that way. Richard. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Pleasure to be back with you. Um, the purpose of this is to present findings and staff recommendations for your consideration and adoption, revision, or rejection uh, on the various uh, sub-entities uh, included today. As we talked about before, the the purpose of this review has been to, in a sense, define, redefine, rediscover, and establish a mutual understanding of the way we do business here at the bar. Um, and as our chair alluded to earlier in the day, this has been as much about the Board of Trustees coming to terms with its role and its relationship to the sub-entities as about the sub-entities themselves. Governance is a two-way street. And uh, it requires, this, this appendix I review challenges that require change on both ends of that street uh, to meet in a new middle. Um, as the Chief Justice alluded to as well, um, this is a conversation that's hard for many different reasons. Uh, it requires a certain amount of frankness, disagreement, and hopefully civility in that process and mutual respect for uh, various opinions. Uh, there's some hard choices here. Uh, it's hard to ask human beings to change. It's even harder when they don't have a view of the big picture. And I think this is one of the things that does need to change overall in terms of the board's relationship is helping in, infuse that big picture and understanding into all of the volunteers. So with that, as we've discussed, the way we've operationalized the uh, questions posed in the appendix I review are in these key elements of successful governance, and we use these to look at each one of the sub-entities and ask, and, and ask questions about them. Um, some of these were issues in some places and not in others. 
For example, not all of them were unclear on what authority they had, but some were. Uh, some size, uh, the, the size factor is more significant for some of them than others, and so on. Um, but essentially, as a regulatory body, uh, for the board to exercise good governance, it needs to, and the sub-entities both need to understand what is the role definition of each sub-entity, what is, what is its, how does it report to the board in terms of its transparency, accountability, and how it measures its activities, uh, what is its authority, what has the board in fact delegated to it, what must it seek approval from the board uh, for, the decision-making uh, functions need to be impartial, fair, and consistent, which means they need documented rules, policies, guidelines, uh, precedents to ensure that over time. Engagement, uh, the public and the licensees of the bar need to have an understanding and a participation where appropriate either as consumers of or participants in the work of the sub-entities. And then finally, the factor of size. Um, we will talk more about with respect to some of these. Uh, the challenging thing there is uh, smaller groups, smaller decision-making groups are more effective, uh, larger ones are less. Uh, a CEO was quoted as saying the only thing 26 people ever decided was when to go to lunch. Uh, it's perhaps overly cynical. And, and larger policy bodies and boards of directors need more members to, because part of what they're doing is gathering perspectives. So the size is, is purpose. And again, just to refresh or rebend the and remind ourselves the scope of what State Bar uh, utilizes volunteers for. If you look down the left on all of these functions and you see all those X's for the bar, it's not that these other entities don't have responsibility for those functions, it's that they do not use the participation of those they are regulating in carrying them out. So it, it's clear at a glance that the bar has a history of using more. Some of that may be fully appropriate, some of that may be unexamined and in need of change, but it's worth, it's a reasonable question to ask, uh, is that the right thing to be doing in all of these areas? Okay, now. So now we have gone off the rail here. Um, and I'll say another a source of confusion, I think, has been that for the most part, with the exception of the Lawyer Assistance Program, what the bar has been mandated to do, either by its own board or by the legislature, is to manage and implement programs. That is not necessarily identical to having a sub-entity or having one of the type that exists currently. Um, there are many other ways that regulatory agencies take, take advantage of the skills, knowledge, and expertise of Practitioners and all good regulatory agencies do that, but they do it often in working groups, task forces, uh, shorter term uh, focused uh, engagement of the uh, subject matter experts and practitioners. Uh, a classic mistake uh, that also gets made in organizations is to set up a standing committee or sub entity for. Uh, to demonstrate commitment to an issue, whether that's gender equality or something, as of someone who's worked in the courts for uh, over two decades, uh, seen all these commissions get stood up, and then it's a kind of a big symbolic act, and they don't end up doing uh, very much. That's not the right way to demonstrate commitment uh, to a policy. Similarly, where there's a short-term leadership need, uh, that's not the time to set up a standing committee, that's the time to set up a working group or task force, convene it, have it do its work, and then thank the members and send them back to their workplaces and homes. And similarly, uh, standing committees, standing sub-entities should not be set up uh, to essentially duplicate the org chart of an organization. Uh, that's where the division of labor is important to what staff should be doing, and the policy and other work that's probably more appropriate for the subject matter experts. So here you can see that the bar at the bottom, I know this is a little hard to read, but essentially uh, has around 307 volunteers uh, engaged in it. The biggest bar on the left is the Board of Legal Specialization, which has a 15-member committee, and then 11 specialty advisory commissions of nine persons each. 
Uh, and you can see the difference in the, not just the number of subentities, each of those little blue squares is a subentity, but also in their size. And I think the other thing just to say here is it's, it's again, hard for people to step outside of this life they are living and imagine some other life, professionally and personally. Um, there's a quote attributed to Henry Ford, although he never said this, um, that if he had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Um, and I say that not to make fun of Henry Ford or the people he was referring to, but to say, yeah, because for them, in the world they were living in, it was good enough, it worked well enough, it was normal, it was what they saw as natural, it was what conformed to the world around them. Um, Ford obviously had a different vision and imagined a different world, but it's, it's not easy to do that. Um, and it, it's hard to be asked to do that while you're still trying to do the work, hold down your day job and work as a volunteer. So I, I say that with full respect for all the work that people do put in as volunteers uh, in these sub-entities. And again, I think an, an unintended message of the review perhaps was just by asking the question, should you be doing this a different way? I think that got heard as, you're not doing a good job, which was not uh, the case. That was not uh, the way the review was conducted. It wasn't, we were trying to, again, to reimagine how we would ask an even more fundamental question, should the bar have been doing some of these things at all? And if so, what would be the best way to do it? So before diving in, uh, just say this has been a continuous and collaborative process to the best of our abilities through phone calls, conference calls, in-person meetings, surveys, uh, stakeholders. Uh, the columns are really represent January on the left all the way over to August. But as you can see, we were piggybacking on existing media structures as well as having ad hoc meetings in an attempt to gain perspective. Also by circulating drafts of the report to the uh, volunteers on the sub entities. Some of these processes actually began before 2018. Uh, this is just a diagram of 2018. So before diving in, uh, just a reminder that what we're asking the board to do today is to review, discuss, and approve in some form a recommendation on each of these sub-entities. That will provide the direction for staff to then return and develop detailed implementation plans. Uh, that includes consultation with our key uh, partners, the legislature and Supreme Court, uh, further uh, uh, once we know which direction we're going, then we'll be able to specify these other issues, the necessary rule and statute changes, the budgetary implications, the plan reallocation of staff that might be associated with the program that would, might be uh, reduced in size or eliminated, um, as well as an implementation timeline. None of these things can happen overnight. They all are going to require a process of orchestrated change. So. Whatever is approved today, the idea is that the bar staff would then go back to their desks and quickly work up in time for your November meeting uh, detailed plans, at which point the board would be presented with those and able to approve or modify those. I just wanted to add one thing, Richard. I do want the board to know that we have been consulting with our legal department and our legal department to work on throughout this process. So not as though this would be the first time when that these individuals see the recommendations. I do want you to be aware of that, uh, as well as the fact that OGC has done a tremendous amount of work to identify the rule and statutory implications. So we are would not be starting from scratch after this meeting based on your recommendations, either in terms of the relationships or the substantive work that we need to be done. Yes, on the attachments to the agenda item, you will find the table of fiscal and estimated fiscal and personnel impacts, as well as the technical rule and statute changes. Uh, those will become more specific uh, once the board gives direction. But we obviously didn't want to come recommending something that was not possible uh, to be implemented. So we now turn to the committee bar examiners. Uh, there are a series of recommendations that were summarized in Table 5 in the uh, full appendix I report, which is on page 24 and 25 of that report. 
and we have grouped them here uh, by the area. So the first area is exam development. There were two uh, proposals there. One is... Uh, Let me just underscore this. We've, we're turning to our first sub-entity, and we're now discussing the committee of bar examiners. So those of you who want to speak on this item should uh, be attentive. So here we have uh, a two, uh, two recommendations that the CBE uh, evaluate the grading process uh, and, be, and do that formally and consistently annually. And the second is that there be a more systematic and data-driven sampling plan developed by staff and psychometrician. The current sampling plan used for uh, bar exam questions is uh, a bit more ad hoc uh, and not as um, deliberate as um, the review of the exam leads us to believe it should be. So these are the first two uh, recommendations regarding the CBE. I want you to go through all the CBE items, okay. and then when we get to the end of that entity, we'll engage you with some questions. Okay. The second uh, is regarding uh, moral character. Here, uh, we are recommending that the staff conduct the reviews and informal con conferences that's currently done by CBE members. That may require change to safe our rules, and the point here is to ensure fairness and objectivity and greater consistency over time based on documented standards. Uh, this was a point raised in the uh, consultant review by Walton and Parker, uh, and the need to ensure that appear to be some subjective criteria being used are, are, are not a part of this process. Here, uh, the reason this is in red is not because it's super important, it's because it, but through a clerical error, this recommendation was omitted from the list in your agenda item, although the content of this area was discussed in the report, so apologies for that. This is the uh, eligibility enforcement exam rules uh, that this be administered by staff. This is, in our view, a division of labor issue. CD and board set policies, then the staff can administer their enforcement. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Sure. So, <clears throat> looking at page 25 of your report, um, can you just tell me exactly, what, I'm not, it's not clear to me what, what's changed in your record. All right, so the, when you look at column two in that table, there's a a heading that says change from current question mark. Yes. So anywhere that's blank, there's no change being proposed. It's status quo. Uh, this was an attempt to create an exhaustive list of all the different responsibilities of the CBE and to talk about the division of labor with the staff and, uh, and CBE. So, so, so my question is, if I want to take my pen and mark this up so I know exactly, so I can look at my paper and know what your recommendations, what would I do? Just a simple question. What changes are there? He's talking about the thing on your slide that's not in his report. Um, I don't understand how your slide interacts with okay. slide. My slide is an attempt to summarize two things. This table, as well as previous reports delivered to the board. And we're talking about a particular recommendation on the slide that you put in red because it was an addition. He's wondering where that goes on page 25. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so in the heading, at uh, the top of page 25, Roman 4, eligibility and enforcement of exam rules. Yes. That is where you'll see number two, enforcement, and it says change. So I'm sorry, that's where, that's where that belongs. So it's just straight change, so it isn't a change? No, no, no. I'm sorry. Richard's saying it wasn't included in the uh, resolve. Not that it's not included in the report. Oh, in the formal resolution. Yeah. Yes, in the resolution. I'm sorry, in the agenda item itself where there was the further, Same. further. So this is that, I, I got two further and Thank I you. left I one out. Okay. No, no problem. Back to you, Richard. All right. Um, here, another uh, what we view as division of labor uh, recommendation that the budget developed and managed by staff reported through the normal state bar budget <coughs> process and just a public document, uh, which would, again, be a more appropriate vision of labor uh, for staff to carry that out. Thank you. Uh, number four here, approved staff recommendations regarding trends in licensing and certification. Uh, this is 
to study trends. So this has not been done. Again, this is one where uh, while CBE members have gone to conferences on licensure, uh, there has not been a systematic way that that information gets generalized and incorporated into the actual work of CBE. So this is just in order to keep current with what's happening. An example of this would be you know, in architecture, they completely changed the ways uh, architects are being licensed by forming the exam to the stages of an architectural project to just make it more real world. So there's all kinds of innovative uses of technology and sampling techniques for different kinds of subject matter questions. So this is just an attempt to learn from what other fields are doing, are doing to formalize that. And here's a brief summary of the information in the attachment regarding fiscal personnel impact, uh, leave the, uh, so the only changes here are the notion that we would be increasing staff work with respect to moral character, which may require, depending on how the staffing is done, either transfer of the staff from a program that's, or staff are freed up, um, that's, and the cost just simply represents the additional overhead. And so the, 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 the interfund effect is the impact on the general fund from these, um, these activities that have separate funding streams. Yes. And, and that number is a negative number, which I mean, which I take to mean that it has a positive impact on the general fund by absorbing more overhead. Have I read that right or have I read that backwards? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Got it. So we're adding position in a fee funded area. That means more overhead goes with it. There's a net beneficial effect on the general fund on this page. And Justin's nodding his head, so I know I must be right. Good. He's the one who told me. Uh, does that take into account the, the savings and travel costs associated with attending the moral character? No, we did not attempt to get that detailed until we saw what direction the board wanted to go, and then we can actually do that in a more realistic way, which is make lot of convenient assumptions and uh, that may or may not be true. And are you at the end of your discussion? I'm at the end of CBE, yes. Are there any questions of the trustees for Richard on the recommendations regarding the Committee of Parks and I have one that I'll start with and, and Brandon. I've heard different things in our dialogue about the role of the Western uh, States Association of uh, Colleges and Universities. One thing I heard was that we were going to mandate this uh, regulator in lieu of our staffing. I heard um, much uh, consternation from the law school deans about that possibility. Subsequently, I heard that what we were suggesting is that those law schools which choose WASC certification could use it as a substitute for much of our regulation. Um, they still have to show bar passage rates, but otherwise their WASC certification would be sufficient. What's, where does the ball rest in terms of the staff's recommendation on the role of WASC? So uh, in the full report, we had a little section called Future Opportunities for uh, law school engagement and accreditation. Those two areas, as you just alluded to, were uh, discussed rather passionately uh, on, on both sides, and it made it clear uh, as that those needed more time to allow uh, a greater resolution, or more complete resolution <coughs> of the issues in those. So these are, we are not making recommendations about those at this time. We are, we have sketched on pages 26 and 27 of that report, uh, issues and uh, ways to look at that during the discussion of uh, there's going to be a longer process uh, uh, for those two issues. So we'll not be, we will not be acting on that recommendation today? Correct. Got but it. as Richard notes, we did include in staff's initial thinking on those issues and with respect to the regional creditors, um, which WASC is one of, uh, I think our current sort of state of thinking is that uh, we might recommend that the bar recognize regional accreditors, so not just boss. That if you have a regional accreditation, uh, we would recognize that with the addition of the minimum bar pass rate requirement and disclosures. Um, so that's kind of our current thinking, uh, but as Richard indicates in his outline in the report, we do believe we need to do uh, more work before we bring that particular recommendation back to the board. Brandon. So what, what type of staff engagements was there in discussing these different proposed rules? Uh, I mean, was it going and saying, hey, what's your workload? Um, I, how did you develop um, the total costs of implementation of this recommendation? 
With respect to moral character specifically, or just generally? Well, to the CBE um, changes that you're, that you're proposing. So I see. This page suggests that the only impl implication of this, this particular set of recommendations on staffing is there'll be an additional FTE in moral character because a certain portion of the caseload is being shifted from volunteers to staff. Otherwise, these recommendations don't affect staffing levels. Well, and I, I'm just wondering what went into determining, because uh, I'm just looking at the change from current and counting up those, um, those designations. Um, I guess how confident are we that our staff is not going to be overburdened by taking on these new, um, I guess, new areas? Well, I'll answer that. I'll answer which We did have um, Justin assigned to uh, work with staff to come up with these impacts. I will say that there is an offset, um, and this is something that I think sometimes uh, we forget that there is a cost, a staffing cost, to having committees and to bringing things before a committee. And so when you um, obviate the need to prepare agenda items for a committee, to staff an actual committee meeting, you are freeing up the resources that can be used for something else. So even though the CBE is here in the informal conference, there's a tremendous amount of staff work that goes into prepping for those informal conferences. So I think the amount, the workload shift um, that you might perceive is not as impactful as, as you might perceive because of that work that's being done to staff the care the community. So I mean, these are estimates, and I, I don't think we can report them to be anything more than that. Uh, but, so, but the staff who do the work in these areas work directly asked, you know, what is the implication of this change for your work? And with, would, would the shift accommodate that, or would it be actual? And in, in some cases, not with respect to CE, I don't believe. Um, you know, I think staff's own uh, perception of the work will shift. The immediate staff who do the work was not necessarily the perception of management. So there were multiple levels of folks involved in, in taking a look at that. Uh, so, I have a question. so for the new um, <clears throat> FTE staff person who would conduct the moral character reviews under this proposal, um, what would the professional qualifications of that person be? It Is was it anticipated to be higher? Was, yeah, was it the was spiked as a staff attorney in terms of cost and uh, professional uh, qualifications. So I guess along the lines of that, uh, how many informal conferences do you conduct kind of on average? I don't know. I thought it was 100 or 300. 300 a year. I know, I thought it was 100 in the 30s. Yeah, I think it was 100 in the 30s. It was 182 in 2017, and as of July, we had a little over half of them. So roughly 200. So for those who are, are um, listening um, and need the microphones, Amy Nunez from our um, admissions unit is telling us that it's about 200 a year, 182 last year, and that the midpoint this year is putting us on track to be about 200 this year. Other questions of Richard regarding our first sub entity CBE? I just uh, want to clarify for Brandon. We would, uh, proposals that the CBE would still be the body if somebody was not satisfied with the outcome of the moral character hearing, they could come forward with CBE. Well, and my follow-up question to the 200 numbers, out of that, how many were then reviewed by CBE at the level? No, so the 200 are the informal conferences yeah. that the CBE conducted. So there is not, not currently an appellate process within the CBE itself. But I did want to give some context. It's 200 out of how many moral character applications in total that are processed annually. Is that 4,000, 6,000? It was about 2.5%. Okay, so about 2.5% of the applications that we process, I think that's important contextual information when you think about the workload impact. This is 2.5% of all of the applications and staff handles. Any other questions about CBE? I have one person who signed up to address CBE, that's Mr. Ira Spiro. Mr. Spiro, if you want to come forward and 
choose a microphone and eliminate it? No, they have it here. The uh, subject that I want to talk about is not being uh, changed. So okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wants to address the board regarding CDE? Come forward, please. <coughs> choose any of these seats near Richard and turn on your microphone and, we'll be, and let us know who you are. As many of you are probably already aware, the committee has a lot of concerns about the proposed changes. For today, I'll limit my scope to the moral character part of it. The committee shares the same values and objectives as the state bar. We, too, also want to ensure public protection, accountability, transparency, and promote consistency. However, for purposes of the moral character reforms, I have to say that consistency does not necessarily mean that it's the fair or right thing to do. For each applicant, two similar, similarly situated applicants can come in with um, the same background. And an integral part of the moral character function is to determine candor. <coughs> because with candor means that the person has accepted responsibility for his or her own doing and show remorse. Um, with that being said, how an applicant presents him or herself at the interview is very crucial in evaluating candor. Candor is not something that can be looked at on paper and for that reason alone, it's somewhat unfair to assume that the committee is not being consistent in their evaluation of moral character applicants when what's presented is normally on paper. Only the panel who has attended the interview is able to make that assessment. Also, the committee is comprised of public members and attorney members. For the public members, we have the benefit of their diversity and for the attorney members it can't be stressed enough that by trade we're supposed or by trade we're trained in assessing credibility through our questions thank you for your remarks any other public comment on cbe okay now we're open for board discussion and perhaps a motion on the recommendations regarding cbe <coughs> I'd like to move to adopt the, uh, the recommendations of staff, including the addition of the eligibility and enforcement examiners uh, with regard to the CBE. Is there a second for the motion? Second. Is there a discussion? Brandon, I, I just wanted to ask well, what type of uh, process was there in putting this out for public comment? I know that we've received a lot of letters uh, regarding these changes, but was there 45 day, a 60 day uh, public comment period. This next step that staff will get to, uh, if we give them this conceptual direction today, will be to come back to you at your October meeting, November meeting, November. November meeting, with specific implementation items. Many, but not all of these recommendations will require changes to rules, and those rules will be subject, some of those rules will be subject to notice and comment will make. So we're going from concept to implementation, and some of the implementation is kind of involved. Notice and comment rulemaking. And if I could piggyback on that, and again, this, these things have been discussed in multiple open meetings where there has been public comment allowed. So <coughs> during each one of those meetings, public comment was available. So it, it ha there has been an opportunity. Of course, as you know, the committees have all significantly weighed in during the I, I just I had further questions about the volunteer aspect of your presentation. Can you go back to that? Because I think it does touch on uh, you know whether volunteers or staff uh, perform these essential CV functions. So is that okay? Sure. Okay. Um, so you had the graphs uh, regard, uh, regarding other uh, sub entities located here in California. <coughs> Did you do a comparison um, of the number of licensees that those other sub entities, so like the Board of uh, Medicine Board? Board, accountancy, did you 
transfer those into yeah, so the, for example, the Board of Nursing has somewhere around 400,000 licensees, I think. Uh, so twice as many as we do. Yeah, that little board is somewhere around 200, 123, I believe. So uh, there wasn't a direct correlation between the size and what they, what they do. So size alone does not explain, to say it differently, size alone does not explain why the bar uh, uses its volunteers with us. Because a number of those sub entities have responsibility for those same functions. They just they use board members uh, or task forces or other means to uh, achieve the purpose. So, uh, another question along those lines: um, Did you uh, look at the percentage of volunteers um, that the bar currently uses in all those different functions that we uh, carry out, like licensing, regulation? Uh, policy development. We have a breakdown of the number of volunteers that we are currently uh, using in those areas. The, well, so the sub entity sizes, is that what you're, I mean, yes. So those, uh, I think the Commission on Access to Justice is 26, uh, COAP is 21 regular members, plus four liaisons, uh, legal services, plus one commission, uh, 19. So they go down, the smallest one is the client security fund, which is seven. So there's a, there's a range within there. Um, I can't say it's obvious why the sizes were chosen for the different functions um, any more than the names of them, because whether you're a board commission committee it doesn't signify, as far as I can tell, anything special about what you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to do it. Either, so. but I guess my, my questions go to, you know, is this something that we can reform as far as the size of our board, kind of, you know, some of the governance task force recommendations for the different sub-entities, or is this where we're just going to wholesale change the way these different sub-entities look? I mean, do you think it's possible to adopt the, the task force recommendations for each of the different sub -entities? Yeah, you'll see, you'll see later there's a global set of recommendations, and one of those pertains to size, and it suggests that what should happen is there should be a uh, standard set of seven as a decision making function with justification based on purpose and workload for more than that which will kind of force the conversation if you will about what's the division of labor what is the committee doing and so forth because you know this is also why sunset reviews get done because things get set up and then they roll along and and they're just considered to be the way we do it and people don't unless forced <laughs> uh, ask the questions why are we doing it this way? Should we still be doing it this way? Is there a different, better, smaller, more efficient way to do it? So I think that's the purpose of this review is to really uh, ask all of us to ask those questions. And then my last question um, re related to volunteers. Um, did our number of volunteers uh, get reduced after we bifurcated the water, or after we separated the regulatory from the trade association? Yes. 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 That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, and what we were at about what is over 600? Prior so to the sections were a lot of bodies. Yeah, I think it was about 500 mm -hmm. total. Which so, so we have reduced the number of volunteers. Further discussion? Yes, sir. Sure. Um, the great work, by the way, on the report. Uh, conceptually, uh, thinking about bringing uh, work in house staff does the let's say the first line review and I think this is a question that would apply overall to any recommendation relating to uh, work done by the staff. Um, am I correct that the oversight mechanism um, sort of a audit function would be an appeal right if recommended so in this case it would be an appeal right uh, to the CD as a standing body. Is that, is that right? For moral character determination yes. Would there be any other, just thinking about an audit committee function or an internal control function, would there be any other mechanism to ensure that now that the, the workload is done internally, that, that, is, that certain standards are being adhered to? Well, I think what that's related to is the need for all of these sub-entities, including uh, the CBE, to really develop meaningful 
uh, easily understood metrics for performance? Because right now, many of these areas do not have them. Um, people got excited about doing the work, engaged in doing the work, and didn't stop along the way to say, how do we know if this is having the intended consequence? So I think what we want to do is figure out what those things are, which could be a very rich conversation, because you're, you're doing a complicated thing. Often it's quality, quantity, or some mixture of dimensions you're trying to capture. And then what you'd be able to see is what's the baseline, where are there deviations, and why, because that's what you're looking for is, where there's variation, can we explain why there's you know, more uh, informal uh, reviews this year than last year, and what's driving that? You would know whether it was the same or different, and why, where, where it could be explained. So I think that's, all of these areas really cry out for that, because the work, uh, we all hope the work we do is meaningful and rational, and, and doing what we wanted to do, but sometimes that's not the case, or not a, not the case in the way that we think it is. And I think they all need to establish that, and then that's the board's job to be able to review and come to, and understand what's the what's the baseline for this. What are we trying to? What, which number are we trying to move? Which needle are we trying to move with this policy? And are we moving the needle? I think that's where the sub entities uh, need to be engaged as well with our staff and the board. Well, I would also just add kind of the obvious point that the way you ensure quality of the work being performed by staff is through the management, uh, performance management of staff. So I think there obviously will be a role for the board, um, potentially through reporting, and certainly there could be a role for the audit committee, but day-to-day -day quality assurance of staff is done through management, and so it would I think that's the answer sort of, uh, universally across all of these recommendations. So the way I synthesize the issues implicit in your question are procedural fairness to the individual applicant frequently requires an appeal. And so in many of these entities, we've reduced the entity's role but made it an appellate product. The second question is how do we ensure effective, accountable, even-handed performance? Well, staff works for a boss, the boss ultimately reports up the uh, command to Leah, and we supervise Leah. In addition, the sub entities, many of them, will continue to exist and play an oversight role of a kind. And then, at the end of the day, there's always the legislature, the court, and the press. But it's how do you hold an institution accountable? And accountability, consistency, and transparency can be accomplished by a variety of governance structures. But we need to understand who's doing what. And the essence of this proposal is that we can be more efficient if some of these functions are brought to the staff level and the volunteers are limited to an appellate body. And I'm managing, sure be more accountable. managing volunteers is, to, with all due respect to the volunteers, I am one, I'm not gonna pay a check here today. Um, managing volunteers is often pushing on a string. You can't order them around. Um, if you got staff and they've got a stack of files and they don't get that stack of files from the inbox to the outbox, you can fire them. Um, and therefore, as a manager, you've got more control to get throughput accomplished. And so there's, there's different strengths and weaknesses um, of each kind of service delivery, and you've got to strike the balance that you think makes sense. Yeah, and I, I very much agree with that. I, I think my thinking is down the line, if we are now shifting work to another, let's say, resource, <coughs> how do we ensure that resource is compliant with the now articulated uh, measures of quality, of consistency, of due process. It sounds like we have several avenues, but you know, as we go along this work, I think it's something that we all need to keep in mind because certainly every institution has the ability to fail. Um, and certainly, I would not want the court or the legislature to get involved in something that we should have and can deal with in house. Great. More comment on CBE. Are we comfortable substituting the roll call on these four recommendations, or folks want to roll call? To, uh, Let's call the roll. Yes. Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Dolan? Yes. LeBron? Yes. Lee? Yes. Manning? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Tortula? Yes. Zellin? Yes. Stalin? No. Steinbrecher? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Okay, so we have adopted the first four of our resolution clauses, and we can give a conceptual direction to our staff. This concept will be operationalized in action items that you will see and I will not in November.
Back to you, Richard. Who's All next? Right. Uh, what is next is the Council on Access and Fairness. So our recommendation here is uh, retain and focus. Uh, I think it's fair to say that this is one of these areas where uh, the body got set up and people said, oh good, we have one of those, they're off doing that really important thing. And, <coughs> and the board has not historically been as engaged as it needed to be and what is the work of that group and how does that align with our uh, strategic plan or strategic objectives, I think now with the inclusion of that uh, inclusion clause in the mission statement that's very clear, uh, there's an opportunity to engage, uh, for the board to engage with COAF and, and clarify what does it mean, what are, you, what are you doing, what should you be doing, and for example, one of the areas where there's been a frank discussion of uh, disagreement uh, on various parties has been the extent to which COAF should be uh, working on judicial diversity, one view being that's totally in line with this mission, another view being that's more of a judicial council uh, responsibility. That's a good conversation to have and to clarify who's doing what. Some of these, it's not an either or, but a, what's, what do we do, what do our partners do, partners being law schools, partners being other national organizations, partners being the affinity bars. Uh, there was a beginning of that conversation with uh, Diversity Summit at the end of August in uh, actually here in Los Angeles. Uh, where that conversation started and what was really encouraging about that was Infinity Bar saying, yes, we want you to you know, collect more data, but we need to see if we're making progress. Right now we don't have good baseline data to see if we're moving, me, to see if we're moving the dial here. Uh, a lot of work's being done, but uh, again, it needs to be added up uh, to see if, that's, if we're doing the most effective things. So we have one recommendation. Okay. That's correct. So we have, we have one recommendation on co-op. Have you reached the end of your presentation on co-op? And the basic idea here is to, um, what it literally says is de-emphasize the focus on judicial diversity. Just to start the questioning, that strikes me as a pretty broad statement. And, and I'm hoping that you can make it more granular to tell me sort of specifically what that means. What tasks would be less of a priority on demand on there and our resources and what tasks would be more? I have the impression that we're talking about a particular function not broad philosophical inquiries. Well, I think that it, that it is a little bit of both. Okay. Um, but the particular functions have to do with going out, I think, in the field, uh, doing the workshops and the mentoring uh, uh, sessions, and that there needs to be um, additional conversation, I believe, uh, with the Judicial Council in particular, but also with the Affinity Bars as to the appropriate uh, division of labor, all understanding the common shared goal of having a, a diverse judiciary, what is the appropriate role for the state law? And I believe that we would continue to have a role, um, likely in the development, the continued development of materials that would be used, but not necessarily a primary role in going out and kind of out into the field uh, to do this work. Uh, so that, if that helps, uh, that's the direction that certainly we've been talking about, though. It is a dependent in part of the conversations that we'll continue to have with the Judicial Council in particular. And so this is one where we would look to come back in November with something more uh, concrete as to what this revision for the focus would look like. But I, I should also note that there's a whole other set of issues that the board is going to need to grapple with which has to do with defining what our diversity goals are. And this um, is, I think, equally, if not more important than the judicial diversity issue. We know that our charge includes diversifying the legal profession, and no question about that. We have not, uh, to date, done the work we needed to do to say, what does that mean? What is the goal? And how are we gonna measure ourselves and hold ourselves accountable to, towards achieving that goal? And that we absolutely must do as an organization, otherwise it's a meaningless goal. Um, and so the summit that Richard referred to, I think, was a, a great first step in beginning to collaborate around what those goals should be. And those are additional conversations we will also have between now and November. I have made the suggestion that the Programs Committee take up this issue in November uh, in anticipation of the January planning session, including a specific focus on 
diversification of the profession. So there's a host of work that needs to be done that ultimately will go into the refined focus for COAP. And I simply, I believe, you know, at this time our suggestion is because we will become serious about uh, achieving goals, articulated goals around diversifying the profession, it is my personal recommendation that we therefore make a, as a secondary goal diversification of the judiciary. Other questions for Richard about the one recommendation on co-op? Um, is, there, is there no public comment on co-op? Um, I'm going to wait until the questions are done, and then we'll do public comment, and then we'll do dialogue. Just, this is just clarifying the staff recommendation. Okay. Um, I think there's a lot more work. Well, not a lot, because a lot of work has already been done. Um, but I know there's a couple things relating to judicial diversity uh, and judicial diversity is developing the pipeline of qualified lawyers for potential appointment or election to the state judiciary on all levels. So that's that's really what we're talking about. Um, I mean, I, there are outstanding discussions with the Judicial Council. I think um, we still need to get more uh, focus from the court. So I, I guess if I was to say, if we don't truly want to have a discussion about judicial diversity because that it is the time for it, that we remove the language related to the emphasizing to judicial diversity up to the point where the board has a better sense of how the division of labor uh, is between if it is a judicial council. Um, so we understand that. Uh, have a better visibility as to how the court feels about that, and and much more visibility to what the legislature feels about that. Um, I'd be I would be very comfortable with that type of compromise as to the staff's recommendation. Okay. Are there any other questions about the staff report before we invite public comment? And after public comment, we'll start our dialogue. I just want to clarify this option. When I'm reading the report, it doesn't discuss any of the. It's up at page 49. I think what's confusing is we don't have the re language of the resolution posted. Right, and so it's bottom of 48, top of 49 right. is where it appears, and there is the language de-emphasizing focus on judicial diversity. Okay. All, right. All right, thank you. Okay, is, I don't have anybody on our sign-up sheet who wanted to address COAP. Is there anybody in the audience who wants to address the commission, of the board, about COAP? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, is there more discussion, or are we ready for a motion? Can I make a motion to adopt the staff recommendation but striking the, the emphasized judicial diversity to the point where we have more information related to that goal? You should. Sure? Is there a second for that motion? Second. second. Let me speak to it if I can, um, because there have been a lot of discussions offline about this. As I think about what promoting a, the goal of promoting a, a, a diverse judiciary we all share, um, as I think about mechanically what it is, it's building a diverse profession, so there's people with five years of licensing who could be judges. There's inducing those people to apply. Uh, there's assisting those people in applying effectively. And then there's persuading a governor to appoint them. Um, the diversifying the profession absolutely is our responsibility, and it's nobody else's, quite frankly. Um, and it should be an emphasis. Lobbying the governor strikes me as inappropriate for a government agency particularly a government agency that houses the Jenny Commission that's supposed to evaluate candidates in a fair and even-handed way. So I think lobbying the governor should have off the table. Those middle steps of doing outreach into the minority bar community to sell the opportunity to be a judge and mentoring applicants effectively strikes me as something that could be efficiently done here and could be done efficiently elsewhere, like in the Judicial Council, in the minority bars, in the Minority Judges Association. So I'm sort of open to persuasion about that middle slice. So this I know we own, this I know we shouldn't be doing, and this I'm open to persuasion. What troubles me a little bit about this recommendation is that if you take this language in isolation and put it on a billboard, we, it's, we lose the sound like war. It sounds like we're against truth, light, and justice. And so I wonder if one option is to adopt the, the motion, uh, another option is to adopt the staff recommendation. And the third option is to state it more positively, which is instead of de-emphasizing judicial diversity, let's emphasize professional diversity. Let's recognize that we alone can do that, 
we're not doing it as well as we might, and we should walk before we run. Let's start building the pool of folks with five years of licensure. And that's our emphasis without using the la negative language about any of our other goals. My sense is that might strike them at the right balance uh, between um, giving some constructive feedback to co-ops about where we want their energy put in the short run without disrespecting any of the broader goals that I think we all share. I don't know whether that addresses your concern or not. That's the range of options that has occurred to me as I think about this problem. Can I weigh in? Please. I would like to see the resolution state, rather than de-emphasizing or emphasizing anything, uh, that it be focused and come on in alignment with the board's strategic plan. And then the board can make decisions in the strategic plan. What we that's want. there, and that's effectively Jason's recommendation. So it, it just leave it to focus its, its work based on what our strategic plan is, and then we can just make that call later. And what, I, I would take that as a no, I don't know about that. And so how does that actually change the language of the second bullet point, which is the top of page 49, other than by striking the emphasizing focus on judicial diversity? And so it says clarify charge of co-op, ensuring alignment with the state bar's diversity and inclusion mandate and board strategy. It would just say <laughs> to clarify the charge of co-op, um, ensuring alignment with the state bar's diversity and inclusion mandate and board strategy as reflected in the state bar strategic plan. Got it. So we're adding the phrase as reflected in the state bar strategic plan after board strategy. Sarah? Yeah, 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 correct. Diversity. Did you get the addition, Sarah? Yeah. That's a friendly amendment? Yes. And did the second consider it so? I forget who the second was. Yes. yes. Is there more discussion? May I substitute the role or shall we call the role on Jason's motion as friendly amended? Yeah, I'm in it next. Oh, we can't substitute roll. Please, please call the roll. Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Yeah. Dylan? Yes. LeBron? Yes. Lee? Yes. Manny? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Matula? Yes. Seller? Yes. Stallings? Yes. Steinbrecher? Yes. Yes. Okay, client security trust fund. Richard? Okay, moving next. Uh, our recommendation is that the commission functions only as the appellate body and the staff issue tentative decisions. So the current process, uh, after the staff vetted the um, claims, they proceed on, on one of several paths, but the key one being uh, the staff draft tentative decisions. Currently, those are reviewed by the, uh, the commission as a whole. Uh, they spend somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the meeting time reviewing those and uh, adjusting them, if you will. Those get issued, uh, then they become final uh, uh, decisions uh, after the party has been notified and if other parts of the process are revoked. Uh, that is the objection part. So this would basically say staff should just issue those um, and that when these the other part of what the commission currently does is is currently its appellate function, which is it hears things called objections, which are essentially trial de novo for the people disputing the claim, and they they proceed uh, with the commission. So uh, this may, as we note here, it may uh, result in some timeliness gains, 30 to 60 days estimated by the staff. Uh, that's not the bulk of the time people are waiting because it has to do with the disciplinary process which has to go on before the claims can proceed. But anyway, at that point, I suppose any savings of time would be appreciated by claimants. Uh, and it may be also that the size of the commission can be reduced through attrition because, if we change, again, purpose-driven size, so if they can do that work with fewer than seven, um, that would be great. Uh, from the point of view of just trying to get things right-sized. We have one recommendation That's um, correct. for this body. It comprises option two at page 56 of the staff report. Are there questions for Richard before I see? Go ahead, Brandon. What are the uh, fiscal impacts of option uh, two? I'm sorry, say again? Are, what are the fiscal impacts, if any, of option two? Okay, those are all rolled up by Scrolling. 
So the uh, client security fund, there really are, there's no uh, workload implications. Staff are already doing these, um, so it doesn't increase their work. Uh, there's really no fiscal or board impact. So to, what we will see is whether there's a change in the objection rate, the rate of appeal. And, and that could be, be a temporary blip as people try to decide maybe, maybe there's two sets of rules. Um, and until they figure out there's only one, maybe that goes up and down. But that will be easy, easy to see based on historical. Uh, Effectively, what we're doing is taking tenant rulings and saying, if you don't ask for a hearing, it's become final like a, like a trial court would. But if you ask for a hearing, you get a hearing. At present, we give everybody a hearing, even if they're prepared to acquiesce in the tentative decision. And we're eliminating a, uh, a caseload of people who sort of don't want to be heard. Has there been any issues delivering <coughs> tentative decisions? I mean, issues with volunteers making those tentative decisions? The tentatives are prepared by staff, and then they're presented to a okay. seven member volunteer body. I'm oh, sorry, yeah. So, as far as the volunteer body working through those tentative decisions? Right, and then, you know, if Staff respectfully appreciate the adjustments being made by the commission in those reviews. At the same time, no one has described to me that they are substantively you know, altering the fundamental nature of those decisions. So, um, again, they're applying. This is a this is a subheading that has documented guidelines, precedents, and decision rules that are applied and formally uh, documented. So. I think that's the reason why we feel comfortable making this recommendation. That that's it's kind of recognizing the sense the division of labor that's going on now, but taking out what appears to be a, a, a less necessary piece uh, of that review. Again, going to the issue of division of labor between staff and the uh, uh, practitioners. So, so uh, under under this proposal, would the commission be allowed to weigh in uh, about any sort of substantive rule changes or uh, any changes that need to be made as far as how well, I think, you know, right now, so what would happen is the staff would issue these tentatives to the parties. If the party, if the... Richard, I think uh, he's asking about guidelines. When we, when written policy directives uh, that govern those decision-making processes change, what's the role of the commission, what's the role of the board? Oh, the role of the commission is to review those and, and bring, make right, if they're substantive to the point they rise to the level of actual policy for the board, then they would bring them to the board. Okay, so that doesn't change. Right. No, not at all. I mean, I think this is what we're trying to recognize is that the, the, the sub-entity volunteers and the board have a policy role, and the implementation of that is a staff role, and that's what we're trying to pull apart in some of these recommendations. Other questions of Richard? Had nobody signed up to address the Client Security Trust Fund? Is there anyone in the audience who wants to address us? Seeing no one, may I have a motion? So we'll move. So I heard Debbie for the motion, I heard Alan for the second. Is there further discussion, or when we substitute the roll call? That one will be deemed approved. Now we turn to the Lawyers Assistance Program <coughs> Oversight Committee. Michael, Michael, can we just have a citation of the page of the exact option that we're approving? You are right. on page 56 of the staff report, and there, it's option two at the top of the page with three bullets. Okay, now we're returning to um, for the LAP Oversight Committee and the um, option two that's in discussion here is at page 68. Richard. All right, um, our recommendation is that we separate the voluntary referrals from the state bar program while retaining the disciplinary and moral character referrals. So this would leave the bar with about 60% of the current caseload, the self-referrals or voluntary referrals being about 38%. Um, the idea here is that right now this program, not, not just in California, but generally, so it's not only a California problem, it's it's seriously underutilized. There's less than 1% of the active attorneys that take advantage of this. Uh, that, again, we've, uh, we've looked at this in other states and they have the same problem. And the problem seen from several surveys that were conducted, including by the consultant Patrick Krill, uh, the problem can be summarized as follows. Uh, people, uh, licensees are concerned about two issues. Younger licensees are concerned about the effectiveness of it, the perception that we're a bar, we're not a therapeutic organization, so how could we be running a program that I think is really going to heal me if I'm seeking help? Um, and the second concern, typically by older uh, licensees, is the confidentiality 
sense they have more to lose if it's not confidentiality. So the never mind the statutory uh, confidentiality provisions and, and the firewall and the physical moving of the program, uh, even states where they set it up as a separate nonprofit, as long as the bar is, is funding that, uh, there's this underutilization problem because people just think I'm turning myself into the bar, essentially. Uh, that's a very different role than the other referrals that come either as a result of disciplinary process or uh, from moral character referrals through the admissions process. So that's the reason for the recommendation. There are three options presented. One is essentially the status quo. One is um, separate the entire program from the bar. And the recommendation staff is option two, which is to maintain the program in the bar, uh, but to place the voluntary component outside the bar. The, we heard from one speaker, um, the chair of the LAP Oversight Committee earlier, who expressed his preference for option one. I have one other speaker who's listed. We'll get to that. Are there any questions to clarify the staff report before we see public input? Let me just add one thing, uh, Please. if I may. Um, in conversations with Patrick Curley Consultant about this, um, his concern was, the well, if the bar does this, then we're just going to abandon people who need help uh, to their own Bits. And and it was said, no, no, this is a bit more like the section separation. We're not just going to say, good luck. We're going to find a responsible way to transfer that responsibility and then direct that. So that, again, if this is approved, the staff would come back with a concrete, detailed version of what that would look like. And we have that a legislative was, mandate to cooperate with the other bar or something like it and just give them 10% of the funding that comes through this program. So my sense is no matter what policy we establish, the legislature has maintained a voluntary program um, as a matter of state policy, and we won't change that. Can, can I add to that? Please. Uh, Patrick, when I read Patrick Crow's report, the, he seemed much more concerned about losing the funding if we were to set the amount. And there's no indication that the legislature wants to do that. We can pass that through like we do with other entities. The funding can still come in, and they would still receive what they need to receive. So um, I'm not sure his opinion might change if he knew that that wasn't going that was his biggest concern for my As long as Senator Burton has a working telephone, I don't see that funding going anywhere. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to note, Michael, that this one is a little unusual because this the appendix I process is a review of our sub entities. However, you'll notice this, there is no particular recommendation regarding this sub entity itself. Um, the charge from the 2017 Governance and the Public Interest Task Force with respect to LAP did direct that we specifically look at this question of whether or not the function itself should be severed from the bar. So this, with the board will make a decision today, then we will still need to tackle, if any portion of the program remains with the bar, we will need to tackle the question of the role of the sub entity, uh, the LAP Oversight Committee, which is the only sub entity that has a statutory mandate to exist and has statutorily prescribed duties. Uh, but we do, I, I believe, have a number of recommendations regarding the committee itself, but those are not uh, before the board today. Uh, and actually, the statute prescribes the nature of each member and what qualifications they need to have, which, which the consultant is saying, I'm not sure those are the right, I mean, I, you know, they, they made a good guess, but he's not sure those are the best, that's the best set of skills given what needs to be done. Understood. Sean. Uh, so, <coughs> question for you, Leah. <coughs> Excuse me. The last, <coughs> pardon me. The last bullet point of option two, which I understand is the staff recommendation, seems to be inconsistent with what you just said. So, should it be deleted? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. That last bullet down there looks like it's in excess of our authority. The board of trustees and state bar staff would perform the functions currently performed. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't catch that we were recommending complete elimination of the oversight committee, Richard. Uh, perhaps I missed that bullet. Um, so we'll be in that excise from the staff recommendation, and Sarah has noted that. Yeah, so I think we need to come back uh, in November with recommendations regarding the oversight committee, uh, depending on what the board decides today. Okay. Any other further questions uh, to clarify the staff recommendation before we open the public comment? Is there a way to quantify the, I guess, any changes that LAP has implemented since you started this process of hiring Patrick, making recommendations? I mean, is there is there a, a 
meaningful way, meaningful way to quantify that? Well, the, probably the, the biggest single the thing that changed during the course of the review was they hired in a kind of marketing or outreach person to try to uh, increase utilization of the program. And we have, last year, I think 150 uh, folks entered the program out of the active bar of 180,000. Uh, a lot more than that. Uh, who need help. And so they were trying to, re to begin to do things like reach out to law students who have been included in the universe of possible uh, folks. And uh, so that's probably the single biggest structural problem and uh, change. And they moved out of the bar office to an adjacent space to try to create some perception of separation. Uh, They've also eliminated the um, evaluation committees. So there, the LAP was included um, in the programs that were reviewed as part of workforce planning, the workforce planning analysis, and there were a number of recommendations for the program that um, derived from that study. And so those have been being implemented been implemented uh, over the last couple of years. One was that the program do a strategic plan in the first place, so that has been completed. And then there were recommendations regarding things like the evaluation committees, uh, the board did take action to uh, eliminate those committees. So a number of things uh, have been done, I'd say, uh, around around the margins. And has that improved our participation numbers? Uh, not to my knowledge. Yeah, I think it's probably too early to actually Know definitively whether it's changed anything, but um, again, I do know, you know staff reached out to other states where they actually have a separate whole separate nonprofit to see if that was the solution. Because one of the discussions was should there be a whole separate organization, and uh, of course, in Florida and other places where that doesn't solve the perception problem. As long as the bar is the host in some sense, then then that's the perception you're turning yourself into the bar. Do we have other questions to clarify the staff report before we invite public input? Seeing none, um, Justin De La Cruz. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Choose any seat and turn on the microphone. Yes, sir. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Justin De La Cruz. I'm an uh, oversight committee member of the LAP. Um, I'm speaking to stress my support for keeping the LAP within the bar as it is for the time being, as recommended by Patrick Krill. I'm a former participant in LAP, and I'm the only oversight committee member who is a former participant of LAP. Right after taking the bar, I voluntarily enrolled myself to seek LAP's help. With LAP's help, I have been able to obtain my law license and been able to stay sober for over seven years. Congratulations. Thank you. LAP should remain within the state bar as it allows um, to allow the oversight committee to implement the strategic plan that it created as part of that work workforce planning analysis. Um, this is the recommendation of Patrick Krill. This is the unanimous position of the oversight committee. This option also best fits the public protection function of the bar. Keeping the voluntary portion as um, of the LAP uh, is a proactive method of protecting the public. It gets to lawyers before they become problems for themselves or clients, like me. Uh, I, res I respectfully disagree, and I think the Oversight Committee would respectfully disagree with separating the voluntary function, as also um, keeping only the mandatory function within the state bar would mer merely perpetuate the perception that LAP is disciplinary in nature. This could hinder the voluntary participation in any other nonprofit entity just by relation. I've seen the impact of um, LAP on both voluntary and mandatory participants, and they feed off each other um, for support and guidance. So separating the two would decrease the effectiveness of the LAP in its public protection function. With respect to option one, the Oversight Committee is willing to work with the Board of Trustees, and I think an issue with moving forward and, and uh, making progress has been a confusion about decision-making process and authority, and we're more than willing to help uh, work with the Board of Trustees on that. So uh, thank you very much.
Thank you for your comments and thank you for your service. Is there anybody else who would like to address the board regarding the legal, the LAP oversight committee? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. Is there more discussion? Is there more discussion? Or may I have a motion? Um, I have some discussion. Go ahead. Um, to me, the, the best means to increase public protection is to try and increase participation in this program, clearly. And as long as the LAP is in any way affiliated with the state bar, we're going to have a problem with participation in this program. Um, it's unfortunate. I mean, we've had the program for years. It's never been a huge, a huge program like it should be, considering the funding it receives. And I really think for it's for it to prove that it can support public protection, it needs to separate itself. I am confused about why we would keep part of it and let part of it go. It seems to me we just let it separate in its entirety and set up its own entity to do the work. I, I'm just not, con perhaps I just don't understand well enough why we're separating out the mandatory and voluntary aspect of it. I would be more inclined to go with option three. Staff wanna present the rationale for keeping the drug court while letting go of the 12-step the, of the program? No. I'm not sure that's the right analogy, but it's my perception. Well, I, I think the, reason and the rationale has to do with the, the regulatory function of the bar. In other words, what, what's happening now in those referrals is if in the process of more careful review, or sometimes people do it uh, preemptively, but um, they they are referred so that they can then successfully uh, be admitted to the bar. Those are the admissions related ones. The others are more of a, which you might, in some version of the drug court therapeutic model where where through the disciplinary process that seemed to be the correct, the corrective, not that not purely punitive sanctioning, but actually trying to fix the underlying problem so that person could resume you know, the ethical and competent process of law. So I think that's the notion. Um, the voluntary LAP program does not require any reporting back. The participants can have themselves done. Um, it's, it doesn't have the same level of accountability as monitored LAP, which these are getting regular reports back. So in that sense, it is more like a drug court model. We're getting regular reports back, gauge is the person participating and, and moving through uh, the program in a way that's going to keep them on the path that they were set on by the, by the bar. So I think that's the, the rationale. Did you want to comment further, Joanna? Uh, and I'm still confused because why can't, if, if the entire LAP was separated out, why can't the Business State Bar require monitoring, but just have them, LAP I think is the only program that offers monitoring, have them go ahead and go to LAP and get the reports from LAP as a separate entity. Is there a reason we can't do that? No, you, you could do it. I mean, the, yeah. the, this is a, a one where I think um, we would be comfortable with option three. It's not that we wouldn't be comfortable with it per se. I think on with the uh, court supervised components and not the admissions referrals, um, one model is a true drug court model. That would mean you really wouldn't have a standalone LAP program. You would have LAP, the function, fully integrated in our Office of Probation as is consistent with how Offices of Probation work uh, in uh, the county system. And they would provide their risk assessments, the needs assessments, come up with a case plan that would include uh, the treatment services that are needed and there would be ongoing reporting to the court. I think that is a very clear model for the uh, court monitor portion. And so in my view, we no longer really call that an LAP program. You have a fully established drug court model within the state bar, which I think is probably long overdue here. Um, there is then that admissions population we kind of struggled with um, what to do with that population. It's not the same as the court supervised, uh, but it is formally referred to the program for the purpose of uh, being able to meet that moral character requirement. So there, it might not be appropriate for that group to be supervised by the Office of Probation. And then you might need to retain something called an LAP for that population. And so hence, I think if we just had a recommendation that covered the uh, 
the discipline system group. We might call it an elimination of the state bar LAP program because you are instead establishing a drug court model. But we've got the admissions population, so we may still need to have a, an in-house LAP for that population. Hence, this the option two. It's a little bit of a hybrid, uh, but again, I think you could split off the entire thing and have a contract with one or more entities uh, to do both admissions, uh, supervision, and uh, court supervised caseloads. So that, that would be what option two would look like. Sean, and then Renee. And then. This discussion raises a question in my mind because, uh, Richard, you alluded to people who, uh, applicants for admission, and I think some of these lawyers who might. Uh, anticipate a disciplinary problem. In some circumstances, can go to LAP preemptively, <coughs> or suggested, and then I don't understand the rules around this, but <clears throat> I think sometimes that has some effect on admissibility in state bar court or some sort of you know credit in state bar court, so to speak, uh, or in the admissions process. And I just wonder if we need more information on that. I mean, I favor option two or option three. But as between those two, I wonder if this factor is something that we need a little more information about. Yeah, I, I don't know about the, the legal question you're posing. Um, I, I have been told that there are times when prospective uh, licensees seek to preempt a problem in their more character review by voluntarily enrolling so that they can then state, yes, I had a problem, and this is what I've done about it, hoping to clear the hurdle uh, in the admissions process. So, um, uh, but as, as to the whole question of admissibility, or is that, or what's the nature of that information? I, I don't know the answer. Right. Did you want to comment? Um, <coughs> Thank you, yeah. It, it does go to the issue of recognition of the problem um, and taking steps to correct the problem, whether you're talking about mitigation it, as part of a disciplinary action or in the moral character setting, um, where you might, de you have, uh, if you share, I've gone to LAP, you can, sh uh, because it would be your choice as the applicant to share participation reports with LA from LAP, you would um, be able to demonstrate that you, you recognize that there's a problem and you have taken steps to solve that problem. So it really, sort of in the moral character um, situation, <clears throat> um, if, if it appears that you ha that you may have a substance use problem, they may refer you to LAP for three months, get an assessment, um, and you would be, your moral character application would be put in abeyance while there's that determination. In this case, you've already recognized it before you filed your moral character application. You've already gone through the LAP process, um, and so it would allow you to move forward potentially because you are um, resolving the issue that caused the um, prior the prior conduct that is at issue, either in that se setting or in the disciplinary setting. I, I do now recall the statute language because it says outside of a disciplinary process, it's, there's absolute confidentiality, but then it's up to the participant to disclose or not disclose his personal information. Okay, and did you have more time to go Well, I, just, <clears throat> I guess my reaction is I, I'm not convinced there could be an unintended consequence of taking option two or three in this regard. And I, I think it just warrants a little bit of more formal study and maybe also the, the drug court model that you discussed with that, which would be a different option and obviously requires a statutory change. I think a serious, thoughtful discussion of drug court is in our future. And so what we do today and what we build out based on what we do today is going to be subject to further thought at some point. And the question is when our resources allow us to get there. Is that a fair statement, Liam? Yeah, but I'll have more to say. Okay. Renee and then Debbie. I kind of comment a question. Maybe I'm missing something. Um, I understand the issue the overall, you know, trying to reduce the number of volunteers, um, and there's some comments about the size of the oversight committee. That seems to me to be one issue, kind of separate from whether or not this is retained internally, obviously. Um, what I don't really understand about that part is what does it mean to remove it and set it up on its own? Like, that seems like an awful lot of um, work for something that is fairly small 
and it would have to be capitalized somehow to ensure its longevity or some stream of funds each year. It's fairly subscale. Why could we not? But I also and I also hear the problem of you know it's in house. Do people really want to put their name in the park? Why can't we? When you mentioned contracting out, why can't we contract it out even if it's part of still part of the state bar? Like contract out responsibility. That way, I mean, if someone's not doing a good job, you move it to someone else. If it's you know, I mean, we're not just sort of saying like we're sending this out. <laughs> You know, done. We're kind of over that, um, and it might be a more both cost-effective as well as results-effective way, without having to go through all this separation um, stuff, and then deal with the size of the oversight committee. You don't need a big oversight committee if you outsource something. So just, so just to be clear, what the staff currently do is they the clinical rehabilitation coordinators do these initial assessments of pools issues that they bring in and they develop these uh, plans with them right. and and they do uh, other assessments so we don't perform direct service just so that's clear for I mean, anybody. You also they are referred assessments. out so the, the the change would be we wouldn't be in the referring out and monitoring this reassessing you would be saying here's some places you could go. That's one version, or you could, yeah, but you could, you could also have another contract version. Where, out the assessment that's correct. You could you could have a pass through in a more formal organizational connection. So I, there, I think there's a couple of different ways that could handle. Debbie. So my question is: now that um, all lawyers are being fingerprinted and you're getting subsequent arrest records, and my guess is you're going to get subsequent arrest records for people who have had um, DUIs, maybe multiple DUIs. And they may need you may need to look at them as having issues. Um, but that seems like if it's still in house, you can monitor those people because I think you're going to end up with some people that with that subsequent arrest. You know, the DUI thing is going to be that's probably going to be one of the things you're going to come across the most. And would that participate? Would that um, trigger a drug court kind of thing for them or all that? Because because if you have people that have those kind of issues and they don't get their license has been, you know, the drive plus book from them and, you know, all that kind of thing, you really want to look at those people as to what they're doing, are they performing, you know, as an attorney, how well are they doing? So, um, you might, just one of those things I think you need to look at before we get rid of this. Do you want to, I don't know if you want to say anything, Donna, we have had some conversations with um, OCTC about the new uh, information that we will receive. Um, pursuant to fingerprinting specifically around DUIs, expanded use of the ALD or the alternative in lieu of discipline program uh, to try to address this issue, meaning like a first time DUI, which may not be, a, is not a disciplinable offense, but having a system in place where those folks get referred for assessments of use assessment. We've talked about expanding the role of the Office of Probation uh, so that they can do that type of work really all in the vein of establishing more of an in-house drug court model. So yes, we've had those conversations. And I think the thing here, we also, this is a, a point I wanted to make. Um, within our probation population right now, we have folks that have substance abuse issues. We have terms and conditions of probation that relate, for example, to drug testing. Um, those people may or may not be in the ADP program, which is the, the kind of, the LAP program for folks in the discipline system. So you already have a population of people that we are supervising through our Office of Probation that have substance use issues. We definitely need to enhance um, that uh, system that we're using there, ensure that we are supervising that population in accordance with best practices. I don't believe that that's through a separate standalone LAP program, but rather it's through full integration of substance abuse treatment principles and approaches into our supervision model through the Office of Probation. And so that, that's why this conversation is a little bit complicated about are we going to keep it in-house, are we going to separate it out? We will always have uh, the, the responsibility to supervise folks on probation and those people will have substance abuse problems. The bar is going to have to have an effective approach for dealing with that population whether we have a standalone LAP program or not. 
So I, I do want to just assure you that we're working on that. It's something that I agree that we need to do. To your point, Renee, I don't think there's any objection to contracting out the voluntary function. It's akin to what Michael raised with the other bar. We're now being told that we have to redirect $1 or $10 to the other bar. We'll collect it. Then we have to distribute it to them. And we are going to have an MOU with them. I think that this, uh, stipulates that each year they report to us on what they're doing with the money. So similarly, we could contract out for voluntary um, services or for the entirety of, L of the LAP program and have an MOU or a contract that requires annual reporting on what they're doing with the money. So there, there's no objection to that. And I fully agree with you. This. Uh, 40% of a caseload of 160 is not going to be sufficient funding for someone to establish a standalone nonprofit. That's not fiscally viable. So it would have to be absorbed by another entity like the other bar. CLA might be an option. It would have to be a function absorbed by another entity. Brandon and then Justin and then Jason. Well, I guess my concern in, in separating the voluntary um, portion of LEP is, is, is kind of a messaging uh, type issue. You know, we've heard presentations from LAP in the past and it talks about 27% of attorneys in their first 15 years of practice experience some sort of substance abuse, 61% uh, uh, experience anxiety, 45.7% experience depression. So there's a real need for leadership in this area. And uh, I would be, um, I would like this to more effectively utilize the voluntary as well as court ordered aspects of the LAP through exactly what Debbie was talking about. Catching individuals before it maybe becomes a life controlling uh, uh, problem. Uh, catching it hopefully before it becomes a DMP 6007 issue where um, it's habitual use and affects a person's ability to practice. I think now that we have that potential pipeline in place, we can more effectively use LEP. We've given them uh, direction. Um, I don't think we've had enough time to fully realize that that added direction. And uh, that's, I, I would support option one. Jason. So, uh, Sean and I shepherded this um, process through at least with LAP, and at least on my end, I thought option two was sort of a I guess the beauty about having public comment is you get to hear, um, particularly in this gentleman's case, someone who participated in the voluntary program. Uh, and then Sean's comment about the sort of the unintended consequences of dividing um, the voluntary and the mandatory. So he said something specific that I that caught my which is the interaction between voluntary and mandatory. Uh, I guess his, his view that that added to the value of the, the process. Um, I, I don't know exactly what that means, I, um, but then Leah, your comments about the, the fragmentation of the mandatory aspects should option two be implemented, which is part of it goes to the Office of Probation, and part of it on the admission side still remains in the small piece that will be LAP it has me thinking this requires more study. Uh, these are not things that I, I really, I, I think I appreciated. I thought that option two was the, the natural course. Um, so I, 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 think, I think we need to take more time. That, that's my view. Let's, let me sort of express my views. I'm not, I'm, I'm not inclined to speak on too many of these substantively, but this one is near and dear to my heart. I have a sister who's been on the wagon for 31 years. I have a brother who is not. Um, so I, not, and I, I recognize the folks around me in my professional life who have substance abuse problems. And so this is something I care pretty deeply about. We are not very effective. And we're not very effective because we can't offer two things that most lawyers who are in a position to participate in a voluntary program desperately need or want. We can't offer anonymity, and we can't offer confidentiality, or at least the perception of it. So the other bar is so much better at this than we are um, that finding the other bar was a no-brainer for me. 
And the one thing worse than cutting loose the program into the private sector um, and disowning it, which is not what I think we're proposing, is to keep a program that isn't working. So <clears throat> this is ultimately up to you, because today we're just giving structural guidance, and the implementation will come back to you later. But what I would say to you is, don't let this program continue to be the ineffectual program that I perceive it to be, and that my friends in the recovery community perceive it to be. And what I would say to Justin, who I would like to appreciate for being here, is that he's typical of the population that we are serving well, which is the people who can't join the bar because they can't clear their moral character process without going through a nominally volunteer program that is not voluntary at all. And so that's why we're serving those folks well, because we've got a hammer. It's called their bar license, which they very much like to have. So truly voluntary participants, the only ones that we're getting are the ones that are so sick that they've got nowhere else to go, and there's nothing left to lose in coming. Not quite nothing left to lose. So we're, 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 we're serving law students who can't join the profession, and we're serving really sick people at the end of their disease. And in the middle, my perception is we're not serving very many people very well. And, and it's not a knock on the LAP. You, you can't give them, you can't ask people to knock on the sheriff's door and ask advice about that body in the trunk. They're just not going to do it. And so the only thing I, I would say is that we this is uh, these recommendations are ones that would require some statutory change to implement. They are not ones that you can walk out of this meeting today and actually even if we wanted to, uh, as Richard indicated at the beginning of his presentation, we would come back in November with an implementation plan and it would address if option two is selected for example this issue of where in the state bar would both the admissions monitoring and the discipline monitoring happen on the discipline monitoring it's quite clear that's the office of probation on the admissions monitoring we've just had conversations about whether or not that's appropriate to send uh, you know pre uh, licensees through our office of probation if that's the right message so I think these are questions that we would resolve by November if option two is selected. In addition, if it is going to be a contract out type of um, a situation, would we do that through competitive solicitation? Would we uh, be able to partner with CLA to achieve um, that structure? Those are all conversations we would have between now and November. So I would urge the board not to put it on hold, uh, but to um, make a sort of decision about what tentative direction to send staff in as we do further work towards the number Jason? Uh, just to put a, a finer point on my sort of uh, need more information, uh, I agree with you, Michael, that we can't keep a live program that does not work. Uh, and it's, not, it's not working for a long time. Where I was so certain that number two was the right answer, now I'm thinking, you know, I want to know more about option three because to me, if you take away a component, it may weaken the overall structure. So why not have a standalone entity that can address everyone's needs? So what I heard you suggest is a motion to approve option one and ask staff to report back on options two and three with more information answering these questions. No? Just two and three, leave option one off the table, okay. So you're asking staff to report back at an appropriate time um, more information about options two and three to answer the questions that have arisen today. So just a, uh, some information in, related to uh, Michael's point and also yours, Jason, that you know, the, the history of the Medical Board of California is instructive here because they had a wellness program. Uh, it was terminated by the legislature after it failed four consecutive state audits. They because the perception was they were running an ineffective program that, and in, in, in the darkest interpretation of that, that was designed to really sweep the problems under the rug and just tell the world, hey, don't worry about your doctor doing too much, you know, we got this. And so for at least eight years, they struggled to get something back on and the legislature kept telling them no. So what they finally ended up getting set up just this year was an independent entity that has performance metrics and reporting defined and that reports back uh, to the legislature and to the medical board as to its effectiveness. So they tried to solve a bunch of these effectiveness, uh, accountability, and independence uh, problems that way. But I, I certainly agree, however 
before it comes down and however the staff is the patient plan is, it needs to work because right now, um, again, not, not critical of LAP itself, but it just, it's not working. And it's not a, it's, it shouldn't be allowed to continue not working. So, so Jason, would you like to make a motion? And then I'll get you a shot. Uh, my motion is to, uh, motion to request the staff to make more information related to options two, and specifically emphasizing option three, uh, and report back in the next uh, Is there a second? Second. Sean, did you want to? I was going to ask Jason if he would transform his comments into a motion, so it's already granted my wish. Is there further discussion? <laughs> I would just say that we, in discussing options two and three, it seems like people are contemplating a level of continuing oversight by the state bar, even though the function is being transferred outside, and that's not really made clear in the bullet points. And uh, staff can take that as feedback for the way you present this next. <laughs> Certainly, the fact yeah, that we have the funding. I don't yeah. see continuing oversight. The fact that we have the funding and right. we spend it right. consistently yeah. with the statute yeah. mandate is going to make that so, and so it will be helpful to emphasize that. More discussion, Sean. Just one comment. I mean, I think I think this policy decision, basically between two and three, is the details matter, and so I think that's what we're saying. We need to kind of see the details of how they would be implemented, so we can make an informed decision about which to choose. Because of course, once we embark on two or three, it's irreversible. We want to be sure we understand it. And my perception is that regardless of whether we place the service delivery point for all or part of our programs outside this agency we will continue to have an oversight role because we're providing the funding and we have a regulatory objective to accomplish. And we probably need advice and support in that oversight role from something like the LAP Oversight Committee. It might have a different um, identity and it, may, it might have a different composition, but we need folks in the recovery community identified as such to advise us, partly because they have information and perspective and partly because they'll be a credible bridge of communication into the recovery community who needs to feel satisfied with this program or will hear about it from the legislature. Sonia. I think also that we probably would need to do set some parameters because we don't want it to be all you know free uh, free for all. I think sustainability of what whichever program that you know we're going to get or reputational risk because again you raised that uh, the lawyers would may have some reputational risk and, and being efficient, efficiency and and what's really important is confidentiality. So probably some we can set some parameters that really would help us be able to uh, make it measurable and be able to decide on the options. Are we ready for a vote? Please call the roll. We've had some changes in population in the room since we last did it. Rotten. And this is on yeah. Yeah. Just, just continuing the item for more information on options two and three. Yes. Um, Chen. Yeah. Dallin? Yes. LeBron? Yes. Lee? Yes. Manning? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Bertuda? Yes. Seller? Yes. Jolly? Yes. Ryan Brecker? Yes. Stephen? I'm going to stay on this the majority of the discussion. Yeah. Okay, okay, mandatory fee arm, for sure. And the recommendations for mandatory fee arm are on page 79 of the report. All right, our uh, recommendations are summarized here. Uh, staff driven program maintaining the current volunteer presiding arbitrator and two assistant presiding arbitrators. Uh, the rationale is the subject matter experts have done a great job of setting up the statewide <coughs> guidelines which are used to uh, vet local fee arbitration programs. Those are in place. Uh, from time to time, there's a need for arbitration advisories to draw on that same expertise. That are on. Over the last seven years, has been an average of a little over one of those a year. Uh, so our recommendation is that there not be a 16-person standing sub-entity, but instead the staff administer the program as currently designed. The training function, which was described to us as a major activity of commission members, be uh, basically transported to a distance learning platform. Our survey of local fee arbitration programs indicate they want more timely, on-demand uh, ability to train up local arbitrators and they can currently get through the in-person system. Uh, that's the way it's delivered now. And also that the arbitration advisory function, which they also value, 
be uh, folded in with COPRAC and take advantage of the way that ethics opinions are uh, disseminated to work that issue that way. So, okay. so taking advantage of such technologies to increase efficiency, and if there are policy issues that arise, then convening a work group or task force to figure out what those implications are for local programs for, for bar policy and put those in place. But uh, again, not to have a standing 16-person uh, commission. Okay, sorry. Are there any questions of Richard on this item? Seeing none, do we have any? Um, I don't have a man who signed up to address this item, although I will acknowledge I've received an awful lot of email from folks who are active in the mandatory fee arbitration committee and the volunteer committee. They're passionate about their work, quite knowledgeable about it, and they provide valuable services. So I wanted to acknowledge that input. Is there any further public input on the recommendations regarding to the mandatory fee arbitration committee? Seeing none, are we, is there discussion or may I have a motion? I will uh, move the recommendation. Followed up with the fact I was a liaison or attended many of these meetings several years ago, and I think that the analysis that was done is very appropriate and it will make things a lot more efficient. So, the motion by Joanna. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there more discussion? I have a question. Um, Go ahead, Alan. When staff and you, Richard, had conversations with the local bar associations that have mandatory or uh, you know, have uh, fee arbitration programs. Did they express any um, concern about being preempted or being uh, squeezed out or anything like that? Because at one time, about five or eight years ago, there was some concern at the local bar level about the state bar taking over the mandatory arbitration program. Thank you for the question. Um, now currently, there are 35 active programs. Um, the we did a survey of the program directors of those 35, and we asked them essentially of the following things we're currently doing, how valuable are those to you? And, and we asked them, how would these be solutions that would support you uh, equally or better? And we asked them uh, essentially to, for those kinds of ideas. So what they wanted was more timely uh, assistance. They want to continue. Uh, continued technical assistance, which they get, but they wanted it delivered more efficiently. Uh, they wanted the on-demand training instead of the uh, training that is often delayed because uh, of the need to do it in person and find people and time it with other meetings and so on. So, um, th so they they and they want the statewide roundtables, which are where they network with each other and learn from each other and figure out. Um, you know how to run their program more effectively. I think one of the things that this area also needs. Uh, and then I think the staff overview of the whole thing to bring is it needs a strategy. I mean, right now these programs come and go. Uh, Alameda got rid of theirs, so their caseload sort of goes to either the state bar or to San Francisco. Um, but there isn't a sense of, okay, Trinity Alpine, what are they doing? How do we get these three to help those two over there that don't have one? And, and so that it should be the case, no matter where you are in California, you have access to this kind of service if we're, if we're trying to be a statewide organization, which we are. So I think that there's a need for more strategic direction uh, there. But I, what was really encouraging was the the way in which these directors wanted, you know, the stuff delivered timely and on demand, because that's the world they're now used to living in and what they've come to expect. So. And Alan, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Donna, but I, this I don't know this would be comforting to the locals, but one of the interesting up during this process, we did get an anonymous comment from a member of the committee um, that suggested that perhaps the entire uh, construct is outdated and that we need to look at things like uh, mediation. And then on a separate track, they recently uh, participated in a demonstration of an online dispute resolution uh, program, Botria, which some court systems are beginning to use in California and other states use it. And immediately as I was sitting there, it clicked for me. Uh, fee arbitration or turning that into fee mediation, it would be a perfect, this vehicle would be a perfect way to address this issue. So I think one of the things that um, with more, we can do, uh, pay more attention to this program is think about ways that we might innovate, uh, given that it is 2018. Uh, there might be a different way of doing things now that we've done this. Thank you. I am uh, in favor and will vote in favor of the uh, motion by 
did want to encourage the staff uh, to uh, consider the sensibilities and the sensitivities of the local bar associations which are important, I think, for an ongoing relationship to, uh, to be aware of their concerns. Is there more discussion on the motion? So, um, so I would just be remiss in not, uh, not pointing out a couple of things. Um, we did get um, input, uh, feedback from a couple of um, county bar associations. One is included in um, the materials that were provided. Another was an email forwarded to me just this morning. Um, I would note that, the, that both of them really talked about, uh, we value the, the fee arbitration committee. We talked to the committee repeatedly and we are we value the um, the roundtables. Um, I, I think that that there there may be a misconception that what we're proposing to do is eliminate the program, because I, I suspect that the um, the individuals that they're talking with um, for assistance on a routine basis are the staff who would continue to do it, and the uh, those roundtables haven't happened for a couple of years, and I think that goes in part to Leah's talking about sort of strategic thinking about what we can do for to make the programs work for the local programs. The other point I, I want to make is that um, the uh, Mandatory Fee Arbitration Committee is meeting tomorrow in San Diego, and so there were some members who did want to be here to talk about the value of the committee and to argue strenuously against um, the option that staff is recommending. Um, and one of them specifically asked if the board, because they were not able to be here to present to the board, if the board would consider um, deferring action. And I would be remiss in not mentioning uh, that request here. So, and just to be clear, um, under the current uh, framework, any local program has to submit its local rules to the program for uh, to be validated, if you will, for conformity to that. 95% uh, of the case that is handled in these local programs, uh, the bar uh, itself, the volunteer presiding arbitrator and assistant handled 59 arbitration cases last year against 871 out of the local programs on average over the last two years. So they are doing the bulk of the work. Um, the bar is only involved directly when there's lack of venue for some reason uh, in a place. So. Okay, is there more discussion or are we ready for a roll call? Robinson? Yes. Chen? Yes. Dylan? Dylan? Uh, LeBron? Yes. Lee? Yes. Manning? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Vertula? Yes. Salad? <coughs> yes. Stallings? Yes. Steinbrecher? Yes. Stevenson? Yes. Okay, who's next? All right, now before we um, Right. Before let's we do uh, resolution 10 last. After CBLS? Yeah, let's do CBLS. Okay. So let me skip to that. Uh, all right, so um, going back to this. Um, CBLS. The, the essential policy question for the board is Is certification of legal specialization a public protection function or is it a advantage that accrues to people holding certification and as such uh, not uh, a public protection function in essence. Uh, currently, so our recommendation is the elimination of it as a bar function. There are about 15 states that uh, allow attorneys to be certified by uh, ADA approved uh, specialization certification organizations and add a disclaimer that the state bar does not uh, is not endorsing those per se. There's another set of similar size states that say you can do that without, and just say who gave it to you and they don't require the disclaimer. Uh, there's a handful of states that do it uh, themselves and there's five states that outlaw any claims to legal specialization at all. So there's a great division in the profession about this and it's just not at all clear. The issue uh, as to whether the public protection function is being served is very low level of participation. Uh, it's less than 3% of the uh, licensees in California, which matches the national figure, under 3%. So very few uh, attorneys are becoming certified. Uh, it may be a whole different conversation if those numbers were really different, but right now this is not something that is, as it currently stands, protecting the public and the uh, the question of 
what <coughs> certification means and whether it's salient to people uh, in the public is another whole uh, other consideration here. But the um, our recommendation is uh, coming down on the side if it's not a public protection function, which is then part of the discussion. So the staff report has identified three options. One is retain the program in the state bar and make some changes to streamline its operation. In particular, trim down 111 volunteers. Um, option two is to contract it out, but to maintain it um, as something within our regulatory function. Um, option three is to, is title, eliminate certification and legal specialization. And it is the staff recommendation, but I think the title is somewhat misleading because it's been, mis it's been understood by many um, passionate advocates for specialization, some of whom we're gonna hear from shortly. I apologize for how long they've been waiting to talk to us. Um, but it is, is to have the state regulator stop doing it, but allow the State Trade Association to commence doing it. And so um, I'm gonna ask uh, a representative of the California Lawyers Association to come uh, speak to us first um, to identify the options that they perceive then I'll see if there's staff questions of either the CLA or of Richard, and then we'll take public comment. So I believe we have um, Avi Levy. Is he with us? Yes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Avi Levy. I'm the official representative of the California Lawyers Association, also known as CLA, and I'm authorized to speak on behalf of the board today. I'm pleased to be here. While there has not been a vote of the CLA board, there seems to be a general consensus that legal specialization is valuable to attorneys across the state, their clients, and the profession itself. While CLA has not taken a position on whether the state bar should keep, modify, or abandon the program, CLA thinks that legal specialization is important. It's just a question of what it looks like moving forward. While we at CLA do not know how the Board of Trustees will vote, based on the materials posted upon the State Bar website, we generally could predict three possible outcomes. CLA is interested in being part of the discussion in the event the Board of Trustees is inclined to go with either option two or three, which is to contract it out or to eliminate it. Not that we're supporting any of those options. We have not officially had the time to discuss it or vote on any of that. Um, if, CL if specialization is contracted out or eliminated, there needs to be a home for it. And CLA has a robust infrastructure, has already assumed a bunch of former state bar employees, um, and some have assumed the same functions that they fulfilled at the state bar, but just now for CLA. Um, some have argued that it's necessary for the legal specialization program to be offered by and branded through the state bar in order to give it credibility. This was a similar argument to the one made when various stakeholders were considering splitting the sections off from the state bar. However, at least as with respect to the separation of the sections from the state bar, this, those sections have done extremely well at CLA with unlimited potential to grow and expand and potential that didn't necessarily exist when the sections were part of the state bar and I'm also available to answer any questions. Do we have any questions of either Richard or of Avi uh, regarding the array of options in front of the board? Then let me make one comment, thank you Avi. Um, let me make one comment and then finally we'll let um, the passionate advocates who've spent a lot of time waiting to, to advocate and come talk to us. I've heard a couple of models of what a CLA driven program would look like. One model is an entirely private sector activity with which we have no relationship. That might require changes to our advertising rules to allow people to hold themselves out as specialists um, in that way, but that's our only touch on it. Um, another model would be some sort of formal interaction between the CLA and the bar by which, for example, we might allow people to post to their state bar profiles their uh, specialist status with the CLA. Um, and then, uh, a still more intensive relationship would be we still own and operate the program, so to speak, but these voluntary functions that have been done by our large committees would be done by CLA. So there's a range of options with the CLA. Um, and I just wanted to structure that whole range of options for this discussion. I'm, my instinct is that after we hear from the public, it may make sense for us to bifurcate our discussion 
and first say, do we want to be in this business at all? And once we've arrived at a conclusion on that, then we can turn to in what way do we want to be in this business? Um, turn to the design options as opposed to the big picture options. And that may make it easier for us to digest all of the range of options that have been presented. So with those things to reflect on, let us open the mic uh, for members of the public. The first name I have on this topic is Bridget Grammy from the Center for Public Interest Law. Welcome, Bridget. Thank you, uh, Bridget Grammy. I'm the Administrative Director of the Center for Public Interest Law. I think I know most of you, but for those of you that are new, our center is a center of academic research and advocacy at the University of San Diego Law School. And we have been in existence since 1980, monitoring the state regulatory boards, not just the bar, but also some of the other boards that came up today. And um, our mission is to ensure public protection is the highest priority of these boards. So on this topic, I'm here to support staff's recommendation to go with option three today. Um, it's not any comment on the importance and the value of the specializations, it's just the same comments that I made when we, in support of the um, deunification, that just like the sections are very important. We believe specialization is important and offers a significant value, but the question for you today is whether that's something that is a public protection regulatory function. And I really commend staff on all of the work that they did in this memo. I thought the data they provided was very uh, compelling when it talked about the number, the small number of attorneys that are specialists, and even more so um, the demographic of the clients that they're serving. I really don't think this is an access to justice or a public protection issue, and I think it's much better suited as with the sections to go to the um, California Lawyers Association. So those are the big things. I just wanted to say if you did want to maintain them, I'd have to advocate to change the composition of the way that this, these boards are structured right now. They're significantly um, dominated by members of the profession, the specialists, and for the North Carolina Dental Board case, I think that presents a problem. And I would also recommend that you look at the way that you're validating the uh, exams, the specialist, specialist exams, and make sure that those are psychometrically sound. So, those are just my recommendations if you were to keep it, but again, I really support staff's recommendation. But I did also just wanted to thank you, Michael, for your comments earlier and for all of your work on this opponent's eye and all of this. I know it's really hard to make all this change, and it's a lot of work, um, but I do think you're right. Change is hard, and it's an important thing to keep in mind today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bridget, and thank you for all of your um, monitoring work. Um, <laughs> some of it easier for us to experience than others. Um, next up is Melinda. Uh, Abel Har, and behind her is going to be Stella Hand. So Melissa, Melinda seems to be passing. Is that right? No, that's not going. No, Melinda. There he is. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Melinda Abel Har, appearing privately, not representing anybody except myself, and uh, perhaps a handful of people I had the opportunity to speak with. And I apologize for not being more prepared, but I only learned about this meeting early this morning. Um, I think that. At a minimum, perhaps there should be more opportunity for those people who are stakeholders in the uh, specialization program to become aware of and present uh, their comments to this board. I thought that I was pretty well dialed into the uh, to the network, and again, I only heard of it at 10 o'clock this morning that that this uh, vote was even happening. I think that it would be a mistake to move the specialization program outside the auspices of the state bar because the state bar gives it that legitimacy and makes sure that the regulations and the requirements uh, are consistent and that there is a standard that can be met and that can be uh, an independent and objective standard that can be appealed if, for example, someone uh, is denied the opportunity to become a specialist. They have the opportunity, they have a protected right because this is a governmental entity that is conferring that specialization program on them, or that specialization certificate on them, to make sure that they receive due process in the process rather than it in fact becoming simply a trade association where there may be uh, privatization issues surrounding that. The consumer is best served by having the assurance that there is a standard 
that that standard is administered across the board for each person in the same way. Just as when we are initially licensed as attorneys, there is a standard across the board that we all must meet that, um, that, that assures the consumer that we've all been properly vetted by the state bar. And I believe that means my time's up, so I'll submit and say thank you. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Next up is Stella Hendon. I'm going to I'm going to have Mr. Avery speak. To you. Okay. So are you passing or just waiting? What? Are you passing your opportunity or just deferring it? Deferring it. Okay, got it. Uh, Wesley Avery, and then um, looks like Leon Bayer would be next. Mr. Uh, Avery, Mr. Bayer's left. Uh, okay. My name's Wes Avery. I'm a former head of the BLS. I've also been on the ABA committee for legal specialization. I've been involved in specialization for about 20 years. I'm a federal bankruptcy trustee. I'm a certified specialist in bankruptcy law. Um, one thing that the committee recommendation hasn't looked at is the Searcy decision. I'm surprised that that wasn't in there. Uh, Searcy versus the Florida Bar, which is 140 F sub, 3rd, 1290, a decision of the North District of Florida. 2015 held that if there is no state regulation of an area of law, then anyone may legally call themselves a specialist if it's truthful. I think you are unleashing the gates of hell here by doing away with specialization because this is the only shield, this committee is the only shield that you've got to stop anybody claiming to be a specialist in family law, tax law, wills and trusts, workers' compensation. You need to look at the Searcy decision, and I think the staff needs to look at the Searcy decision, and then make a recommendation on that. With regards to 3% on your slide there, super lawyers is 5%, and rising stars is 2.5%. So we're right at the right spot there at 3%. That's it. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. So, do you want to speak next now? No, no. Okay. Um, that takes us to Marshall Walton. Or perhaps Waller. Yes. Handwriting is almost as good as mine. <laughs> I could say I should have been a doctor. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you for uh, taking the time to hear from me. Um, I, too, just uh, learned about this yesterday. And uh, as far as I know, the bulk of our, my colleagues uh, are in the same boat. Uh, I've been a lawyer since 1981. I'm a certified family law specialist. I sent uh, the members of the board an email last night. I hope you had a chance to take a look at it. I'm certainly not going to reread it for you. I would also encourage you to read a letter that was sent to you by Leslie Shear, one of our colleagues. Uh, I think this is absolutely a license issue. I agree with the comments that Mr. Avery made, and I would encourage the board to, at the very least, review the case that he cited and see if there's anything in there that might impact the decisions that you have to make here. Um, Mr. Chairman, I noted at the beginning of uh, my participation in this meeting quite a while ago, you made the statement, we are a regulatory agency charged with public protection, <coughs> and that you are. Uh, the State Bar website has as its motto, I suppose, uh, protecting the public and enhancing the administrative administration of justice. Uh, the enhancement uh, is an interesting word, which of course means to further improve the quality and the value of the services being offered. Um, uh, staff member, uh, and forgive me, I forget your, your last name, but I don't want to refer you to uh, your first name, but you indicated that it's hard to imagine stepping outside the status quo, which makes this kind of dynamic very difficult. We deal with people stepping outside the status quo every single day, all of us. It's, it's not that hard to imagine, it's not that hard to, do, to deal with, and it's not that hard to plan for and address. We are a licensing, you are a licensing agency. Specialization, especially the impression that it gives to the public, is incredibly important. And it should be licensed, and it should be regulated by people who know what they're doing. That's you. You can outsource this to a private agency if you want, and then what we're going to have is a bunch of competing private agencies. Um, I'm sorry I only have two minutes. I want to close with one thing. Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the United States Supreme Court, was asked, Periodically, when do you think there will be enough women on the court? She said, when they are nine. I actually agree with her. And if one were to ask me, when do you think there will be enough certified family law specialists, I will tell you when all of us are, because it helps and protects the public. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments.
Next up is Sandra Salinas, and after Sandra will be Dennis in Boulder. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here just to represent myself. I'm a certified family law specialist. I've been an attorney for over 25 years. I recently became a specialist just a few years ago. And I have to say that all of the certified family specialists that I have come in contact with have all helped me immensely. And I know that all of us strive to become better lawyers, and I think that with a regulatory body such as yourself, you help us with that. I think that um, a time I have the opportunity to pass along my knowledge to somebody who's not a certified family law specialist or who's new to the uh, bar, I do whatever I can to help educate them. I think that as a um, regulatory agency, it's important that we have certain standards uh, that you set. If we have something um, like AVO or super lawyers, not to you know cast aspersions upon them, but we're going to have probably 500 more if the state bar says that we're no longer going to be into business for certifying attorneys for the specialty. Um, and I did notice that um, um, staff has said that certain task force have come and gone, and they make conclusions and recommendations, and then they don't do anything about those recommendations. But it's my understanding that when certification came along, there was a task force, and that from that task force, the implementation of the certified specialists came about. I have to say that it's been a pretty successful program for people that have actually tried to become certified specialists in whatever field they're in. Yes, it's a small number of attorneys, and I think that's because it requires a certain level of experience and knowledge, and it really um, makes us all better attorneys. And as a better attorney, I try to pass along that information to other attorneys to help them become better, to help the public. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Dennis Mulder, and then after Dennis will be Peter Walzer. My name is Dennis Goldberg. I'm a certified specialist in bankruptcy. Um, a few years ago, the Board of Legal Specialization was talking about kicking the bankruptcy out of the specialty because there weren't enough people in it. And uh, Wes Aper, you are retired, <coughs> and I set up a class which we run over the two years in between the exam. We give 15 to 18 um, sessions of an hour and a half, so it takes people you know, 25, 30 hours of instruction to even figure it out how to deal with becoming a specialist. And that's if there are already bankruptcy lawyers. We don't let people in the class that have been practicing bankruptcy. And we know you have to have five years. So these, the, um, the entire level of the bankruptcy bar has been going up. Um, in 2004, before, um, before we kind of saw the crash was coming in 2003. And so we set up a consumer bankruptcy bar called the CDCBAA, where we do nothing but teach consumer bankruptcy law. And it's basically from that pool that we get the people that want to come and try to be specialists. But we give them lectures all the time to try to raise the level of the practice for the general public. So to, for anybody to have a notion that having certified specialists doesn't protect the public, I think that's, you know, you're off the, you're off the stool somewhere, I don't know where you are, <laughs> because you really have to know something to be a certified specialist. And so I think if you're going to take one of the options, you take option one. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, Peter Walzer, followed by <coughs> Stein. My name is Peter Walzer. I am a certified specialist. I'm here on behalf of the Southern California chapter of the Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, the Association of Certified Family Law Specialists, and the Los Angeles County Family Law Center, the Bar Association's Family law section. And I support what my fellow specialists have said today. I want to say I was also on the Elkins Task Family Law Task Force, which uh, Chief Justice George appointed of various people to be on that task force to reform family lawyers, family laws. And judges were appointed, 
family law specialists, court personnel, to review these laws, and they spent time on it, and there was time for public comment. I would ask the same thing of you relating to specialization. Get the feedback of specialists. Get the feedback of the public. Get the feedback of judicial officers and see the importance of our program, the program of specialization. It raises a standard. Even though there may be only 3% of us, it raises the bar for everybody. If you were gonna get a divorce, who would you hire? You would hire a family law specialist. You want a specialist to represent you. If you have a problem in tax law, you would want a specialist in taxation. The program the bar has is fair, there's accountability to the public, to other lawyers. It's consistent. It continues year after year. My father, Stuart Walzer, was a family law specialist. I'm a family law specialist. And as Sandra Salinas said, I will promote this to anybody because I want to raise the level of the profession. And this is what makes us great, is we're constantly raising the level, we're testing ourselves, we're improving the practice. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Hammond. Oops. Good afternoon. My name is Stella Hampton. I am a certified bankruptcy specialist by both the State Bar and the American Board of Certification. I'm also the incoming chair for the uh, BOA seat in bankruptcy. I have been on the commission for four years, and I can tell you that I have uh, become a better lawyer myself and have seen other lawyers become better lawyers as a result of becoming specialists. I've, um, and when you say you don't protect the public, that the specialists don't protect the public, I, I disagree with you. With the internet, people can read anything. And anytime people call me up, they have read something on the internet posted by any, anybody can claim to be a bankruptcy lawyer. Anybody can claim to be a family lawyer. But once they call up and they realize how complicated the issues are, we refer, I refer matters to specialists because if, if there's a tax issue, I am, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna, pick, I'm not gonna uh, scroll through the internet and say somebody who knows anything about tax. We serve a very important function. We screen the lawyers, we, have, we provide a fair exam for people who represent themselves to be a bankruptcy lawyer. And the judges in our courts give us a lot more deference as a result of being specialists because we, we go through the education. We are required to maintain a level of expertise that other people who call themselves family law, bankruptcy lawyer, do not. And we provide uh, protection to the public. I am routinely called to fix messes created by people who do not know what they're doing and claim themselves to be bankruptcy lawyers. I think maybe uh, the, uh, the specialization uh, we need to advertise better for the public. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to address the Board of Legal Specialization topic? Sure. Please come forward and identify yourself. Good afternoon. My name is Miles Friedman. I think I know one of you uh, here. I've seen some of you. I'm the incoming vice chair of the Board of Legal Specialization, if you decide it will still exist uh, later this year. For 37 years, I was an attorney for the United States and the federal government in the Office of Chief Counsel Internal Revenue Service. For 10 years, I was on the Tax Law Advisory Commission and the Board of Legal Specialization. Now, where do I come at this uh, as a public attorney? I come at this uh, in the federal government. I come at this uh, with the idea that the public protection is the only thing that really matters to me. The things that I've dealt with have helped, in my mind, make sure that the public is somewhat more protected, qualitatively more protective. I cannot quantify it, but qualitatively more protected. At least in taxation law, my specialty, because of the legal specialist. And let me give you an example involving the less fortunate in society. Since I've, I've litigated in the United States Tax Court and supervised attorneys under me who have litigated uh, while I was a manager. And by the way, when I left the government last year, my name was on 10,000 open and closed cases. So I've been in hundreds of calendar sessions 
and court sessions here in Los Angeles and elsewhere throughout the country. And what happens is there are two tracks. One track is the regular cases, then there are, let's say, 50% of the people are represented in corporations, partnerships, whatever. But the tax court has seen that the most important track now is the, the small tax court track where let's say you have out of 98, out of 100 people, you have 98 who are not represented. And what happens is the local bar associations, what they do is they bring volunteers. Some of those volunteers are not specialists and other volunteers are specialists. I know many of them who are and aren't specialists, but I'm just going to tell you that I've observed for the last 25 years, 27 years in Los Angeles, that those who are legal specialists, because of their education, their background, and experience, provide qualitatively and quantitatively better representation to the less fortunate uh, people who received uh, reports from the federal government basically stating, we do not believe your son is really your son, or we do not believe you're married and entitled to the earned income tax credit. And so since these people who are specialists provide better representation, that's the one area that I've seen where there's actually been public protection, and I've been happy to participate in that. Uh, if you decide to, I'll leave you with this, if you decide to continue with the Board of Legal Station in one form or another, since I'm the incoming vice chair, I will commit, and I have more time since I'm retired now, I will commit myself to working with any one of you, including uh, Richard Yu, to uh, <laughs> see if there's any way to, uh, to formulate something that meets the goals of the board, has expressed earlier, and maintains uh, specialization because it is for the public's protection. Thank you very much for letting me appear here today. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, my name is Jeff Hayden. I'm the immediate past chair and the sole person that can say I've been an officer for the past three years of the California Board of Legal, Legal Specialization and uniquely poised to tell you about some of the changes that we've made that are being implemented right now. I appreciate the effort that went into creating this report and just how thorough it was in examining, examining ours and the other boards throughout the state bar. There's materials I want to give you to augment what you've already seen that I think should weigh significantly in your decision. I heard it mentioned earlier from an earlier speaker that you really shouldn't and can't keep alive programs that aren't working. The corollary to that is you really shouldn't and can't jettison programs that are clearly working. And this is one that's clearly working, especially when there's changes afoot to meet your objections. An earlier speaker mentioned the questioning the validity of uh, the drafting and grading of exams. And that's a, a significant change that we've implemented over the last two years. We have paid drafters drafting exam questions now to place them in the computer system that we bought, which is coming online in eight weeks, in order to shift that function away from volunteers and over to people that are directly answering to state bar staff. We're moving from volunteers grading those exams to, again, paid graders, academics, practitioners, those who have no stake in the game other than validating these exams and answering directly to the state bar. It was mentioned that we have a huge number of volunteers. Admittedly, we do. But we've moved to take away most of the functions that rely on those volunteers. The advisory commissions make up virtually all of the volunteers other than the short number of the small number of volunteers in the board itself. And we're basically taking away their function and turning it over to either it paid people to administer the exam or the bar itself. So that that huge unwieldy number is about to go away and become unnecessary. <laughs> it was mentioned other rating agencies and those that purport to rate, such as Super Lawyers, Avo, Martindale, Hubble, they uniquely set the bar at the top 5%. We're reaching 3% 
we're not market driven. We're driven towards getting information to consumers and protecting consumers. Unlike those, we do not have market driven concerns. I can tell you, I was rated as a super lawyer when they first came out. I've been given an eight, uh, I'm sorry, an AVO rating of 10.0 immediately after they came out. I was rated as an AV rating from Martindale Hubble very early in my career. And I've been a, a certified specialist for 18 years. I can tell you that I've had to recertify time and time again as a certified specialist. I've had to show that I'm active in my profession. I've had to show that I've maintained a level of education, continuing education far in excess of what it takes to practice law. We don't provide that education. We're not providers. But we do require people to certify that they've been taking that education. And it works to not only raise the level for those, but also for others in the profession. If you want to go from a model of 3% to 5% or 6% or 7%, it's a very easy solution. It doesn't require watering down the standards. Look at some of those areas that are very well populated with lawyers compared to the 11 areas where we now work. If you want to see more consumer protection in the areas of landlord-tenant or personal injury or labor and employment, there are states that are doing that, that are showing us the way that we could bring those in under the umbrella, and that will bring those numbers up. I'll, I'll sum it up very quickly. You have three options today. Option one is to bring changes and streamline the commission. And I, as my su suggestion to you is that we've already done that. Option two is to outsource. Option three would be to simply get out of the business. Either of those, two or three, can't be revisited. Once it's shut down, it's gone from California. Option one would be something you can revisit, whether it's a year, two years, three years, if you think it's a mistake. That's unique to that position. I would encourage you to go to option four, which I would call one prime. And that's simple to say it's not right. With these changes taking place, with a drastically reduced number of volunteers coming in, with the ability to raise the number, if that's what you direct us to do, I would encourage you to table this matter indefinitely. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, too. Is there anyone else who'd like to address the board? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Hi. Good afternoon. I'm Jeremy Klein. I'm an attorney and certified specialist in the area of family law. I'm also a member of the Board of Legal Specialization. I'm completing my four-year term on the board. Prior to that, I was a member and then the chairman of the Family Law Advisory Commission. So I came up through the ranks of the program. And I would again would ask the board to follow the recommendations of uh, my predecessor uh, here to continue the program, make whatever reforms or streamlining that you deem necessary, which are many of which are already in place but not to jettison the program. You have the top 3% of lawyers in California, five, approximately 5,000 lawyers who have shown their dedication by taking an additional exam, by submitting to additional uh, vetting, character references. <coughs> Certified specialists are the only lawyers who are reevaluated when they become specialists, and then every five years to become recertified. Every other lawyer, you fill out your MCLE card, you say you did your 36 hours, but that's it. For certified specialists, they go through the independent uh, review, the character references every five years. I can tell you from having served on, the, on both the FLAC and the BLS that we have always been very focused on public protection. We take that very seriously. I know I've had the pleasure to meet some of you who have come to BLS meetings over the years, and you've seen that our focus has always been on protecting the public and maintaining the integrity of the program and I would ask you to continue to do that in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else in the physical audience who wants to address the board? We've got one person who'll be dialing in in a moment. 
Okay, we want to tee up our telephone participant. And then when we finish public comment, I'm going to take a brief uh, biology break and then we'll be back on the uh, board deliberation. Hello? <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Plantold. You are participating by telephone in a meeting of the state bar trustees. You will have the floor for two minutes. At the end of that time, you'll hear an alarm, at which point I would ask you to wrap up your remarks. So go ahead and please let us know what you'd like to say. Okay, this is Bob Plantold. I'm a senior with a lifelong mobility disability. My concerns are about disability responsiveness of the state bar board of trustees. You are a public accommodation according to the ADA. Uh, in Title III says you've got to be accessible. There's some simple things i got to say, like your toilets are not accessible because the door pull push force is too great. But beyond that, there's a sensitivity problem with something called Office of Access and Inclusion. To many people with disabilities, the word access is about physical and programmatic. That's not the case with what you folks are talking about. Inclusion also implies getting more people with disabilities into the bar. I'm suggesting you got to rethink when you make name changes. If you just said universal access and inclusion, that satisfies everybody. But as it is now, it's misleading. And again, back to the question of public accommodation access, you may have to look at whether you should do things like, as best practices, have captioning, have any number of things, but again, something as simple as the toilet door access at the bar office in San Francisco, it ain't happening, and I've complained about it, and yet nothing still is regularly done, but that's the case with many major law firms and commercial offices. I just wish people could look at somebody outside themselves, consult outside yourselves, to get this understanding that your terminology, your actions, really need to be improved for better credibility and acceptance. So with that, I hope, again, as you go through changes, consolidating, reorienting sub-entities, taking on new responsibilities, you know, you got to take into account the 15 to 20 percent of the population that does not uh, participate as fully as you because we, they have a disability. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, sir. And we'll ask our staff to review what you've provided to us. We will assure that the power assist doors on our restrooms in the San Francisco building meet standards. And if they don't, I'm sure we'll be doing something about it. So you better. Thank you, very, thank you very much for your comments, sir. Bye. We're, we're going to take a brief recess. Um, we will come back together. Uh, we'll come back at uh, 545. That's four minutes by my count. And we'll start our discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Almost became the
Okay, we're back to the session as the Board of Trustees of the California State Park. We have heard um, fulsome public testimony to quote um, from uh, advocates uh, for the legal specialization function of the State Bar. I suggested at the outset of this item that it might be useful to bifurcate, to use a nice loyalty word, our discussion into the broad question of do we think this is a regulatory function we should be pursuing at all? And if the answer to that question is no, we're done. And if the answer to that question is yes, then we can turn our attention to the range of options that we're uh, for doing that. Does that feel like a comfortable way to structure our debate? Who would like to speak first on the question of whether or not we should be in this business? Alan. Alan. Um, you're right, I think the fundamental question is do we consider this a public protection function or a trade association function? And I don't think the answer to that question is easy because I think it has a component of both. Um, so it depends on where you think which side of that question predominates. And um, I come down on the side that it is more public protection than trade association, uh, but it's close in my mind and it's kind of like uh, is there a God or not? Uh, I'm not going to uh, be able to uh, convince anybody else of you know, what I believe, so there you go. But I think what we have to do is, is uh, decide uh, what's the consensus and then go in one direction or the other, as you suggested. Um, the most important thing for whether it's a public protection function or not, or should be within our mandate, is, is it uh, a rigorous, and well-constructed uh, and effective program. Uh, because if it's not, then we shouldn't be involved with it. And I don't know whether it is or not. I don't have a good feeling for um, uh, how, how hard the tests are, how you know, all of the underworkings that would underpin whether it's effective or not. I've had people that I really respect on both sides of that. Um, so, but if we keep it, then we're going to have to really uh, control it very, very closely and be very rigorous in our uh, uh, oversight of it. The fact, just to go back to the question of public protection versus trade association, uh, the fact that uh, an attorney may benefit financially from having the designation of a certified specialist uh, doesn't uh, indicate to me that it's a trade association function. If an attorney uh, works very hard, spends weekends and nights learning the craft, uh, and gains a reputation in town of being the best attorney, uh, he, he or she might be able to uh, command a higher billing rate, uh, may get more uh, clients just because of the reputation. Um, that's an economic benefit, but it's not uh, anything that should be discouraged by any means. So if in fact people are becoming certified because of their extra effort and uh, willingness to be recertified and take the test and take all of the extra MCLE and so forth, then my hand's off to them. Um, so I, uh, I come down on the side of it's a public protection uh, uh, issue. I think it is a public, predominantly public protection. And I do agree with the speaker who said, I think uh, in my mind we should uh, uh, choose option one, uh, keep it, and make sure that it's working, and if it's not uh, up to the standards that we think uh, deserve the imprimatur of the uh, board of the, the state bar, then uh, we should take steps at that. I think we're all going to want to be heard on this one, so I'm going to around the table. Todd, what are your thoughts? I, I concur with what Alan said. I, I'm option one. Sean. Um, <clears throat> you know, I I think Alan framed the issue well in my, from my standpoint, which is there is this abstract issue. Is this a trade association function or a regulatory function? And which label do we apply to it? And I can see the debate there. But I think the more important thing is for us to look at the practical effect of the program. Because I don't think, I think it's sort of a false dichotomy that this is either public protection or uh, slash regulatory or marketing. I think those are, they're, they're, uh, they're not mutually exclusive. And I don't understand the idea that allowing clients 
to rely on a certification as having some objective reality uh, administered by an objective body like the state bar, <clears throat> as opposed to having to rely on statements that lawyers make about themselves, which are just occasionally exaggerated, <laughs> um, is, to my mind, is a good thing. Um, and so I think Alan's, the, the, the proposals for looking at reforms, whether that's shrinking the number of volunteers, um, looking at the rigor of the test and so on, that's all important. And I must say, I must disclose, most of the people on the board know this, but I was, uh, but just to be clear, I am a certified specialist in appellate law, so I want my interest to be disclosed. Uh, Mark. Yes, uh, I too am a certified criminal law specialist as well. Certified specialist in criminal law. I've been for many years. And, you know, I have to, had to take tests and uh, go through all of the rigorous uh, requirements and get recertified and all that. So I'm uh, perhaps somewhat biased. I think there is a combination of both, um, but I'm not so sure that the, my interest um, outweighs that of public protection. No, I, I'm not so sure that um, it does have a significant public protection component to it. I would be just as good a lawyer if I didn't have, uh, if I wasn't certified. Because I still have the education, I still take the education, I still have all the experience. My clients are going to be served just as well. You know attorneys that are extremely good attorneys that are not certified from law school, my career, not certified specialists. By the same token, um, I do agree with the presenters that those of us that are certified specialists are significantly um, more qualified than those who are not. So I just wanted to disclose that. I'm certainly not. I'm going to abstain from any votes because of my uh, bias in that regard. So, uh, those are my thoughts. Joanna. Uh, I didn't hear anything today that gave a good um, reason for why this has to be done by the state bar versus another entity. There's other, many other states that do not consider this a regulatory function. The arguments that we heard are identical to arguments made by the sections. The section's main function over the years was to provide continuing education for lawyers in the specialty practice areas that they serve. And they argued very strongly they thought that was public protection. But it, you know, it's there to make lawyers better. It's not to license lawyers. It's to, it's to improve lawyers. Is it the bar's role to improve lawyers? We made the decision with regard to the sections that it's not the bar's role to make sure lawyers are trying to improve themselves. And there's many that are members of the sections that would say they, they go to all the education provided by that specialty law section. They are just as qualified as people who are certified. And I'm not here to make a judgment whether they are or they aren't. I just feel like we made a decision about what is the, the ambit of public protection for this regulatory agency already. This is the same argument. And you know, CLA indicates that they are there for public protection as well. So just because there is an aspect of public protection in anything that makes a lawyer a better lawyer, that doesn't mean it's something we need to be doing as a regulatory agency, especially when there's another entity willing to take it up and continue it and I'm assuming, based on everything I heard, that the specialist will make sure the bar remains high for their own specialty. Josh. So uh, I, I wasn't here during it, and sometimes uh, I wonder how we got through uh, splitting the sections uh, in that process. Let me start with, I would like at some point just to address the, the notice issue, and I think it's, this board has been um, very deliberative in what we've done, and I think it's important for everybody here and for everybody's voice that we want to make sure all stakeholders are heard. 
Um, I know that there's a process. Uh, I, I know earlier we saw there were a couple of meetings. Clearly there's some people um, and some stakeholders here that don't believe they had proper notice and, and weren't heard. So I, I would like that at some point in this conversation to have that addressed. Um, I think there's a, um, a ch uh, change the terms a little bit. I, I think we're saying, you know, is it public protection or, or um, uh, is it trade association? And, and I, don't, I don't know if it's trade association. To me, is it public protection or is it public benefit? And I see those very differently. Um, I think any time you can add education, um, it's a public benefit. And so to the extent that there are um, ways that people continue to educate themselves and become better attorneys, which obviously uh, the folks that showed up today have, have, have done that uh, and many others. Um, I, I, I think for us, we're at a point where we have to make some decisions with the resources that we have and what is the most important thing from a public protection standpoint. Um, and I think that there are uh, other places that this could be uh, housed, and, and I think CLA may be uh, one of the best ones, where it will have the same effect um, both for uh, the attorneys and for the public. And so I'm, uh, I'm leaning towards uh, uh, option three. Jason. Um, okay, so if I was to think of this as we have been thinking, and Josh is so sad he missed out on the <laughs> <laughs> I'll point out that the legislature assisted the bad decision. <laughs> um, is, is this an associational or regulatory function? Uh, at its core, it's a licensing issue. Um, so I think it probably fits within a regulatory function. Our discussion about public protection is proper because it is, to Josh's point, a decision of whether we want to expend resources on uh, a licensing issue that may or may not be public protection. Um, without sort of laboring point, I think it is. Uh, I do think that structural changes. Uh, there are, from Richard's findings, some substantial inefficiencies. Uh, so I would be in favor of keeping it, but we would have to take a hard look at its function. So, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> First meeting. So, here it is, yes. I am new, non-lawyer. And so, this is where I come in as you protect, being protective of me. And so, or protecting the public. I, from, for me, it's not a matter for probably of whether it's an association or, or a um, or public protection. For me, it's really public protection. I, I represent probably community, the grassroots, and, and, um, and uh, people who cannot probably afford big, you know, uh, it, um, very, you know, high, a, you know, widely known lawyers, and so it's really important for uh, the ones that we who cannot afford those lawyers to be able to go see that this person is state bar certified. So I am the, at the receiving end, and so and 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 even if it's only three percent, I will go to the three percent and find them. And and for me, it's really important reputation of who gives that certificate, who who certifies. It could be, it has to be somebody who is in you know in the regulatory field. Being uh, with a bank, we are always. Um, I have to go through anything. I have to look at the uh, you know. I have to comply with regulations, and I have to make sure that everything is in compliance with you know ethics and and uh, all kinds of risk. And um, for me, it's reputational who's ever giving it and who's getting it and setting a higher standard than just being, um, of course, everybody's bright. I, they are not, you know, there's no uh, non-bright lawyers, but I think that uh, it is really enhances and really gives me comfort to find somebody who is certified by the state bar. It can probably go to CLA, but it is member driven. It is nonprofit. But I, for me, I really would like it to, to remain with a, the with a state park. If we need to lessen because of expenses or sustainability, I think we just have to look at what are the things that we can do to make this more sustainable at, at the point where um, we, we can, don't have to have like, 
21 people doing this and making it a burden for, for the staff. Um, so I am for option one with some, you know, look into how you can make it fit into the state bar. But uh, for me, it's public protection right. and public benefit. Thank you, Sonia. Brandon? I'm in agreement with the points made by uh, Jason and Alan and then uh, Sonia's perspective. Um, I'm in favor of the bar occupying this licensing field, so I support option one. Thank you, Ray. Um, I would agree that this is a licensing issue. Um, due respect, I don't see it the same as the sections issue. I think the sections uh, were about learning. For, you know, the argument was that they helped lawyers learn and be better lawyers. I get that. This is actually about putting a stamp in the same way that we say lawyer, someone's qualified to be a lawyer. So I think actually we should probably be encouraging more people to be specialists and providing that um, guidance for consumers that uh, they know what they're buying. Thank you. So um, hearing <clears throat> the one gentleman who talked about how they're um, redoing a lot of things that they're um, they're doing and you know talking about putting things online or you know sort of automating some of the things that they do, it seems like it should have been done quite a while ago. But um, I'm, I'm really kind of I'm really kind of torn. I came in here with the perspective that you know just give it to CLA and be done with it. But I do think that there is uh, an element of public protection in that kind of thing. And what what someone said is I know my husband. He would look for that designation. He would be that person looking for that they were state bar certified. So um, I didn't think of that before. But that he is that type of person, and there are people that are out there like that. So um, I probably wouldn't go with one. So I won't reiterate all the things that people have said, but I'm in agreement that this is a public protection function. Um, I would be in favor of making sure that the standards we apply are rigorous, that the exams are rigorous. Um, I haven't heard any discussion yet about the differences between option one and two. Um, and so I would like to hear sort of what, what are the reasons behind option two and what would that look like? Yeah, I've heard um, a, a large consensus with notable dissent that we're going to stay in this business. Um, so I think that takes option three off the table. Um, and I would ask staff to address two things that have come up on our discussion. One is comment briefly on the outreach that we've done to address the concerns we're hearing that uh, folks are, are, uh, didn't feel they had adequate notice. And then secondly, uh, if staff can illuminate the choice between options one and two, that would be helpful. Do you want me to take the notice issue Okay. <laughs> I'll take um, no, so I think we need to acknowledge that we really failed uh, in terms of outreach to legal specialists with respect to the recommendations that were being considered. Um, I want to be very candid about that. We had some internal comment uh, discussion to that effect. Um, as we discussed, I think much of the focus has been has been on communicating with these sub entities. So in this case, that is the Board of Legal Specialization. Um, but it certainly makes sense uh, that the legal specialists themselves uh, would be interested in the recommendations that have been developed. So I think we have to acknowledge that um, this is not the only sub-entity where that has come up. I think uh, there was sort of a similar um, shortcutting with respect to the IOLTA grantees as opposed to the sub-entity. Um, and so that is, you know, lessons learned for us as, as a staff team. But I think that's my response. So Richard, eliminate option two, please. Okay, so I would say the, the basic difference is, um, with respect to option two, use of private uh, ADA credit uh, providers, if you, uh, no doubt, I should no doubt recall from your close reading of, of all these pages, uh, there's not a one-for-one -one correspondence. In other words, right now you couldn't eliminate the state bar administrator stuff and find the exact same set of certifications provided by privates. Now, given a market, would they develop them? Probably. How long would that take? Uh, who knows? Um, but so, the, and if, if you see the ones that are, are currently being contracted for are supplemental, and there's only a very small overlap to those areas. So. Uh, want to be clear about that. So then by doing that, you are essentially allowing 
those private providers determine which certifications get off, uh, which certifications, I'm sorry, which certifications get offered and, and so forth. So then the discussion there uh, in talking to CBLS staff has been, you know, could California enforce its, as it does now with the ones it contracts for, the same high bar that you heard people describe, the five years of practice, the references, uh, the MCLE uh, requirement. Um, you know, that would be, an, from the point from a CBLS staff perspective, if that's going to be considered as an option, uh, it would be unfortunate to kind of have the bar kind of look like it's approving that without maintaining the same uh, California standard. So I think that's a, there's an important issue, uh, maybe not so obvious inside option two. There's a, one way to put this is that there's a moral hazard for the provider of certifications who makes their money by selling certifications. And anybody who's ever been to traffic school knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to point out a few things. One, we already contract out some aspects. When I say contract out, we already allow non-state bar certification in California. So that's really important for this, for you to all understand and be clear about as you're talking about um, whether or not this is something that the state bar must control in terms of licensing as specializations. We have non-state bar specialists in California and we have already approved that structure. So I want to be um, clear about that. And also, just to point out that although under option two, I think Richard, you noted that we don't currently have a private or other entities offering the full array of specializations that we offer in California. We have heard loud and clear uh, from CLA that that entity is interested in getting into this uh, getting into this space. So I don't think that the board would have to be concerned that there would not be uh, the, that the availability of those specializations would not exist if the board chose option two. Okay, I think we're ready for a motion on um, some combination or choice between options one and two. Can I make a motion sure. for option one but with the addition that a request that the staff identify specializations that may increase the access to justice uh, to Richard's point about specialization serving only a certain portion of our population. Uh, I think that's a, that's a great observation. Sorry, your microphone is. Yes, sir. Sorry. I didn't do that. Okay. Uh, my motion is uh, to adopt option one. And in addition to a request to the staff to identify uh, specializations that may increase access to justice, uh, noting your point about specializations only really serving, some of them only really serving a certain segment of the population. Um, things that just off the top of my head, immigration might be something. There is more yes. yeah. it's, the one, it's the one area in which the average age is lower than the average age of the bar as a whole. I thought that was quite interesting. Okay. Maybe a comment on our times. And most of the specialties you have, like criminal defense, prosecuting, you have both sides. I guess I, I saw the wage. Okay, but landlord tenant is is not represented. Yeah, so the family law is, and that's one of the biggest areas where we have an access gap, and the right. fact that we have a specialization in that area is not addressing the access gap. But I think we get your point. Okay. Is there a second for Jason's motion? Oh, second. There's a second. Uh, let's call it. Oh, is there more debate, or shall we call the roll? Let's call the roll, please. Roger. Stay. Chen. extension on that one. Um, why don't you put up your slide showing the overall recommendations, are they there? Um, and this is a set of global recommendations that are intended to be uh, baseline principles to be deviated from with justification. And so if we approve the things on this slide, when staff brings you implementation items, they will implement these terms unless they perceive a justification for deviation. And if you perceive a justification for deviation that they don't, you will amend the action when it comes to you. 
So is there more discussion of these baseline recommendations before I invite a motion to establish them as baselines to be deviated from inappropriate circumstances of Brandon? What would the nomination, the elimination of the nomination committee and transferring that to staff, what would that look like practically? Well, practically it would involve a process of staff soliciting and you know, the pool and, and buildings. And I think the, the reason, the rationale for that one is that all organizations tend to be self perpetuating in a sense and there's a need to be able to get outside of the known universe of people's current connections or views and get the fresh ideas needed to keep these committees uh, forward looking. Uh, that's the logic of it. And to take, again, it's, just, it's, an, it's an administrative function to do this and get this going and let the subject matter But what's not possible. administrative is screening. Um, to take a universe of applicants down to a short list for serious consideration. And what I hear you be saying is that staff is going to assemble all of the applicants and that the um, appointments liaisons of the executive committee of this board are going to do the screening. And so instead of allowing the sub-entities to perpetuate themselves, we are going to take on that responsibility to evaluate applicants and make our own choices. We're still going to be reliant on them for the outreach and drumming up and providing people to do it. And the likelihood that the substantive decisions will really change dramatically is probably small. But there's something, and it's an important signal that I see to be spent that this board is engaged and who's doing this work. And especially as we try to enhance the diversity of these commissions, some of which are not as diverse as we would like them to be, we, got, we get the opportunity to put our money where their mouth is. I think that's what we're talking about. We're not delegating the staff the screening function. We're taking it to ourselves. I can see that perpetuating a little bit of group thing, though, and some of that same institutional kind of yeah. uh, consistency. Yep. More discussion before I invite uh, a motion. May I have a motion on these baseline principles? So moved. Is there a second? I would second, but I would amend to eliminate the uh, eliminate nominations to be transferred. So. Is that friendly? No. Okay. Let's, so I have a motion. Just, and Joanna seconds. <laughs> Sorry. So, so, so we've got a motion to adopt the whole thing while it's talking to Earl. And so um, I think given the hour, I think we probably understand what's at stake here. If you, if you feel strongly about that issue, recognizing that as it's implemented as a baseline, there will be opportunities to deviate from it, your remedy is to vote no on this motion. So please call the roll. Roger. Yes. Shen. Yes. Dallas? Yes. LeBron? Yes. Lee? Yes. Manning? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Petula? Yes. Selleck? Yes. Collins? No. Steinbrecher? Yes. Steven? Yes. Okay, we are not adjourned. We are continued. Um, and the reason I said that is there's one item of business we didn't get to, and that's the um, Technology to Innovate Access to Justice Task Force, which will appear on your uh, agenda tomorrow morning at 9 in the hands of your capable new chair. And with that, we are continued until 9. Well done. <laughs>